I think that uh, if you agree, Francesco and Luigi, we can start. Absolutely, my sir. Absolutely, okay. okay. <laughs> so, welcome. Uh, to everybody to this uh, workshop, all is under determinants. Are there too many expensive measurements in the field of conservation of cultural heritage? I hope that all of you are doing well. Well, I'm going to give you uh, some introductions and some instructions to follow the workshop. First of all, uh, this workshop has been organized uh, by Luigi Campanella from the Sapienza of Rome. Also, uh, Francesco Caruso from the Swiss Institute of Art Research in Zurich, the CITICEA, and myself from the University of the Basque Country. Uh, this event uh, is hosted by the University of the Basque Country through WebEx, as you can see. And uh, well, uh, I want to let you know that we are going to record uh, both sessions, the morning and the afternoon session. So please uh, feel free to uh, turn on your uh, your camera or your microphone at your convenience. Uh, well, uh, also for the participants, uh, I want to let you know that uh, this event is going to be divided in two sections. In the morning session, the speakers are going to, to introduce uh, different topics uh, during uh, 30 minutes. And you are going as participants, you are going to be able to, to make questions. And for that, you are going to have two options. OK, you can use the chat. You can post uh, your questions in the chat. We are going to, to read them and we are going to transmit to the speakers. And you also can uh, raise your hand. You can see uh, uh, an emoji uh, icon next to the video. You can see a face. And there you can uh, have the option to uh, raise your hand. If you want, you can use that option and we will uh, introduce you and you can use the camera and your microphone to make questions, okay? And apart from that, in the afternoon session, uh, the speakers are going to contribute in the round table. And when they finish, we are going also to open the discussion uh, to all the participants. So uh, I think that uh, apart from that, uh, I don't have uh, any other information to transmit you. Only I hope that uh, you and your enjoy this conference. And now I want to uh, uh, give the floor to Luigi Campanella, who is going to introduce a little bit better the, the topic of the workshop. I hope that you can enjoy it. Yeah, maybe a couple of words tonight. Uh, thank you about uh, Luigi. As a starting, um, Luigi has been uh, past president, as, uh, is past president of the Italian Chemical Society and uh, uh, has been working at the science faculty of the Sapienza University of Rome. Is um, emeritus professor of environmental and cultural heritage chemistry, is chairman of the School Museum Network, has been a um, uh, general secretary of the European Association of uh, Emeritus and Retired Professor, editor and member of the board of several journals. I mean, we have known each other for uh, now 18 years with Luigi. Please, Luigi, the floor is yours uh, with your introduction. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Francesco. Thanks, Maite. Let me thank uh, officially you both for the great, perfect cooperation with me during the organization of, of this workshop. Uh, and uh, let me thank also the present here that are uh, all many of them are friends of me and so it's a it's a beautiful and nice uh, to to see them uh, uh, connected during a, a cultural event like this one is so ju just few words about uh, how was uh, uh, growing the the idea of this workshop I have prepared a, a presentation and I read in it so that uh, it's more clear. Allism or determinism? This is not an easy question, as the answer must consider many different aspects. This question arose when, with Maite and Francesco, we observed that sometimes in scientific papers, 
especially in the field of cultural heritage, the reported data don't find adequate practical exploitation. Therefore, the reader is brought to ask her or himself about the necessity of such research and if it should not have been better to spend the money for it in a more profitable way. Several aspects need to be considered in any analytical process to achieve significant results. Some of them are strictly depending on the objective condition of the analysis, starting from the available amount of sample, from the analytical instruments, although also for the latter suggestion, from the experimenter could lean toward the best direction and practice. Occasionally, time can be a limiting factor so that only a deterministic approach can provide an urgent answer. The available financial resource may force to adopt a deterministic approach as well. Where is the bottleneck? The essential point is to save time, money, and sample. This is very wise. If with the deterministic approach, I can get significant data able to address the conservation problem towards the right subsequent steps. This goal is largely depending on the availability of indexes or parameters, leading to a solid interpretation of the experimental data. For instance, the sulfation degree in the case of a marble matrix is a meaningful index of its degradation. Similarly, to what occurs to the intensity of green color for the diagnostics about the health of a plant. The holistic approach allows obtaining the most meaningful data only after performing measurements. On the other end, the deterministic one tries to give indication about meaningfulness before searching the literature or looking at the formal experiment. Finally, some words about analysis of surfaces. One can try to be as precise and accurate as possible, but in the case of homogeneous materials, it is pretty useless to repeat measurements often bringing to the same repeated results. Repeatability and reproducibility are indeed needed. Waste of resources, also giving a negative carbon footprint, is not. I hope, but I am confident about it, knowing all them that our speakers and our participants to the round table, will contribute to shed light on this disputable theme. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luigi, for your um, uh, interesting um, uh, introduction um, to the workshop. And so we hope uh, really that our, our participants with their talk and with their, uh, with their small intervention in the afternoon will be able uh, to answer, or at least I mean, to let us think about uh, this uh, the question that stimulated uh, this uh, this workshop so it's my pleasure now to introduce the first speaker uh, in the morning it's uh, professor uh, chiara bertolin chiara uh, also master and a phd in astronomy from uh, the university of uh, padua in italy 
She then worked uh, at the, after a PhD, she then worked uh, at the Institute for Atmospheric and Climate Sciences at the Italian National Research Council for nine years. In 2016, uh, Chiara became associate professor at uh, Antenu in Norway, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology within the Research Excellence Program on Sager Fellow, where she recently got her full professorship uh, position. Chiara has a research interest are interdisciplinary, mainly devoted towards the study the, of the impacts of climate change on the built environment, the study of microclimate for conservation, and the application of non-destructive techniques for monitoring and assessing uh, materials integrity. The ultimate goal of our research is the enhancement of conservation and uh, environmental uh, sustainability. Chiara has been also the coordinator and PI of Norwegian and uh, European projects, one funded by the European Space Agency, ESA, and she has acted as a scientific consultant of UNESCO, the Civic Museum Foundation of Venice, and the Diocesan Museum of Udine in Italy. Chiara, thanks very much for participating. I have already made you as a presenter. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Francesco. I hope that you are able to see my desktop. One second. Yes. Yeah, yes. Right. yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm very glad to have the chance to participate to this interesting workshop and present uh, the work that has been conducted, this uh, contribution that has been prepared together with the colleagues from the Padua University, Dr. Califano and Professor Marco Baiesi. I want to start uh, making a brief uh, introduction to have uh, all the person at the same point and explaining a bit uh, what is the um, usually a microclimate study for cultural heritage protection. As you can see in this slide, uh, one second, the pointer. As you can see in this slide, uh, there is uh, um, you can have a different possibility or different research question that can address uh, this type of study. Uh, for example, you may be interested to assess uh, the risk of damage uh, on a specific uh, movable heritage or on an immovable uh, cultural heritage like a building envelope. And so the time horizon in such a case for the study is of a typical calendar year. But then uh, you may be interested on assessing the impact of climate change. In such a case, uh, uh, the time horizon becomes larger and so uh, it becomes uh, a long term monitoring. What is fundamental, therefore, when uh, a person needs to plan a monitoring campaign is uh, to uh, select uh, the variables, the range, the location of the instrument and the frequency that can be optimal and correct. And so it's fundamental to know what are the most common methodology applied on the state of the art and also the existing standard. And also important to figure out uh, some issue in terms of uh, maintenance of the campaign or additional use of data. The final goal uh, is uh, the interpretation and data analysis um, and uh, the, oh, sorry, I try to have the pointer and uh, ultimate the recommendation to improve the situation of the conservation. In the market, uh, you have a broad uh, possibility to select uh, uh, sensor. For example, the, you have traditional sensor that measure uh, environmental parameter or contact sensor that, uh, that operates in contact with the surface of the object uh, that needs to be studied, remote sensor that operate at uh, mid range, or proxy and effect sensor that uh, measure parameter link uh, with the original one or the overall effect of the degradation on a material. In the bottom part of the slide, you see the novel, the innovative sensor that nowadays are used in a museum, for example, for conducting this study. These are the smart sensor. In such a case, the approach is more holistic. This is because uh, you have not only the possibility to measure the parameter, but even to make an, an analysis of the data and uh, eventually to set some alarm that are immediately um, transmitted to the user. 
then you have uh, a new generation of embedded sensors that are used on new material uh, to measure real time the condition into the material or wearable sensor that nowadays can be produced also with the additive manufacturing and can be applied, for example, on the textiles. So the presentation uh, is divided in two parts. There is the first part that uh, will uh, explain or present some important aspect when planning a monitoring campaign, looking at the state of the art, so at the literature. And then a second part that instead is devoted to underline what are the new pathway, the new direction that in my opinion, uh, are worthy uh, additional research because they can help uh, all the museum institution and the historic building uh, manager to have the chance, even with uh, a small uh, amount, a small budget, to uh, arrive to uh, define an optimal uh, preservation for the collection or for the building environment. So I want to start with the first aspect uh, that is the uh, selection of the monitoring setup in a monitoring campaign and uh, the possibility to go for a complex or a simplified campaign. I have prepared two examples from the literature. The first example uh, is uh, based on the work that was recently published by Diaz Arellano uh, that uh, study uh, a um, case study in Valencia, an archaeological site. They use uh, for this study 28 data loggers, so a quite large number of data loggers positioned on this map, as you can see, uh, to measure the temperature and relative humidity over a uh, period of 16 months, but then they, uh, their research was focused over a typical calendar year of 13 months. So you can imagine how uh, when you have this uh, number of uh, um, data logger, you need to perform uh, a preliminary analysis. So you need to calibrate all these instruments, these sensors in a climate chamber to understand if some bias are present and then try to correct the bias to synchronize the data and also to fill the missing value. So the author did all these uh, steps through Python scripts and also um, filtering of the data. The situation uh, after the collection of the data was as this one uh, visible in the plot. So in the first plot here on the top, you have the daily variability of temperature measured uh, indoor into this archaeological site. And then the analysis that the author did over all the data logger using uh, the specification from a European standard, the standard EN 15757. That uh, is a standard that was uh, extremely used in the literature because it's a standard that provides a simple method to analyze the data and to find uh, criteria of uh, climate-induced uh, decay. That is uh, um, provided by the selection of this uh, risky threshold. So the author uh, evaluate uh, an overall situation at the site, calculating an average of all these uh, indoor data logger and then comparing this uh, indoor situation with the outdoor one using the closest weather station and the outdoor data logger. But then they took advantage of the high number of uh, data logger to evaluate uh, also the situation in the different location. They analyzed therefore using this standard the number of observation that uh, fell out of this uh, threshold, safe threshold, and then uh, with the principal component analysis, they try to clusterize the variability, common variability among the data logger. And they recognize three different patterns uh, of behavior uh, that are here visualized with the color code. Finally, uh, they analyze all the months and all the data logger in a uh, matrix, looking at the percentage of the data that fell out of this uh, risky threshold and using a traffic light color code to immediately visualize the risk. At the opposite, uh, if you go uh, for a simplifying campaign, uh, of course, uh, the situation is uh, easier to manage. This was the case of the campaign that uh, uh, we uh, performed uh, in Norway within the symbol project in two state churches. 
uh, a simplification was possible because the uh, geometrical characteristic of the indoor uh, environment was quite simple with NAV uh, simple, you see here the shape. And so we decided to install only two data loggers uh, with different orientation uh, indoors and one data logger outdoors to measure temperature and relative humidity over a recent period. The campaign is still ongoing, but then we were focused on uh, the typical calendar year, so 13 months. In such a case, uh, the objective was uh, the understanding of uh, situation of uh, risk induced by the use of an eating system inside uh, the churches. And uh, to do this, uh, we use again the uh, standard EN 15757 to analyze the relative humidity fluctuation to calculate the uh, threshold of risk and to uh, highlight the events of the uh, indoor temperature that um, exceeded this threshold. Then uh, these events were further analyzed with uh, other statistical tests. So you can understand how uh, it's possible to achieve a similar result uh, even with a simplified campaign. Then the second aspect that is interesting is uh, uh, what are the uh, tool that we have available to select the right instrumentation nowadays and also uh, how we can select the right, the optimal time horizon over which perform the campaign. So if uh, we look again at the two case study that I have presented, we see that uh, uh, both the, the authors, let's say, selected similar uh, data logger because uh, uh, the sensor into this data logger were um, what was required by the European standard for measuring temperature, surface temperature and relative humidity. Then another aspect that is interesting and it seems a bit uh, of uh, low technology, but is not, is that the data logger uh, often are uh, works with battery. Why? Because when you deal with a microclimate campaign in remote area, uh, like, for example, archaeological site or as in the case of the state church in uh, uh, historic building that are at high risk of fire, you cannot have electricity in continuous. And so you need to uh, select this type of instruments. Then these instruments are, are cheap. Uh, they require low maintenance. And what is interesting is that uh, both the two case study uh, define as a long term campaign a time horizon of 30 months because of the requirement of the standard 15757. There, there is another aspect in other European standards that is, um, are useful to select the instrumentation. For example, the standard 15758 provide information that allow a sort of decision support system that throw simple uh, question, allow the user to uh, answer and to arrive to the selection of the right instrumentation. So you see how therefore a standard can be extremely useful in this uh, stage of the planning of the campaign. Then there is uh, the standard 16682 that is focused on the measure of the moisture content inside historic material looking at both the instrument and the method. And this is the first time in which a standard clearly subdivide two types of method, a relative method that can be used in situ uh, with uh, um, instruments that are cheap, that doesn't require a lot of expertise. Uh, the drawback of this uh, type of uh, selection is, however, that the information is semi-quantitative or qualitative, so you have a sort of relative measure. And then the standard highlight how uh, if you have a higher budget and a higher expertise, you can go for the absolute method and for the selection of other type of instrument. And so usually you need to perform measurement in the laboratory and the measurement are also uh, time consuming. The other aspect that I want to stress is uh, this question. Do data exist while an indoor monitoring campaign is not active? That means, uh, are there data that are existing but not exploited? So to answer to this question, I have prepared five, five different examples. 
The first example is related with data from condition survey. In literature, there is an interesting example from Forleo and Francavilla that uh, explain their uh, sampling and classifying method in different rooms in a museum. They uh, create a classification method looking at the type of room, the use of the room, the uh, human impact, that means how the uh, number of visitors in different time of the day and different time of the year may impact uh, the environment, the orientation of the building, the type of collection into this building and also the status of this collection. Uh, in which way they evaluate uh, this status of the collection, looking, for example, at different type of material, as here, uh, an example with metal, different type of damage that can be, uh, can cause damage on this uh, material, and then they uh, create a classification method looking at the severity of the damage and uh, at the extension of the damage on this material or object, and finally, trying to figure out the causes of this damage. Then in this work, they also present the possibility to have different type of method to conduct this condition survey. Uh, having an approach that can be a random approach. So for example, looking at all the different causes irrespective to the type of material or type of collection, or being more clusterized, so looking only at uh, uh, a specific type of uh, works of art or material and uh, assessing the percentage of object uh, um, prone to a specific type of decay. So you can imagine how if you perform this type of collection over decades using the same methodology, at the end you have a mine of data that can be used in connection with the data from the monitoring campaign. To uh, underline what? To underline, for example, locations that are more at risk uh, because of the environmental condition or because of the visitor impacts in terms of tear and wear. And also, uh, uh, you can figure out the priority for your ordinary and extraordinary maintenance. The second type of example of existing data that are not always exploited is uh, that one um, look, that looks at the uh, reanalysis or the collection of data over decades about the eating strategy that were used in the past and are used nowadays in historic building and museum. Why is it important to have this type of information? Because in this way, you can evaluate what was the impact over the time of these uh, different strategy, looking, for example, at the period of use of the strategy, at the mode of the use of the strategy, at the location where these uh, uh, specific eating system were installed into the building or into a room, uh, at the power consumption used over the year, uh, and the total hour uh, use, and also the achieved comfort. Uh, you see in this slide an example of the work that we have recently done together with the University of Padua in a book chapter uh, that is now under publication. We propose a very simple method that is practically qualitative to estimate if the different strategies, so uh, it means a lo local, localized strategy or a centralized strategy, are able to accomplish with the conservation need of the uh, institution, of the heritage institution, and also are capable to accomplish with the comfort uh, objective for which they were selected at the beginning, and uh, uh, if they have chance to uh, have an energy save or a money save during their use. Another example of uh, data that uh, are there but are not collected usually refer to the um, analysis and collection of data of ordinary and extraordinary maintenance. If uh, uh, you have the chance to collect this data over decades, at the end uh, you may evalu evaluate the durability of the intervention, for example, of different level of intervention from low level of intervention, that means extraordinary maintenance or ordinary maintenance 
to higher level of intervention, that means renovation and restoration. In particular, you can assess if the new material that are used during the intervention are durable or not. And also, uh, you may have the chance to uh, create scenarios of intervention before the intervention itself. Why is important to create scenario of intervention? Because you may evaluate uh, this scenario through a method of risk benefit and understand if your budget is uh, uh, sufficient to conduct this type of intervention and if the intervention is appropriate in terms of uh, uh, level of protection of your building and in terms of possible visual impact and aesthetic impact. We did uh, in a publication in 2018 we create a method to evaluate sustainable refurbish refurbishment intervention in historic building. That means to evaluate, in addition, also the CO2 emitted during the intervention itself. Another example of data that exist are the data related with the possibility to reconstruct the climate variability in proximity to an historic building because there are uh, a lot hundreds of weather stations, in particular the most important are the weather stations that are um, that uh, uh, answer to the requirement of the World Meteorological Organization. And also uh, it exists, uh, especially okay, in Norway, uh, but uh, in, in any country, uh, the possibility to have a risky map of hydrogeological hazard. So if you analyze this type of event, and in particular, you reconstruct a reference, a climatological reference period, that means a 30 year period, you may assess the impact of uh, the climate change outdoors and also eventually the impact of the extreme events. In this uh, slide, I am reporting the work that uh, recently I have done together with Elena Cesana to estimate the risk of flood and landslide for all the still existing 28 safe churches. So we detected the cautionary area uh, in proximity of these churches and we propose a very simple method to evaluate the exposure of this site. Uh, looking at the distance between the uh, position of the historic building and the cautionary area. This type of data may enhance, of course, the preparedness level at the historic building. Uh, the last example that I am reporting is instead uh, the uh, use and possibility to collect uh, and to systematically reanalyze archive, archival material uh, in connection with natural hazard. This is an example in the slide of the big flood that happened in 1966 in Florence that affected all the uh, heritage in the city. So if uh, um, we uh, collect this type of photographs and also the map uh, or the journal paper of that time, we may create a sort of database that, uh, after uh, being analyzed, offer um, the possibility to reconstruct the exposure in different districts of the city, the exposure of different historic buildings, and even the exposure indoors of the collection into the museum. So, for example, in terms of location and eight of the collection, respect to the eight reached by the flood. Then uh, what is interesting and is that uh, you can have also material during the rescue phase of the event or after, uh, immediately after the event. So you may figure out also what are the needs, for example, in terms of space to be available to uh, plan a um, pre preparedness plan uh, to be prepared at this uh, uh, natural hazard. Uh, because you need, of course, to have a huge space to store the material up to the moment of the restoration. In this uh, final part of the presentation, instead, I want to underline a bit uh, what are, in my opinion, the future research needs uh, in this field. So, uh, in my opinion, the first uh, needs uh, is uh, to uh, really uh, and systematically exploit uh, this uh, mine of data uh, that comes from the knowledge from the past. So looking at the five examples that I have just reported. Um, 
beside this example, you may have also other data that are not really uh, immediately visible, but uh, that exist. An example is the work that I have conducted together with Camufo in 2017 uh, that use uh, uh, um, architecture feature of the building in Venice in the Grand Canal, in particular the first step built below the ground uh, below the level of the water and the distance of this step by the algae bed to reconstruct the relative sea level in the city over the last centuries. Uh, of course, then you have all the other type of data uh, that I have explained. The second important aspect, in my opinion, to further uh, analyze is uh, the way in which we can simplify a bit the procedure at least of the data analysis or even of the uh, plan of the monitoring campaign in order to avoid, avoid redundant sensor in order to limit the time period right. and to uh, be fast in the data analysis. This is an example of the work that was performed during the symbol project where we use uh, the simplify monitoring campaign to create an outdoor indoor transfer function that then was applied to the existing database from the outdoor weather station to enhance the availability of uh, indoors data. A second requirement in my opinion is to uh, uh, have a, stand, a standardization that is at the step with the change in the society. So as you have seen from the example that I have reported, and as you see if you uh, make a literature review, the standard in this field are very much used. Uh, there was a big success, for example, of this standard EN 15757 in microclimate study. Why? Because the standard is, of course, based on a uh, sound scientific uh, uh, understanding, but then provides simple and clear information on how to uh, calculate uh, risky threshold. What happens uh, uh, in any case? The drawback is that the standard needs time to be created. And so not all the standards are always updated. And sometimes the standard alone may lead to the neglation or the underestimation of possible situation or possible problem, as for example, the study of the impact of climate change or the request of more sustainability in this field. Uh, the other um, important aspect, in my opinion, is to try also to work towards the automation of the decision process. A new frontier in this field is the machine learning. Why? Because uh, through this algorithm, algorithm is possible to catch pattern, for example, using the cluster uh, algorithm, or to fill the missing value using the autoencoder algorithm, or predict the time series using the neural network. However, uh, there are some steps to take into consideration. So the pro of using the machine learning is, of course, that uh, the machine learning can be trained on real data, on monitoring campaign, and then can be extended and used on new and first time seen data. So this means that we can go from the uh, particular case, the monitoring campaign, towards a general case, so towards a, a possibility to compare different uh, time series. In particular, if we use, for example, the same algorithm on different time series collected in different locations in different buildings. This means that we have the possibility and the chance to uh, achieve a smarter choice for preservation and uh, limiting the time and the money used to elaborate the data, analyze the data. However, there are still some barriers. What are the barriers in, in the use of the machine learning or in the use on, of the automatization in this field? The first is that, uh, in particular for the machine learning, in order to enhance this learning capability, we need the metadata. So we need uh, all the data that I have uh, shown before. And to have this kind of data, we have still the barrier of the language because sometimes the condition survey are provided in the original language. So in the language of the country, for example, in Norwegian and not in English. Then the second barrier is to uh, break down the uh, scientific barrier. So it means to use a language, a glossary that is uh, uh, comprehensible, 
so for example, computer scientists needs to use the language that is, that is comprehensible uh, from conservator or manager of the museum. And the last barrier is, of course, to break down the infrastructure barrier. So make available this data, make available this result, in particular result of bad practice. Why? Because uh, uh, we can learn from errors. And sometimes these bad practices are hidden, unfortunately. Uh, the last uh, uh, slide, so how we can keep uh, this scientific reliability? I think that through the example, I'm tried, I have tried to answer to this question, to keep the scientific reliability, we need to work at the standard. Why? Because there is an expert team that is working and is based that result on uh, um, experiments and on uh, a research that is, of course, more demanding in terms of use of instrument and uh, is more time consuming but it's fundamental that then this research is spread in a simple way and in a uniform way. And then it's fundamental to use this uh, in situ monitoring data uh, in connection with a practical verification. So always in connection with a experimental work and always in connection also with the validation that can be the validation through the numerical modeling or through the uh, simulation using, for example, the uh, building simulation software in the case of the uh, of this uh, uh, field of study or using the novel machine learning. In conclusion, uh, I just briefly, I say that, of course, uh, this study uh, and the objective of this study depends on the research question that the museum manager may have. Um, it's fundamental to avoid uh, unnecessarily uh, data logger or necessarily instruments. So try to simplify a bit the way in which the monitoring campaign is planned, uh, looking at the standard or looking at the available methodology in the field. What is important is important to be aware that exists all a range of different data that, that are already available, in particular metadata, that can be extremely useful in connection with the analysis of the uh, monitored data. And then uh, the future research needs, of course, are try to uh, work more on this uh, exploitation of the knowledge of from the past, on this exploitation of uh, uh, standards that can be at the step with the society, try to automatize a bit the decision process using, for example, this uh, uh, machine learning algorithm and uh, keep the data open. Thank you for your attention. And these are the references. Thanks very much, uh, Chiara, for your uh, actually really inspiring talk. Uh, really, I really enjoyed uh, having worked um, uh, previously in uh, in also in uh, conservation of built heritage, uh, how you dealt with different uh, different points of um, of um, uh, innovative research. I like, for example, yeah. very very much uh, the possibility of uh, of doing, for example, uh, that you mentioned uh, the the PCA analysis on outliers, mm -hmm. which is something that usually yes. one doesn't think about. It's quite mm -hmm. uh, quite new. And I like very much the the also that you mentioned uh, the possibility of the analysis of sudden and extreme events, which is something yes. that is not widespread in the literature. And also there are uh, also new research and also new PhD projects about uh, about this. I have uh, in the meanwhile that maybe our public can I mean, write down or uh, raise uh, their hands. I have a, a question uh, for you, Chiara. Yes. Uh, have you ever considered uh, the possibility of uh, uh, of acquiring or uh, somehow uh, taking advantage of the large of the large data coming uh, from the public? Today, our mobile phones uh, they integrate different sensors, uh, not only. I mean, uh, uh, GPS, I mean, positioning and so on. But uh, uh, I've heard, uh, for example, that uh, Apple, the next iPhones, uh, they will be featuring uh, temperature and relative humidity sensors. I was wondering, uh, uh, have you ever considered about the possibility to uh, to exploit somehow this, uh, this large amount of data that are there or that they could be there 
provided some of the limits of the privacy? Uh, absolutely. This is a. Uh... An interesting question. Uh, I agree with you. There is a mine, uh, even in that case, a mine of data. I didn't put uh, this example, but I agree with you. Uh, it's not my uh, field of expertise, uh, that one, because I think that, for example, there are uh, experts in geomatics that work uh, with this type of data, but I agree with you. I could investigate this possibility eventually in cooperation with experts in geomatics. I know that they are already using, for example, the photo uh, from mobile phone to reconstruct, uh, uh, for example, an environment, a room, uh, to then compare over the time and detect some change over the time. And this is absolutely interesting. What is interesting, I think that you can geolocalize the, uh, these uh, photo or this information. So yeah. you may have a very spatially high, uh, with high spatial resolution information into yeah. the museum or outside. So I agree with you that this can be an interesting pathway to, to, the, to study. Yeah, I, I I totally agree with you, Chiara, and thanks very much. And it's also interesting, I was thinking while you were talking, that we have the chance to have also colleagues from UCL that are specialists now in data sciences for cultural heritage. We will hear during our morning uh, morning session. I, I'm uh, uh, checking if there are questions, uh, uh, other questions from the public. The system maybe is not, I mean, not everybody is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, um, is aware I mean, of the, of the system. So maybe, I mean, it's not so easy. So maybe, I mean, it would be nice also if you can stay during the, the, yes, the break. Absolutely. So if, if some question will arise, but uh, I'd like to thank you very much once again. Thank you. And we go to our next, uh, next speaker who is uh, actually one of the co-organizer of this of this event uh, is uh, uh, Maite uh, Maguregi. Uh, Maite also a uh, master uh, in chemistry and a master in environmental toxicology and contamination and a PhD in analytical chemistry, all from uh, the University of the Basque Country. She presently holds a position as associate professor of analytical chemistry at the same university. And uh, her research interests uh, are mainly uh, devoted to the development of analytical technologies and modeling strategies for the understanding of the weathering of cultural heritage and the development of new sustainable green materials for the conservation of, of cultural heritage. Maite, among her research endeavor, uh, we uh, should mention her involvement in the uh, in several uh, in situ campaigns at the Archaeological Park of Pompeii. But uh, Maite is, uh, let's say, a well-rounded analytical chemist, also working in um, uh, food uh, analysis, uh, food uh, analytical science, uh, environmental analytical science, uh, and uh, recently also among her interests are planetary analytical science. Uh, she has contributed uh, into the development of the new target uh, for the uh, rover, I mean, uh, present in, uh, in Mars. Uh, very interesting uh, talk will be about uh, uh, beyond data collection in analytical chemistry for cultural heritage. Uh, Maite, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Francesco. I hope that you can see my screen, my presentation. Yes, we can. Okay. So, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I'm an analytical chemist, so I will try to contribute to the well, general question or general topic uh, of this workshop from the point of view of uh, an analytical chemist. So, in, in this presentation, I will try also to, to include the perspective of training, considering that uh, in this workshop we have also a master or PhD student, so I think that this point uh, is also uh, interesting. So, as I mentioned, I'm an analytical chemist, but, but I'm not the only pure scientist working uh, in the field of cultural heritage. We can mention also biologists, uh, physicists, geologists, also mathematics or even engineers. So we are not the only ones or the unique ones contributing to the conservation of cultural heritage. Apart from being a, a researcher, 
I am also a, a teacher or a professor. So as Frances to mention, uh, I give lectures uh, in different uh, bachelor's and master degrees. Uh, in this case, I also uh, give lectures uh, in the field of food science, environmental science, and of course, in the field of uh, cultural heritage. As you can see, uh, I teach in a master degree uh, related with the management of the landscape and also heritage, territory, and city. And what they have in common all of these uh, uh, degrees? In all of them, I'm able to teach uh, analytical techniques and methodology. Concretely, focusing the attention uh, in the master related with uh, the management of landscape and heritage, uh, I have uh, students from different uh, fields of applications or knowledge such as chemists, geologists, uh, environmentalists, architects, historians, archaeologists, and others. Okay, so in this case, uh, I need to transmit and explain information related with analytical instrumentation and methodologies. The students, uh, we can explain the wide variety of instrumentation that we have uh, in our laboratories. Here you can see different uh, instruments, uh, all of them located uh, in our facilities, in, in our laboratory. And uh, we can mention uh, destructive techniques, such as uh, chromatographic techniques, ACP, or uh, mainly non-destructive techniques, which are very, very uh, useful in the field of uh, editing science. Uh, that allow us to study elementally and molecularly uh, samples, objects, or items belonging to cultural heritage. Apart from bench top instruments, we have uh, portable uh, alternatives. Uh, in the uh, slide, you can see also the alternatives that we have uh, in our laboratory. And as we know, they are very useful when we cannot uh, sample on or when the objects cannot be transferred or moved to, to our laboratories. When I need to, to explain these techniques uh, or introduce the uh, utility of uh, these techniques, uh, I think that uh, it is uh, uh, quite difficult uh, to transmit all the powerfulness of these techniques, considering the wide variety of uh, field of knowledge uh, of the students and um, studying this kind of uh, master degrees related with the conservation of cultural heritage. So when I need to prepare my, my lectures, I always make this question, what or how much should I transmit to the students? It is quite difficult sometimes because uh, we need to introduce the technique and also to explain the fundamental because otherwise, if we don't explain properly the fundamental and the application, we can uh, explain this kind of instruments as black boxes. And this is not our aim, because uh, we want to extract the maximum information and we want to obtain reliable information. In this sense, as you probably know, uh, some of these instruments here, I show you uh, an example of a portable or handheld x ray fluorescence screen. In this instrument, we uh, they implement different kind of methods, uh, in-house methods created by the companies that we usually apply uh, in the field or even in the laboratory. Sometimes this can be nice, we can obtain a preliminary results, but this is also dangerous because we need to transmit uh, to our students that these results are not uh, conclusive and quantitative. These are only uh, uh, an approximate information of, of what we have. Uh, especially analytical chemists, we know that we need to work hard to develop quantitative methodologies. So I want to um, speak a little bit about other alternatives that we have apart from the commercial ones. What we have uh, commercially in the instrumental work or uh, in the instrumental work or in the field of uh, methodologies related with analytical chemistry. For example, uh, nowadays we can use a macro X-ray fluorescence option 
Uh, this is widely used. Here you can see a video of the uh, working on site uh, in the Rex Museum. Uh, and we can also use hyperspectral imaging. What happened with these techniques? The, these techniques are commercial. We, we can uh, uh, buy this kind uh, of instruments commercially. So I think that at this moment, maybe years ago, yes, but at this moment, this kind of instruments are not new because they are commercially accessible. However, for example, uh, there are other new developments that I think that uh, we should underline. For example, uh, the option of doing macro X-ray power diffraction. The option of doing uh, imaging with X-ray power diffraction, I think that is a new trend, very useful when, for example, other kind of molecular techniques such as Raman or infrared uh, give us problems uh, when we need to determine the molecular composition of specific pigments or other kind of materials. Moving to other uh, new uh, developments in the field of molecular analysis, all of us, we know about Raman spectroscopy, but we can mention also microspatial offset Raman spectroscopy or source. Uh, this is quite interesting and we can uh, extract molecular information of underlying uh, layers, for example, in painting. So this is very nice and I think that this can be also an actual, but also a, a future trend. And also a future trend, and this is a quite a new a, a research or publication in analytical chemistry journal, is the option of, of doing Raman imaging, but in a macro scale, not in a, a microscopic scale. Uh, most of us, we know the micro uh, options with the Raman spectroscopy, for example, with the confocal uh, Raman microscopes. But in this case, uh, we can uh, well, have a look to this kind of new alternatives to do a more macro uh, imaging analysis using Raman. Also, if we move to elemental study, we are very uh, familiar with uh, X-ray fluorescence to do elemental or atomic studies. But we also have, and also in the, in the field of cultural heritage, we have another interesting technique, which is laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, which use a laser that performs the ablation of the material. And in a plasma, the uh, atoms are excited and emissions are collected in a spectrometer to uh, have uh, an spectrum that we can interpret to obtain elemental or atomic information. This technique uh, is also applied in the, in the field of uh, cultural heritage, but which can be the new uh, methodological development? I think that the new uh, application can be to do imaging. Uh, in the field of cultural heritage, there are not very clear examples of uh, lips imaging. Here in, the, in this slide, I introduce you um, an example from the uh, geological point of view. This is a, a section of, a, of a stone. And here you can see some nice uh, images obtained or elemental distribution of elements. They obtain it from imaging uh, with the laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. So I think that this is going to be also uh, a new trend or a new option for the field of cultural heritage. Also, we don't need to forget censoring. Uh, Chiara introduces the, the option of uh, censoring uh, using data loggers and so on. Uh, but uh, moving to the chemical uh, characterization, uh, we can mention uh, well, in the last year different kind of alternatives uh, using, for example, hydrogels or nanostructure films, for example, to, to determine the, the, the nature of the binders in paintings. Uh, doing, let's say, uh, nano sampling or micro sampling and then analyzing those uh, nanostructure films with uh, different techniques uh, such as Maldito's MS, LCMS MS, and so on. Also, CERS can be used uh, 
using a different kind of nanostructure films to determine a organic and inorganic molecules. So I think that this is uh, not new in this year. This is not something developed this year, let's say, but this is also a trend uh, during the last uh, years. And this will allow us to uh, not conduct a sampling process uh, in an artwork or in an item belonging to the cultural heritage. So this is also very uh, helpful for us. So uh, considering the wide variety of instruments, uh, the question can be which kind of instrument or instruments are analytical methodologies should I select? So we need to decide. In this sense, I think that uh, for this selection, we need to uh, move to two different fields or two different applications. On one side, research, and on the other, maybe cultural studies or services. I'm going to, to start with the cultural analysis or services. Sometimes, uh, well, let's say companies uh, related with the study of cultural heritage or even us as universities, we receive uh, different kind of uh, uh, proposals from the side of uh, museums and so on to do some punctual studies on artworks or uh, materials. For example, the study of pigments, let's say in paintings, manuscripts and so on. In this case, it's normally they want to confirm only the nature of the of the pigments used. So in these cases, uh, and also uh, I can show you this other example, we use our conventional techniques that we have in the laboratory. So I think that in this case uh, we are applying a deterministic uh, approach. Here you have uh, um, uh, information about uh, a collection. A host in the uh, Bilbao, uh, in the Fine Arts Museum from Bilbao. Uh, it is the palace collection, which uh, include objects from Japan, China, Korea, Vietnam. You can see different kind of tables, masks, the ceremony, ceramics, in rows, different kind of Japanese objects, including including shubas. Uh, shubas are the uh, protective uh, objects from the katana. In this case, uh, we have uh, 291 objects. What happens if, uh, if they ask us to analyze all of them by a service, this will cost a lot. So sometimes uh, with the budget that uh, museums or uh, different institutions have, it is impossible to do a service. So sometimes we need to move to research in order to achieve uh, this kind of uh, studies or projects. In this sense, we move to the research and we were able to analyze in situ without moving the objects uh, to the laboratory, a, a wide variety of objects, uh, almost 200 objects. In this sense, uh, after that, the museum performed uh, an exposition and they also publish a catalog with all the uh, studies that we perform in the context of this project. So sometimes, as you can see, the punctual services or analysis uh, can be uh, can become uh, as research projects. In this sense, I introduce you also another example. This was a, well, a proposal that we recite from the a Provincial Council of Alaba. Alaba is one of the three provinces from the Basque Country. Uh, this is a Japanese armor property of the uh, Armour uh, Museum of Alaba. As you can see, uh, there are metallic uh, details. Uh, uh, it has also lacquer wooden. So we start in situ analyzing because it was not possible to, to extract samples. So all the information uh, that we collect was only with a portable or handheld instrumentation. And one of the main aims was to uh, confirm if uh, the uh, Urusi lacquer was used uh, in this kind of armor. 
So we start using different kind of techniques and for example, using infrared and Raman spectroscopy, uh, from the very beginning, we were only able to determine the nature of nitrocellulose. You know that nitrocellulose, for example, is a lacquer that uh, it is widely used to lacquer, for example, the guitars. So the conservators told us nitrocellulose, this is not a, a, a Japanese armor, that is, this is not a real a, object. So we start thinking and say, maybe this is uh, something that was applied after. So we asked to the uh, conservators to uh, perform uh, some little super, superficial cleaning of that nitrocellulose in order to try to remove it. And after that, we, con uh, we continue doing our analysis and we were able to identify the UDC lacquer because as you know, uh, it's the shop that comes from a tree from the uh, Asian uh, region, which is the Rus Bernitiplua. In this sense, uh, this can be a nice example that demonstrates that maybe a direct uh, in situ measurement with portable instruments it is not enough to extract conclusions. So this can show us that the uh, portable instruments and in situ application have their limitations. So moving to the pure research and when we need to uh, design our uh, research strategy, I think that the most important thing is to have a research question. In this sense, I want to uh, finish this uh, presentation uh, introducing you to a uh, kind of research uh, that were designed based on a specific research question. And I think that this is the most important issue when we are doing a research, to make a question. Uh, as Francesco mentioned in the introduction, uh, we are able to conduct uh, studies in Pompeii since 2010. And from the very beginning, uh, we start or we move there uh, to, let's say, not to do a service, but more close to a service than a, than a research. Because we were invited by a Finnish uh, archaeologist only to, to determine or to study the, the nature of the pigments uh, used in one Pompeian house. Their aim was only to, to know which was the original composition. But during years, uh, we moved from the service to the research field. So we start studying more than the orig original nature of the pigments they use in the wall paintings of Pompeii. For example, I want to introduce you uh, one short uh, uh, example related with our research questions in Pompeii. Here you can see uh, one a painting uh, from one Pompeian house. Uh, this is from the uh, Golden Cupids in Pompeii. Here you can see some color transformations, concretely from yellow to red. Yellow ochre or goethite can dehydrate at high temperatures. Here you can see which uh, temperature range and can transform into red due to this dehydration process. As you know, uh, Pompeii was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius and materials at high temperature were ejected. This kind of temperatures were easily reached at the, that moment. So uh, we can say that this is a color transformation due to the impact of the high temperature pyroclastic and other materials ejected by the Vesuvius. In this sense, uh, the archaeological park of Pompeii uh, proposed the following, the following question. Is it possible to discriminate the original red color from the one obtained from the yellow transformation? That is, uh, can we uh, discriminate the original hematite use from the one, the red color obtained from the yellow goethite? So we start constructing our uh, analytical methodologies. And for example, we uh, perform studies in two Pompeian houses with this transformation process. 
And with the portable X-ray fluorescence, we were able to construct uh, this kind of uh, model based on principal component analysis. And this uh, was uh, possible or it allows us to discriminate the original red from the one obtained from the transformation of the yellow. And which was the key element that allowed us to discriminate? In this case, arsenic. Arsenic uh, was only present in the original red ones, and not in the, in the red colors obtained from the yellow transformation. So this can be a nice example uh, in which the portable techniques can be useful to extract conclusive uh, information uh, uh, in the field. However, we continue researching, we continue increasing information, and we perform accelerated weathering uh, experiments, thermal experiments, to uh, transform the uh, original yellow. These are original fragments from Pompeii. And uh, by using a Raman imaging, we were able to quantify the uh, percentage of transformation according to its temperature range. Moreover, using a portable uh, force instrument reflectance in the Bismir uh, spectral range, and also uh, applying principal component analysis, we were able to discriminate using these aged uh, fragments, we were able to discriminate the original red from the one uh, obtained from the transformation of the yellow. And even more, we were able to discriminate uh, with this technique uh, the, according to the transformation, depending on the temperature. So using this model and applying this portable technique and analyzing different murals from Pompeii impact by their eruption, we are able to uh, determine which was the impact temperature on each a mural. And this is important because uh, although we know or we have uh, the history or what happens during the eruption, uh, nowadays, uh, for example, volcanologists, they are uh, increasing the knowledge and acquiring more information to reconstruct what happened at that time uh, during the eruption in Pompeii. As I mentioned, uh, we are working there since many years ago. And also, and with this uh, last uh, case, I will finish. Uh, we study a lot uh, the problematic related with the uh, salt crystallization. In this sense, this problematic can be uh, huge because uh, the intonaco can be loose, as you can see in these pictures. Here, uh, you can see a very extreme case in which we cannot see macroscopically uh, paintings. For example, this uh, fresco fragment was detached uh, in the first excavations uh, one a century ago, and this fragment is preserved in the Archaeological Museum of Naples. And this fragment was located here. So, Imagine this is the conservation in the museum, and this is the nowadays the situation of this uh, mural. So most or all the paintings have been loose. This is also very uh, significant because uh, this is a painting from the Casa degli Amorini Dorati, a picture from the uh, from the very beginning, and we move to the 80s. And you can see how we are losing some of the figures. And some years ago, this is the situation. We almost lose uh, the painting. Among others, uh, the formation of salts and the transformation of the binder of fresco paintings, the calcium carbonate, can promote the losing of the pigment grains. In this sense, we study a lot the nature of the salts, most of the times mainly using uh, in situ uh, techniques, because as you probably know, the, the sampling process in, in Pompeii is a little bit restricted. 
So we were able to determine the nature of different kind of salts from sulfates to nitrates and so on. But the most important thing is to identify the uh, sources of ion infiltration to try to stop them or to block them in order not to contribute to the new formation of salt crystallizations. In this sense, we analyzed the, the groundwater from Pompeii. At this moment, there is only uh, one original well open in Pompeii, and it is located in the house of uh, M. Pompidou. And we conduct the, the study of the, of the ions, of the soluble ions present in the groundwater and also in the rainwater of Pompeii. Nowadays, collected this rainwater. And as you can see, apart from sulfates, we have a, a nice contribution of uh, alkali and alkali hertz uh, cations. And as you can see, also nitrates and uh, halides, chloride mainly also fluorine. In this sense, we need to know that in volcanic emissions, apart from water vapor, CO2, SO2, and sulfidric acid, there are also emissions of chlorhydric and in less proportion fluorhydric acid. And during the uh, pyroclastic emissions, materials at high temperatures, crystallization of fluorines uh, can also uh, be found because uh, this kind of salts are absorbed in the emitted particles in the pyroclast em emitted. And also the uh, halogen gases can be uh, trapped or absorbed on silicates. Let's say, for, for example, the, the flogopite, which is uh, this kind of silicates in which the hydroxyls can be uh, substituted by the fluorine. You know also that uh, in the last years, uh, different studies have been conducted in bones, for example, in the Vesuvian area, assessing the fluorosis uh, that uh, inhabitants of uh, the Roman city of Pompeii suffer due to the drinking water. At that moment, the drinking water has a high uh, concentration of fluorine, mainly due to the volcanic origin of the area. Here you can see that the groundwater has three ppm. We need to know that the who uh, allow uh, in our drinking water uh, a maximum concentration of one ppm of fluorine. So as you can see, this is three times the concentration allowed by the who. But uh, moving to recent uh, excavation, here you can see a, a nice example of a painting from Leda and the Swan. Uh, here you can see the progress of the excavation. And here you can see the pyroclast are there uh, on the surface of the painting. So what happens? These pyroclasts uh, were in contact uh, with the paintings uh, in the burial uh, during centuries uh, ago. And also while excavating, they are exposed to the environment and also maybe to the rainwater. So we know that rain can leach uh, ions. In this sense, our research question was, which ions and in which concentration can be leached from, from pyroclastic materials? Because this, the pyroclasts, can be also ion source for the wall paintings of Pompeii that can infiltrate to the uh, porous material. In this sense, uh, we analyze uh, pyroclasts from Pompeii with portable instruments, being possible to determine the presence of halides such as chloride, and also with laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, which is not so commonly applied in the field of cultural heritage, uh, but maybe yes, in the last years, we were able, thanks to the molecular bands, to identify the presence also of fluorine. In this sense, we continue with our research, sampling different stratigraphies of pyroclasts in different areas of Pompeii. Moving the materials to the laboratory, we conduct leaching experiments only with milliliter water. So we didn't use uh, acidic, uh, more acidic solutions to leach. 
and we avoid the grinding process of the materials in order to reproduce the direct leaching and the possible direct transfer of the ions to the paintings. And we quantify the anions and cations using ion chromatography. With that, we determine that the average concentration of sulfates coming from the pyroclast, we need to mention also that these are not pristine pyroclasts because these pyroclasts have been in contact with the, with the environment. So previously, a leaching, naturally leaching process uh, uh, took place. So this pyroclast previously lose uh, a high proportion of ions, so we are determining the remanent concentration of ions. Uh, uh, although we are determining the remanent concentration, we are able to see an average of three ppm of sulfates, and in some specific uh, samples or in some specific pyroclastic strata, we are uh, determining concentrations much higher than those that are present in the groundwater of Pompeii. So uh, moving to, for example, this uh, basement in, the, in one of the house of Pompeii, we can see here the high problematic of sulfates, and it is clear that we can in situ determine the presence of sulfates. Moving also to nitrates, this place is full of nitrates also, and here you can see the concentration uh, coming from the lapilli, which is a, a specific kind of uh, a volcanic uh, material or, or stones emitted. Uh, you can see here the high concentration of nitrates determined in this lapilli during our leaching experiments. Moving to the allies, you can see here that, for example, fluorine, the average concentration is around 1.5 ppm, higher than the one that OMS, uh, sorry, who uh, recommend, but in some cases, it is even higher than the concentration present in the groundwater. And also in this specific strata, the concentration of chlorines is, let's say, five times higher than in the case of the groundwater. And also the alkali and alkali earth elements high in the groundwaters are also high in the leachets coming from the pyroclastic materials. Uh, doing correlation analysis in the quantitative data. Yes, can you uh, wrap, up, yeah. wrap up? Yeah. Thank you. All the, this is the last part. We can see a, a nice correlation between the alkali elements and the alkali elements with the chlorines. So we can say that these uh, al uh, allies are of um, volcanic origin because uh, sodium and potassium are the main alkali and alkali earth elements emitted in the volcanic eruptions. Using the quantitative uh, information, we uh, perform some uh, thermodynamic modelics using the Frixi software to predict which kind of salts can be crystallized uh, coming from the, uh, from the concentrations of the leaching experiments. And we were able to uh, define or uh, model the uh, crystallization of the following sulfates, but also fluorines. And also from the groundwater, we model the precipitation of fluorines. In situ, we were able to determine all of those uh, sulfates and fluorines, but uh, also additional sulfates that can only be formed if we increase the concentration of uh, sulfates, allies, and alkali uh, and alkali hertz elements in the modeling. So this allows us to uh, determine that uh, we uh, need to have different ion sources to see experimentally this, this kind of salts. And also, I want to highlight that this was very useful to determine the presence of fluorines, which cannot be detected by, by X-ray fluorescence. Indeed, we were able to perform a distribution element maps based on the qualitative information extracted from this. 
And with this slide, I want to finish my, my presentation with the main question of uh, this uh, workshop, olives or determinants. It is true that in this presentation, I introduce you the contribution of the analytical chemist, but it is also true that to construct a whole methodology, it is necessary uh, the contribution of different uh, uh, professional or researchers coming from the scientific field, but also from the site of uh, conservation and humanistic part. But also it is true that to construct a real a holistic approach, money is needed, as Luigi uh, uh, reinforced in the introduction of the workshop, and also time, and also the contribution and the effort of the different parts. So this is very important, and this should take into consideration to move to the holistic approach in the conservation of cultural heritage. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maite, for this uh, interesting uh, presentation, also about uh, the uh, the role of uh, how important is uh, the multidisciplinary approach uh, to uh, the problems raised by the conservation of cultural heritage. We have a question from uh, Austin Nevin uh, about your presentation. Can you explain why the arsenic is not present in the altered paint uh, and see if you were able uh, to identify uh, arsenic species uh, with Roman spectroscopy in the original paints. Okay, uh, as uh, this is a short presentation, I didn't mention that uh, apart from uh, studying in situ the paintings, we were able also to, to analyze original raw pigments uh, recovered from containers in Pompeii, and we analyzed in the laboratory different uh, hematite pigments and uh, we compare also with uh, the analysis of raw uh, yellow ochre pigments. And if uh, it is true that in the raw materials, in the yellow ochre pigments using, for example, ICP uh, technique, we were able to determine in the yellow ones very, very little trace amount of arsenic. But this is, um, let's say, a concentration that uh, is not uh, detectable in situ. So uh, if we think about an in situ application, um, we are not going to be able to detect that arsenic in the yellow ochre. And uh, related with the molecular study or the speciation of the arsenic, uh, no, we are, we are uh, detecting arsenic at PPM levels, let's say. Uh, close to uh, below uh, 100 ppm, but Raman spectroscopy is not able to, to detect in, in the, any molecular form of arsenic in that case. No. So I think that is a very low concentration to be able to, to move to the speciation of the arsenic, at least with the conventional micro Raman instrumentation. Thank you, Maite. And there is also a nice, uh, a nice uh, reference about um, the uh, this uh, short open access guides that the Royal Society of Chemistry is publishing uh, by Scott in the chat. And there is one, uh, the one that is uh, referencing is about uh, LIBS, laser laser induced breakdown spectroscopy, which is a method that might uh, be not so familiar to all uh, all the people in the public. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much once again, Maita. We need some minute to move to the next speaker. Thank you. I missed uh, before uh, a question from uh, one of our panelists. So, Chiara, if you can uh, still remain afterwards, it will be appreciated. And we yes. move, uh, thanks a lot. And we move uh, to our next uh, uh, next speaker with uh, uh, Luca Placidi. Francesco. Yeah. Francisco, sorry, I, I just uh, put an, a, a question in the in the chat, but you yeah. you, you don't see it. Uh, about uh, what what do you mean, Luigi, by reference referenciation? Referenciation is a, is a very important field of of chemistry because it focuses about the quality and uh, and the economy of measurement. 
I see. The analytical chemistry, as Maite said very well, is the field of chemistry who firstly, which firstly faces the problem of the quality of the measurements. So that if you make measurements without any indication about precision, sensitivity, accuracy, and selectivity times, you, you, your, your measurements is discutable. So analytical chemistry introduces the concept of referenciation field. What is referenciation? It means if you make a measurement, you have to compare the result with an official method so that you can be sure that what was measured is correct. This field is called the referenciation as a general word. That means to have a material of reference that can be used in order to check the methods and the technology you adopt. So I want to I want to stress about the importance of analytical chemistry because analytical chemistry in the science, not only in chemistry, in the science was the first scientific field which faced the problem of the quality of the measurements. That means to compare results by an official method and by a reference material. So that if you measure, measure the, the sulfation of a marble with a new method, as you can imagine, anyone, you must check with the, a marble that is degraded by sulfate in a certified way. That means to compare. And this is very important for science generally. And, and what Mate said about the analytical chemistry, I think must be stressed. Thank you, Luis. Uh, if you want, we can move this to the to the afternoon session because I think that this is in, an interesting topic because uh, uh, related with referentiation, I think that we have an Achilles heel also uh, to mention. So I think that this is a nice topic from the for the afternoon for the session. In the afternoon, uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Luigi, for this important uh, important you. point I mean, uh, that you have raised. Uh, we are a little bit late I mean, uh, with our uh, with our talk, but we will continue I mean, uh, uh, talking about this. Our next speaker is uh, now uh, Professor Luca Placidi. Uh, Luca graduated in physics and engineering uh, with a, a PhD in mechanics and in uh, theoretical and applied mechanics. He's associate professor of uh, structural mechanics and mechanics of solids at the International Thermatic University Unilentuno in Italy is uh, an expert uh, in uh, continuum mechanics with microstructures and uh, variational models uh, for the analysis of damage to solid bodies. So something that is uh, very important uh, for objects and for built heritage and cultural heritage. And uh, Luca has been included in the world's uh, top 2% scientist list of uh, Stanford uh, University. Uh, Luca, uh, I think that I made you, yeah, yeah, I mean, you are already showing the presentation. The floor is yours. Please, I mean, start with your presentation. Thanks very much, Luca. We cannot uh, hear you. I have sent you a request to activate your audio, Luca. Okay. Now yes. Yeah, yeah, I think you, you can hear me. Thank you very much for your presentation and for the invitation to this uh, nice uh, uh, workshop uh, that, that I really appre appreciate until now and also for the organization. So thank you very much. In this um, uh, short presentation, I would like to, to present some uh, hint on um, a model for uh, the uh, deterministic evolution of mechanically, mechanical damage states and where this da damage stage is due to aging phenomena. So the outline of the talk is uh, easily uh, seen here after uh, an introduction. I will uh, talk about the um, a bit on the diffusion model and I will address some discussion point of the uh, workshop 
uh, that, mm, with which uh, this workshop was an announced before uh, ending uh, the talk with some outlook. So conservation and restoration of historical structures are in this presentation linked with the following, with their mechanical characterization, um, the characterization of the structures, with the knowledge of the techniques of the constructions, and with developing tools for advanced numerical, numerical analysis. Historical constructions may, we know, that may collapse not only because of accidental actions, extraordinary actions like earthquakes or other things, but also because of fatigue and because of strength degradation due to time and to chemical attacks from the environment. Uh, and several methods and computational tools with different levels of complexity are available for the assessment of the mechanical behavior of historical constructions. However, of course, the higher is the complexity of these techniques, the higher is the precision, uh, hopefully, and the higher is the computational demand. However, and thus, a compromise is necessary between complexity of, the, of this technique and the precision of the result according to the necessities of the problem. In mechanics of structures, one defines the structure, first of all, with this geometry. And here, the, the easiest example is a line or a beam with also with, with the stiffness. So the stiffness is a very important quantity that is uh, important for the definition of the structure. Besides, we need to define the constraints of the displacement, for example, with a clamp, and we call it a kinematical constraint, but we also need to define some dynamical constraints or defines the external action on our body. Uh, the output of a structural analysis is the knowledge, as we know, of the display of, of two things, essentially, of the displacement fields, and of the state of stress. We want to remark that they both depend, displacement and state of stress, depend upon the stiffness of the structure, uh, of the structure into consideration. And generally, the higher is the stiffness, the lower is the state of stress. Um, the stiffness of, of a structure is generally assumed ab initio, as a constant both in space than in time at, at, at the beginning. However, it can evolve uh, both in space, and we can, uh, we can induce a, um, a non-homogeneous body where uh, the stiffness is different point to point, and also this stiffness can evolve with time. Here, is, for example, is an, is, is an example where the stiffness decreases with time. And damage mechanics is a theory with which we study uh, such an evolution, an evolution both in time and in, in space. In most of engineering applications, damage is induced by deformation. That is the deformation that is induced by increasing the external force, for example, during an earthquake. We have our state of stress, we increase the load, the state of stress increases until it reaches a maximum admissible level. <coughs> In other words, the state of stress overcomes a certain value prescribed ab initio by material characterization and the structures start to suffer damage. Damage can therefore induce failure. In our simple example, the clamp is reduced to an inch and the collapse and also the, and, and the final consequence as the collapse of, of the structure like here. However, in some cases, the failure and the collapse of, a stru of the structure happens without any increase of the external force. 
uh, that is uh, in these other cases always maintained lower than the initial prescribed value, the initial maximum prescribed value. And one of the possible causes of this uh, is uh, the so-called fatigue, where the failure is activated after a large number of small amplitude cycle external loading forces. Another possibility is the aging, where this lowering, the lowering of the maximum admissible stress, is due, um, is due to many things, to chemical attacks, for example, and of many, and also for reasons of many different nature. In uh, this paper, uh, we have uh, considered, for example, a dam, the model like, like, like here, um, a, a dam that is uh, with, with water and so on, and that is modeled here as a beam. And we, we have uh, modeled this uh, um, uh, reduction of maximum admissible stress with an artificial function like here, where we see that the, uh, at the bottom of the, bum, of, of, of the dam, this reduction is higher than at the top. Because we know that at the bottom of the dam, we have a more, um, the, uh, we have a more, the, the environment is uh, induce more damage. Uh, therefore, we compute with this model the, um, the evolution of a damage measure. And we, so we see that in the region where the maximum visible stress is artificially reduced, so at the bottom, we have an increase of the damage field, like here. Um, in most of these cases, it is the environment. So, the, but the, the problem, the question is why this maximum admissible stress is reduced. And in most of these cases, it is the environmental condition that induces the reduction of maximum admissible stress on a given object. So the idea of this research is the following. The environmental condition is modeled as a fluid or as a concentration of ion of chemical attacks. We, we call it in this presentation simply a fluid but one can, should have in mind chemical attacks or the concentration of ions that affect damage of the structure. And this is the, for example, in, in this case, we, this is a pressure of, 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 uh, of this chemical attacks, of this fluid that induces uh, aging and damage phenomena. The idea is that this fluid penetrates into the object and diffuses. Here, the environment pushes the fluid uniformly on the structure. This is the position on the structure, and this is time. So we induce a uniform pushing on the structure. And as a consequence, we have a uniform increase of this concentration and also a uniform increase of the state of damage. But now we, the, the increasing of damage is due to the environmental condition and not artificially. Here, we show a slightly more complicated cases. The IDES, the environment, pushes the fluid non-uniformly on the structure. At the bottom, the pressure of the external environment is higher in this simple example. And as a consequence, the concentration of the fluids is higher at the bottom, is not anymore uniform, and as a final consequence, also the damage is increased at the bottom, where the, uh, the chemical attack is conceived to be higher. Uh, the discussion of uh, this workshop uh, uh, starts with a, a very important question. What is important and relevant to measure? So in this... Uh, mm, Presentation, the model can be explained by a set of equations that are being uh, calculated. And uh, of course, what are the, the, the relevant measures of this, of, of, of this model? This, the relevant measure of, the, of this model is the 
diffusivity of the fluid along the structure that they are um, con that are uh, assumed to be modeled by these two parameters. Then we need to have an interpretation of the external environmental condition as an external input for the evolution equation of the fluid concentration. Here, for example, we have a distributed input in this term. Finally, another term that is relevant to measure is the coupling between the density of the fluid and the damage parameter. This term is very important because it, uh, um, it makes the, the density of the fluid to damage the structure. Another question is, can one make an easy choice of what one would like to measure and the type of data interpretation according to the available resources? Okay, from the point of view of structural mechanics and of the model illustrated here, measuring the state of damage or of the stiffness of the structure as a function of time is necessary to set the parameters of the model. Would it be important to have significant or novel parameters to establish or to limit the determinism in heritage science? The determinism is achieved once the parameters of the model are established. Of course, at the beginning, we don't have uh, these numbers and therefore we don't have the, the, the consequence of the determinism, but we have it only after identification of these parameters. Can one extract the most of the knowledge from the measurements one has acquired? Okay, in my opinion, this is an important point. In my opinion, this is possible only after a rational formulation of a model like this one, and only after a rational formulation of a model, the, the data, the measuring data are useful for understanding the behavior of the uh, object to be modeled, of the, of the object of investigation. The relationship between heritage science and climate change uh, is very important. Why? Because climate, climate conditions induce uh, different inputs into the model, as we have uh, shown before. So it is important to have a connection between the con climate condition and the input on, on the model that must be investigated better. And the actual, relevant, the actual relevance of the scientific diagnostics for conservation and museum purposes uh, are important. Yes, the scientific diagnostics is relevant to how, why in this model it is relevant to acquire the present state of the kinematical descriptors. And the emergence of new ICT technologies uh, approaches to extract the most from the data acquired from the study of cultural heritage are very important. For example, continuous monitoring is important for, correct for, co for a correct updating of the parameters of the model that are important for, for the numerical investigation of, of the model. The outlook uh, of, this, uh, of this work are uh, as follows. Uh, we want to establish, uh, we need to establish new experiments for uh, the material, in order to, to, to have a correct material characterization in terms of the newly defined parameters that I have shown before. We need to extend uh, the damage diffusion model, uh, this damage diffusion model uh, also for the most relevant 2D and also for the 3D case, the three-dimensional case, we need, therefore, after conceiving the new damage diffusion model for the 3D case, we need to characterize also this, uh, the different parameters. Um, and therefore, establish, after its material characterization in terms of this model, a precise estimation of the life of a given structure. This is, can be done after 
a correct numerical simulation. And then finally, we can study with this model, we could study uh, different scenarios with different uh, external environmental conditions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Luca. This has helped also us I mean, to be a little bit more on time. We have, um, I, I have personally a question, but we have a question also from, um, uh, from Maite. Maite, please. Hello, thank you very much for the presentation. I have one question uh, related with the assessment uh, of the mechanical problems and everything. Uh, which kind of, for example, I know about, uh, I have never used it, but I know that uh, in the last years, for example, computer tomography is taking more and more place uh, in the methodologies. Uh, do you have experience on that or uh, do you integrate the uh, computer tomography in your studies and can you tell us something about it or do you have personally, experience? Personally, I, I didn't do, I, I did not work on, on it, but I know that uh, uh, tomography is a, is a very important uh, um, tool for investigating what? For investigating the, exactly the actual um, so for, for investigating many, many things, uh, for example, the displacement of, uh, so the kinematic, some kinematic descriptor of, of the model, for example, the displacement for, can be estimated with this, not only in the external surface of your model, but also in the internal part. And this is very important because we know that uh, looking at the external part of, 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 of a body, does not mean that you know everything inside. And most of the time it is that happens inside that is more relevant. And therefore, uh, and from this, we can also estimate the stiffness, the actual value of the stiffness and therefore of damage. And with this, uh, with this um, uh, knowledge, we are able to make a correct uh, uh, numerical simulation for uh, predict in the future, but also it is important to a better characterization of uh, the material parameters of the model. Because this is the, this is in fact the weak point of this uh, procedure, the characterization of the material constants. Thanks so very Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from the public from Azan uh, uh, Skynak. Sorry, my breath, my bad pronunciation of uh, the name of the colleague. Uh, can you give a brief outline for the experiments for materials characterization, uh, Luca? Uh, material characterization can be done in a standard way. For example, uh, there are um, um, I mean, uh, there are, um, uh, we, can, we can distinguish uh, different uh, methods, um, different area of this, for, for these methods. Uh, we, can, uh, we can have a destructive method in which you take a material and you test it mechanically in order to, to arrive to the stiffness of the, pro, of, of the product of the, for example, you can extrapolate from a dam or from a construction, a material sample, and then you test it. For example, you make a tension, uh, tension test, compression test, shear test, and you arrive to the stiffness of the problem. You can do this for one time, for another time, and then you can have, the, you can see the evolution of, um, of this stiffness uh, on time and also a distribution of the stiffness uh, along the product on the on the pro on the on the structure. However, this uh, is a destructive method. So you can you, you can do this uh, at the beginning, assuming that the material is hom homogeneous, uh, and with this um, ident identification, you can design your uh, your structure. In order to identify this uh, after where the opera is already done, um, we, can, we can have some non-destructive, we, we need to, to use some non-destructive 
evaluation because we don't want to destroy an opera, uh, especially from an, an opera, a, a structure in the, that are important for this workshop. So from cultural, cultural, cultural heritage, we cannot de destroy your, your opera to understand the stiffness. Otherwise, it's useless everything. So the idea is to use, for example, uh, some dynamic excitation and uh, arrive to the knowledge of the velocity of the waves. If you, in, this, uh, in this case, you can, uh, you can uh, characterize the velocity of the waves and from the velocity of the waves arrive to an average value of the stiffness. Another uh, possibility, um, uh, uh, yeah, the, the velocity of the waves, but in this velocity of the waves uh, can be achieved we in different direction. I mean, if you have uh, a say, uh, you, if you have a, an, an opera, you can excite dynamically. So with a very small amplitude, or non destroyed um, approach in one point and detect the waves in many other points so that you can investigate different lines of, of, um, of your opera, of your uh, structure, and then you understand the stiffness in different directions. So this is a, some short uh, um, overview on this, uh, on this um, kind of, of investigation, but there are really a lot uh, of these methods. The colleague also. I don't know if I have. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry, Luca. I don't know if I, if I have. Uh, I don't know if I have uh, answered the correct um, the the question, uh, the specific question in a correct way. The colleague is also pointing sorry. also to uh, to non-destructive methods, so which might be more interesting. And uh, thank you, thank you, Luca, and also Luigi is. Uh, uh, talking uh, as uh, writing about the duality of uh, mechanical damages uh, versus chemical degradation, which is something, however, that uh, in the recent in the recent years, I mean, has been also somehow connected. So, so if you can uh, uh, comment on uh, the uh, this duality of mechanical damages and chemical degradation, Luca. So the. Um... In fact, the, the, the topic of uh, this uh, uh, presentation is exactly this. So make a connection between the um, mechanical uh, degradation and the chemical composition. And, and, and the chemical ions, for example, the ions that induce damage. The problem is how can we have a model in which uh, the evolution of damage is induced by this uh, concentration. And I think that this model can couple the two fields. We have the diffusion of uh, an ideal fluid into the opera with some parameters that uh, induce, for example, for example, uh, the um, that, that are that, that connects uh, that I, that is connected with the diffusivity of these ions inside the opera, and then, uh, but this uh, diffusion, the, this the, the concentration of this fluid, uh, we know that can uh, um, can increase, so from zero to some some level, but can only decrease. I mean, uh, these ions can only be removed. However, the damage state is still there. So the damage state is a consequence of previous presence of these ions. Therefore, we need to, to have two kinematic descriptors, the concentration of the ions that, go, that can go on and off, up and down, and the concentration of, and, and also a measure of damage that can only be repaired. I mean, damage can only be, can only increase its value and not decrease. And this, for, this is the reason why we need that to have two kinematic descriptors. The diffusivity is on the concentration of the fluid and the damage, once is activated, is activated. And we cannot, uh, um, and this is, uh, and then the, 
the environmental condition induce something only on the fluid, not on damage directly. They induce damage through the presence of the fluid. And this is the reason why key parameter of this model is this, uh, what I called here, KC omega, in which you have a coupling between the presence of these ions and damage effect. Thanks very much uh, once again, uh, Luca, for your interesting uh, uh, presentation. There was, uh, we are already in the break, I and mean, then we will start again with our talks at um, 11.30. We had uh, a question before uh, from uh, Joanne Cassar for, uh, for Chiara. And uh, yeah, if, uh, uh, if Joanne would like I mean, uh, to, to talk, uh, please, uh, Joanne, I mean, you, can, uh, you can unmute and uh, pose your question uh, to Chiara. Yes. Yes, yes, I'm here. I, I'm listening uh, incognito, but I'm listening to all the interesting presentations. Thank you. Um, yes, I did have a question for uh, for Chiara because um, I was very interested in the archaeological site that you presented at the start, and the um, because we are doing um, similar things on our prehistoric temples over here, um, and I'm not sure if I understood incorrectly but you mentioned en 15757 yes which i believe is for organic materials so what is the connection between using that standard when you are doing archaeological sites i, I didn't understand the connection uh, yeah um i mean uh, the author used this uh, to evaluate a sort of physical decay but i agree with you that the standard is uh, for organic material so especially for wood but they apply the without explaining the detail uh, the reason probably because they uh, think that this standard is useful in general for mechanical decay or physical decay do you have any thoughts on it? Would, would you do the same? Would you take the same approach? Because I find it a uh, bit... No, I ridiculous. think that uh, in my opinion, what could be more interesting if uh, I deal, for example, with stone or bricks or mansory is to uh, apply, for example, a threshold that you know when uh, salts can crystallize. This could be more interesting, in my opinion. Yes, yes, I agree with you because I find it a bit risky to, to go to jump from organics to inorganics and use the same standard. I mean, I yes, don't know. I wouldn't do Let, but I agree with you, but uh, I wanted uh, quoted that case study just to show the complexity of the number of data logger, the way in which they use uh, uh, all these data logger uh, before to start the campaign to calibrate all the instrumentation and this interesting aspect of creating a matrix of risk, uh, just looking at the outlay. Yes, it was super interesting. The whole presentation and all the presentations have been interesting. And yours was your was very, very interesting as well. It was just that I had this, this question mark. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, welcome. Thanks a lot, uh, Joanne and uh, Chiara, to contribute to the discussion. We are uh, in a little break. We will uh, reconvene again in uh, 10 minutes. Uh, just do not leave. I will put... Uh, yeah, Maite, please. Uh, no, I, I only want to mention one thing because uh, in the introduction, I forgot to mention the scientific committee uh, of the workshop. Okay, so I start very quickly to pass the, the word to Luigi. So we want also thank you to Caroline Beltinger, Ana Dominguez Vidal, Irka Agdas, Rocco Maceo, Miguel Angel Respaldita, and Lucia Toniolo, uh, which are uh, on board in the scientific committee. So thank you very much also uh, for, for taking part and assist this uh, workshop. And that's all from my side. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We will be again here in uh, 10 minutes exactly. See you later. See you later. Hello, welcome back. Uh, I mean, we have uh, also uh, a question for um, uh, Chiara uh, for a talk. We will do it after the morning session so that so we try to be on time. I mean, with the, with the speakers, 
and uh, now I welcome I welcome uh, uh, to our workshop uh, uh, Scott Alan Orr and Babesh Shah, uh, and I will give a brief introduction about uh, their backgrounds. Hi Scott, hi Bav. Scott Alan Orr is a lecturer in heritage data science at the UCL Institute for Sustainable Heritage. He's an engineer with broad interests. His research is within heritage science and primarily uses data-driven approaches <clears throat> to assess environmental impacts on the historic built environment. They use of non-destructive tools in building surveys and incorporating value and perception into scientific evaluation. His research emphasizes a holistic approach that to, to considering the historic built environment in its context. Is the deputy program director of, of the MSc of Data Science for Cultural Heritage at UCL, where he teaches uh, modules about heritage data visualization and heritage science. He's also a co author of a white paper on impact, vulnerabilities, and risks of climate change for heritage, co sponsored by IPCC, ICOMOS, and UNESCO as part of an, uh, an expert meeting held in December 2021. Welcome, Scott. And at the same time, I would like to introduce uh, Babesh Shah. Babesh Shah is a preventive conservation and data scientist at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Babesh's previous research includes environmental monitoring, dust and pollutants, integrated pest management and modeling light levels in the museum. He links uh, between the science um, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, has completed uh, recently a an uh, MSc in data science for cultural heritage at UCL in 2021 and has got uh, a master in chemistry at the Nottingham Trent University in 2002. He's uh, uh, a co-founder of very nice uh, uh, open access endeavor, which is Concode Data Science for Conservation Network, which uh, I really, I, I'm really personally really excited about that. So, so really cool. And is a website manager for the Icon Modern Material materials network welcome to both of you guys they will uh, deliver a presentation about uh, is data science in cultural heritage an, op an opportunity or a challenge please uh who should uh, uh, share the screen scott perfect i will thank you uh just a second so that i will uh, uh i will uh, uh put you just a sec chat not just a sec okay Participants, yeah, right. If you can, uh, maybe okay. No, I see that. Uh, no, no, no. I, I can, I can make him a, a presenter. Scott, now I'm on. You have the privilege yes. to be a presenter. Yes, thank you. Can you see that? All right. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Then I'll begin. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to speak today, and I speak on behalf of both myself and uh, Bavesh, who, uh, as mentioned in his biography, is a former student of mine, but equally qualified in a professional capacity as a scientist at the V&A Museum. <clears throat> when it, with this, the topic of this meeting came to us, <clears throat> uh, Bav and I had many interesting conversations about the relationship between this question of holism and determinism and data science and the opportunities it brings in cultural heritage. So hopefully today we'll show you a few um, ideas more about our general perception and experiences rather than on specific research projects uh, in the beginning. And then Bab will follow up with a more um, practical example demonstrating some of the things that we hope to explore. Uh, I probably don't need to explain or convince you that everywhere in the world, every part of our society, including different aspects of the heritage sector and research in cultural heritage, is increasingly becoming technological, data-driven, and that involves <clears throat> quite a number of different organizational changes and processes. And even um, just as a few examples, uh, we've already mentioned Concode, an initiative trying to acknowledge that there is a need for data working skills within the conservation community. Uh, the Foundation for Advancement in Conservation ran a 16-week course last year on data analysis and visualization for conservation professionals. And we increasingly see large-scale funding initiatives like the UK-based Towards a National Collection, looking at these challenges of data aggregation and technical challenges that underpin data science in a heritage context. 
even one of my alma maters recently ran a course, a course called Coding for Parents, acknowledging that parents were no longer equipped to be able to support their children in the learning they were doing, and these are school-aged children. So rather than think about very specific applications, although Bav will do this part in the second part, uh, the applications of data science and heritage, or specifically cultural heritage, are innumerable. So really, you can think about this as a combination of any number of types of heritage or typologies listed in the, the yellow icons in the top row here. Um, but also the, I'm not really sure what the chili pepper is doing there, I apologize. Uh, and the um, middle row, looking at different activities. So looking at management, conservation, engagement, interpretation, uh, <clears throat> and then combining these with different aspects of really grand challenges in society. So thinking about climate change, community and local action, the, the ongoing dialogue on sustainability as well as ethics and bias. And you can kind of draw a bubble around any one of these to understand um, like any example of where there's opportunities and perhaps challenges for data science and heritage. So the question is not to ask, what should data science contribute to heritage? But really it's, it's, it's the question of, you know, when does science become data science? And then what does that mean for a heritage context? And I really like this explanation that explores uh, how we might think about this as different from other forms of science. So one of the key things here is that one of the leading thinkers uh, in terms of defining what data science is, argues that you have to have a domain. So the argument that data science in a heritage context, that being the domain, is fundamentally different than data science undertaken in a different area. The same methods in a technical sense might be used, those being the aspects of computing, statistics, or informatics but it's the aspect of understanding the field, understanding its inherent epistemologies and its values that fundamentally makes data science different in a heritage context. And we have this really important aspect of thinking or critical imagination and qualitative reasoning, all the things that people maybe don't think of as obviously as being a part of data science. So perhaps very relevant to this workshop is when does heritage science become heritage data science? Because you might argue that almost everything we've seen today so far, uh, and indeed all heritage science as a scientific field, is underpinned by the use of data. So what I want to introduce to you is this idea of paradigms of scientific inquiry and trying to explain how each one of these is perhaps useful in heritage science and used, but maybe how a current thinking about data science is different. So the idea of the four paradigms of science was, uh, is one way of thinking about different types of scientific inquiry. So they broadly go in a chronological fashion in terms of development, but they're not mutually exclusive. So each of these four paradigms is still currently found in ongoing heritage science work. And I would say most of heritage science is probably classified within the third or the, the second world, or perhaps combination uh, a combination of multiple types of these paradigms. So we go first from experimental work, simply looking at observational science, and then moving towards theoretical work, trying to create models and generalization. And this is where a lot of, uh, I would say, measurements in, in cultural heritage are based in trying to find these relationships that can produce transferable knowledge to other scenarios and other applications, moving from fundamental scientific understanding into practical conservation implications. And then this third world, which is similar in a way to the second, uh, except that it's based on computation. So looking at calculations, simulations that would not otherwise be possible if perhaps relying on uh, analysis manually or in a um, quite a labor intensive way. <clears throat> but really what's interesting about data science is that it's um, one in one view, Jim Gray, who's the father of e-science and the open science movement uh, and data science intensive computing, talked about the fourth paradigm of scientific inquiry. And this was an exploratory inquiry. <clears throat> and the idea behind the fourth paradigm is that <clears throat> it's data intensive. It leverages the fact that society and different fields now has more data than it perhaps needed. So the big difference here is instead of measuring to inform a specific project, or instead of designing a campaign of monitoring, uh, the fourth paradigm looks at data that has already been collected, or it was collected before uh, the perhaps exact use or intention would be known. <clears throat> so I think one of the challenges here is that the best opportunities for data science currently come from scenarios where there is perhaps too much data to be analyzed manually already, or scenarios where perhaps by chance, 
uh, or simply because of longevity of an institution, there is a large amount of data available in a specific context. And Bab will speak about one of those examples in the second half of this presentation. So in the fourth paradigm, thinking about this, instead of starting with a hypothesis or starting with a case study or a particular motivation, um, you might think about the fourth paradigm as hypothesis generating science. This idea being that we, we turn the model of data collection and developing theories on its head. And we found that when we described this to our MSc students on the MSc data science for cultural heritage, one of the best ways to, to think about this is that rather than say, we want to investigate this phenomenon, this relationship, we find ourselves asking very different kinds of questions. And these are the kinds of questions that generate hypotheses. You know, what insight can be gained from this data set? Or what does a particular statistical technique or a particular kind of analysis reveal about the patterns and trends that are present in something? Or what relationships can be identified if we start to combine multiple data sets? This is a very different way of thinking about what the role of measurements might be in cultural heritage. And I think it is absolutely this balance that we need to further theoretical and fundamental understanding. And measurements and simulations remain one of those key ways. But equally, uh, they're necessary in this fourth paradigm because they help us to, for example, set criteria for performance or to understand whether or not these relationships are significant, moving beyond simply a fundamental understanding to more um, practice or implication oriented perspective. One of the interesting things about the current state of data science in, in cultural heritage is this idea of the development gap. Um, these two types of data science are not mutually exclusive, but they're useful for thinking about data in different ways. Um, one of them is perhaps a way that most people are familiar with, and this is the idea of analysis. So this is making sense of data in a fairly static way. Uh, this might be someone who's quite good at dealing with large amounts of data, they're good at producing visualizations, and they have a deep knowledge about a particular domain. Uh, they're good at writing about data or trying to synthesize that into useful information. So this might be the kind of thing where you collect data or you have um, acquired data that's already existing, and you do a one-off analysis. You draw insight from it, and you produce useful outputs from that. The other kind of data science activity is really focused on building, and this is interested uh, mainly focused on using data in production and looking at the kind of pipelines that are necessary to incorporate uh, data driven approaches into scientific activity. In reality, there's a very good mix of both here. And for example, we're seeing large scale examples of building activities in uh, large European projects, for example, uh, people trying to scale up analysis and look at this. So in my perspective, the development gap in cultural heritage is that we don't have people who have a deep knowledge of the domain of cultural heritage and specific areas of scientific inquiry who are equally qualified to do this building oriented data science, to build platforms and to understand the requirements uh, of, of data standards. Um, I'm not sure that it's reasonable to ask that of anyone, but the question remains here, how do we acknowledge this development gap? when it comes to data science and cultural heritage. Perhaps one of the ways to really think about this is to look at other areas uh, that I would say have done a much better job so far of drawing on open linked data. So two examples I wanted to pull out here are from genetics. Uh, one example of a large open access database uh, is the gene expression omnibus. And one of the things that's really interesting here is that it's mandated in almost any relevant journal to genetics to make your data available. And yes, we can put data in places like supplementary information uh, or supplementary files in publications, but it's not nearly as organized and standardized as a central repository that's available with individual um, um, identifiers for these data sets. There's another one here, which is the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology or IRIS. Uh, this is data driven, uh, drawn from over 100 US universities and the National Science Foundation. Um, and one thing is really interesting here is that there are four different kinds of output. It's not simply a place where you put data and forget about it because you had to do it for a publication, rather looking at monitoring in real time, um, searching historic events, software and tools, uh, and doing these things. And one argument here is that cultural heritage is small and competitive. So you know, this, is a, this is a reason why we're not as inclined to share. 
Uh, but on the contrary, I think this is precisely why we do need to be looking at our standards of data, how we share things, where we put them. And perhaps the, the key here is that it's not a, a need for more platforms. It's not a need for more open source tools, but it is fundamentally a culture change in how we operate and undertake science. And there are obviously good examples of this, but I'm trying to draw uh, at least my perspective of the overall state of this within heritage science. So just thinking very broadly about how the ecosystem of heritage science works, um, we need to realize that uh, kind of going back to this digital transformation very broadly in society, you know, how do we train people and how do we think about incorporating this aspect of data science into how we already undertake science, both in a fundamental research way, but also in terms of generating uh, insight that is useful and oriented towards the needs and priorities of conservators, curators, and managers. Um, and I think it, this really provides the opportunity to reflect on the kind of organizational change that's necessary in order to incorporate this idea of exploratory fourth paradigm data science within heritage science. Um, I'm now going to hand it over to Bavesh, who will speak about one particular example in which we tried to embody some of these uh, characteristics uh, in a specific project. Thank you, Scott. Um, yeah, so I'd like to introduce a, just a case study. So this is an example of a salt weathering tool I did in collaboration with UCL. Uh, Scott was my supervisor and it was in collaboration with the Royal Institute of Cultural Heritage in Belgium, the BIC IRPA. Um, the project was investigating the behaviour of salts and salt weathering in particular. Um, salt weathering is a particular issue for heritage buildings, objects, uh, archaeological sites, um, because it damages, um, because the salt concentrations can affect um, under a change of different climatic conditions and they cause damage to objects. Um, next slide, please, Scott. Uh, I also want to say that I'm also a data scientist at the v a data scientist at the VNA. Um, sort of a newly newly assigned post. So my main job is actually to look at temperature and humidity in, in the galleries in South Kensington and in the um, storage facilities. Next slide. Uh, so for the case study, I want to present uh, how the challenge was to develop a data science tool to assist with research into salt formation. So the salt formation uh, can be estimated under different climatic conditions using the RONSALT software. Uh, but before it goes into the RONSALT software, some calculations need to be performed. So I was given a spreadsheet to turn into a, a, a web application, like an on, interactive online website. Um, the interesting part of this project, and just to step back a little bit and to look at it, not from a technical point of view, but look at it from a data science challenge point of way, is you're kind of dealing with it in different domains. So you're taking measurements in the physical space, in the physical domain, the real world, what we see and what we interact with, and trying to interpret and trying to use the digital space to provide some interpretation before it goes into a risk decision space. Um, I sort of want to say you're trying to make decisions based on the real world, and the stakeholders in that decision space are the researchers, the conservators, the managers, people that have to use data from the real world to make decisions and this new actor or player that's appearing now is this digital space where you can take in multiple data sets multiple information and process it and it depends on how much agency you want to give to this digital space and how much of a player actor it can behave uh, next slide please thank you um this is an example of a data science workflow it's um uh, this is taken from the Hadley Wickham website. So Hadley said um, he's quite an important person in data science, but he's, he's defined a workflow of um, how you interpret data science. So you import data, you tidy, transform, you model, you visualize, and you want to communicate. And it's kind of a circular process. If you go to the next slide, um, uh, kind of a, a circular process where you want to introduce that into your particular project or your particular challenge that you have. So if if I'm perfectly honest, when you're doing these data science projects, most of the time you're spending, uh, when you have large, these large data sets, most of the time you're actually spending tidy and transforming it into useful 
uh, into a useful format that you're then going to use to model and visualize. Um, but in general, when you're working on a pro from my practical experience of working on projects, you're generally putting it into a risk based model. So you're monitoring the collections to understand the risk. Then you're using those risks to inform your decisions and then you're trying to communicate the decisions to key stakeholders who will then use that information to make the changes. So the changes you're going to have to defend your arguments and justify potential budget spends or other things. So communication is a key part of this uh, process. And finally is the action. So before you understand the actions, you need to do planning. You need to understand the, uh, the risks that are involved and the um, actions you take, the impacts of the actions. And finally, once you've undertaken your actions, you're going to review and you're going to check the uh, performance of everything. And this is where data science can really have really nice inputs into that because you can automate a lot of this with just with code. <clears throat> uh, oh, thank you, Scott. Uh, so the next slide is audiences. So um, just uh, understanding a, a key part of the challenge is to understand your audiences. So for this particular project, it was more uh, geared towards researchers and technical people. Um, but I also introduced other aspects of it. So there was uh, whether whether data was incorporated, which is useful for planners and managers to understand the risks, and these can be calculated uh, all automatically with code. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, another, another important aspect that I've really found a challenge was fitting a data science, creating a data science application into a workflow that already existed. Uh, part of this, a key part of the step of doing, creating a work, uh, creating a tool that is useful for an established workflow, is the design of it. Um, so I, I spent a little bit of time trying to research how data science tools were designed. There's plenty of information about how to create little widgets and tools that you add to your application and how they can be, you know, uh, how they look nice and how they can be integrated. But very little information about how you actually design these things and how they fit into workflows. Uh, so part of the research I did want to uh, did try and question, uh, survey, and query some of the researchers about how they use data and how they use code in their own particular project and how what are the useful outputs for it for a data science application tool. Uh, so it was a dialog. I tried to do a dialogic approach to this, and if there was more time, I would spend more time working on this aspect of it rather than some of the more technical technical aspects uh, and the modelling and the mathematics. Um, interesting findings I discovered from doing some research was uh, the most important aspects of any any of these data science tools was instructions, ease of use, and transparency. These were the kind of top level what people wanted to see from a data science tool. There were other questions I did ask, which I'm not included here, but these were the most positive and the most negative. Uh, the appearance and speed of use were actually the least important of the aspects, but that kind of does contradict what applications you use every day. Do you, you know, we all use Google, we all want a simple clean interface sometimes with how we interact with data. Just the final slide. Um, an, an interesting part of the survey, uh, surveying and uh, gathering information from people was that there is a demand. So once people were introduced, before they were introduced to the data science tool and after they introduced the data science tool, the demand increased and it increased. Um, most people still felt, most people felt like they were unsure if there were a real requirement for having data science tools or whether they were useful in their projects. But once having seen one, they were like, okay, this could be a potential useful application. Um, I just, uh, just want to highlight some of the practical some of the practical issues that we had with um, developing these things was there's a lack of infrastructure and when I say infrastructure I mean data warehousing uh, data storage servers net, um, networks um, and like uh, facilities like hosting a lot of these are, a lot of the data science tools are free to start with, but then when you interact with websites and data servers and hosting data, 
there's some of these charges suddenly start appearing and they, you have to factor that into a new data science project. Um, another consideration is standards, uh, data standards. So when you're sharing data, when you're, uh, a lot of, as I said, a lot of the time is spent on tidying data. So you want things to be labeled correctly and names to be, uh, uh, naming conventions are really important. Uh, metadata is really, really important for data, any data science project and these fall under standards. There's, um, I mean, there's work being done uh, about creating data standards for, for heritage science, which is really fantastic. Uh, and then there's training and community. So having networks and uh, ability to talk to people about some of the challenges is a really good thing. And uh, uh, like uh, tr uh, training programs. So there's plenty of training programs online and UCL offer very good training tools. <laughs> I was very happy with it. Um, and then uh, the other challenges are awareness and culture. So are people aware that they can use data science in their own projects? So data science is slightly different from um, creating a, for example, creating an online digital tool. It's, it's a more interactive process and it definitely requires a, a broader range of experts and um, people to be involved. And then and that's it. Thank you, Scott. Oh, thanks so much, Bav. Um, I just have a few. Oh, sorry. Continue. Sorry, I'll, I'll just put the links in the chat to um, the project and the Concave website. Please do feel free to sign up. <laughs> That's great. Thanks so much. Uh, maybe just as a few final comments, uh, although Bav has already said such fan fantastic things. <clears throat> I think it really is thinking about how we consider measurements and and different kinds of, of data collection campaigns and data sources, but really looking towards um, being inspired by how we can work together and think differently. And even in the, in the project that Bav talked about, the challenge of working in an existing pipeline um, <clears throat> is not just something that has to do with the fact that different people were involved and there were different tools, but simply that existing tools are sometimes not adequate for the scale of analysis that we now expect. Um, so maybe uh, as a final word, just to think about um, how the fourth paradigm or exploratory science fits into the kind of work that you currently do. Uh, whether or not you didn't consider that to be the part of that, but it is something you're already considering and, and doing, or if there's opportunities for it. And I think one final word here about the relationship between measurements and data science is that I think it can act as um, <clears throat> data science will not replace measurement. And I think that's very clear. Um, the way that I thought about this was that uh, data science is almost like a bridge through which we can achieve holism through determinism, but equally we can achieve determinism through holism. And we need both to fully understand the world around us. Uh, we need to work together and focus on a change in culture, uh, not just developing another tool or another platform or another process. Um, and you know, in terms of the question of when is it time to use data science, uh, I think the answer is when it makes sense. And that's the question that we don't yet have a good answer to. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot to both of you guys for this very interesting and again, very inspiring presentation. I have uh, a couple of questions for both of you, but first of all, I mean, I will, the public, I mean, is giving some comments and a couple of questions. The first one is uh, from uh, Lucia Tonioro. Thank you so much uh, to your, for your presentation. Just a comment, despite its artisanal character, heritage science is producing a big amount of data sets. The forthcoming uh, e -res research infrastructure will be caring, will be taking care of these aspects. This was an, an, an excellent point. Yes, I should have mentioned e as an example, uh, as, as a group that's doing fantastic work in this regard. Lucia, we cannot hear you. Uh, just activate. Uh, I sent you the request for activating. Yeah, here. Uh, it, it was just a comment to add uh, and for the attendees, I think that it is important to understand that uh, at the European uh, level, uh, this aspect uh, becomes more and more uh, important than we are in, in heritage science. We are going to be aware of the importance of uh, um, the, the governing of data sets uh, also in this uh, uh, domain. And so, um, I think that the uh, Iris could do it's a very hours. good job in that respect. Uh, I, I don't know if you if you agree, and uh, the DigiLab platform uh, is growing in this 
mm -hmm. months in this uh, um, in the forthcoming period and uh, would be uh, really <coughs> a great opportunity for all those who uh, do research in this field. I, I absolutely agree. Bab, did you want to say something? Absolutely agree. I, I think some of the challenge was uh, as a as a coder, as, uh, taking off my background in heritage science, uh, as a coder, there was issues with naming conventions and standardization format. There's some really good work with uh, the linked data as well, Lignus project. So this this is a known issue and is being addressed at all levels. So it's very it's very good, very positive to hear. <laughs> I think one thing that that Bav um, mentioned that I'd like to highlight here is the need not just to think about um, the kind of users of, of platforms like this to be heritage scientists or academics, uh, but to realize that one of the things that does make us you know, quite a challenging field in terms of this is that everyone needs to be brought along with it. And so even if you will never consider or call yourself a data scientist, uh, being able to speak a language that is somehow mutually understood uh, and to have the technical skills to understand at least what is being done. I think that's something that we really need to think about uh, as, as uh, people working in the heritage sector. That's actually a very interesting aspect, um, uh, Scott, that you raised and also I mean, uh, Bavish during uh, is part of the presentation about uh, the training, uh, I mean, of people at a wider level, I mean, to data science. And uh, in this respect, I appreciate, for example, uh, the the different uh, the it was per, I mean before the pandemic it was uh, really periodic uh, the these courses uh, from uh, data carpentry at the University of Oslo that uh, they were able I mean to let's say bring I mean other scientists scientists from other fields I mean to the same page when we are talking about the uh, heritage science to the same um, at least I mean speaking I mean a little bit of a common language. There is another question from Austin Nevin. Uh, how, are you, how are you using the SIDOC framework useful for your research? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I'm going to begin my response by saying that I um, probably do not use it enough. Uh, I am aware of what the SIDOC framework is. Uh, my understanding of it is that it's most appropriate for uh, things like identifying entities and relationships between them. Uh, so in that way, it's a framework which is primarily useful for um, drawing on uh, metadata of perhaps museum uh, collections uh, and things like that and understanding relationships between them. Uh, the way that I personally in my research use data science is primarily in a quantitative manner uh, looking at things like environmental data and uh, climate projections and other large data sets like this. Uh, but Bav, I don't know if you if you have an interface between these two worlds to discuss. Um. Again, similar. So I'm looking at large data sets, mostly from physical world, but now a key part of my work is relating that back to collections, as in there are these risks that have been identified. How do we immediately highlight that with the objects directly? You know, so um, uh, an, in, an interface between the between the two, like like I was talking about metadata, is is the exact is is where the work is at the moment. Mm -hmm. Creating these metadata files and mm -hmm. establishing yeah. these connections. Austin is commenting that uh, uh, Sidoc Sidoc uh, is object site focused and not that focused. Yes, I, I think this, this is what I was trying to, to get toward is that actually I think these two worlds, the people who are very good at dealing with quantitative data and, and lots of the data generated by science need to, uh, I think, actually talk more to the people who are good at object and site focused things and people who are, are good at developing those entity object relationships. Um, I think there's there's probably some missing gaps. I don't know if Iris is doing any work on this in DigiLab or maybe uh, I don't want to put Lucia on the spot. Um, if there's any attempt to try and bring these two worlds together there. Would you, not. Uh, you would like to, would you like to comment on that? No. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. Okay. But, but I think these are two fundamentally different skill sets in some ways. And, you know, the people that I know who are very good at working with CDOC, for example, 
are, are very much the people who are interested on, in ontologies and semantics and those kinds of databases. Uh, and in my head, there's very few people who are in both of those um, or have both of those skill sets or are currently working in both those areas. So it's definitely something to think about how we can try to bring them closer together. Thank you very much again, guys, uh, for your uh, uh, for your talk. Uh, and uh, we need to proceed um, to the next speaker. This will be I mean, probably I mean, a part of the discussion this afternoon. But uh, we thank again I mean, uh, our speakers. And we go on um, with uh, Noel Streeton. We could not I mean, uh, do I mean, uh, uh, a workshop on conservation uh, science without having I mean, uh, the voice of a conservator, actually. I mean, uh, it should have been I mean, a little bit more expanded, I and mean, the voices of the conservators. Noel, apart from being a dear friend, is a, a professor of conservation at the Department of Archaeology, Conservation and History at the University of Oslo. Noel holds a PhD and a master in conservation from UCL and a bachelor in history of art, cultural history from the University of Chicago. A teaching and research span topics related to the workshop practices of late medieval painter and sculptures, in Northern Europe, theory and ethics of conservation, and the politics of cultural heritage. Between 2014 and 2018, Noel has been a PI and co-leader with um, Professor Tina Proisaka for the project After the Black Death, the painting, painting and polychrome sculpture in Norway. The project was funded uh, by the Research Council of Norway. Her current work centers on post-reformation transformations of uh, medieval polychromy and uh, medieval objects at risk. And Noel will give a presentation uh, about from data to history. How do you get from one to the other? So it's the ideal continuation of the talk given by Scott and Bav. Thanks very much, Noel. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Francesco, for, for that lovely introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Share. Yes. Uh, all good. Yes. No, actually, we're not. It's it's not full. There we go. Perfect. We go. Thank you. Um, perfect. Great. Uh, as Francesco said, uh, this is actually a continuation of sorts uh, uh, from what uh, Scott and uh, um, Babish talked about. Um, I'd like to first uh, thank Luigi, to Maite and Francesco for, for the invitation. Um, they've asked me to, as Francesco said, to address uh, how we get from, from data to, to narrative. And that is, uh, I guess, in the way that I wish to talk about it, is uh, descriptions of the original object and the socio-political circumstances uh, of its transformations uh, over time. Um, this, for, for a conservator, might seem obvious um, how we get from uh, data to a sort of history for an object, or, or it could be that uh, scientists, uh, scientists that uh, are attending this talk uh, simply don't count this uh, kind of interpretive exercise within their, their remit. However, I found that interpretation of data for developing historical narratives can be quite problematic uh, for conservators, and this is not least because it requires a different uh, set of analytical tools. Uh, even a different analytical toolbox, and perhaps this can, is connected to what uh, Scott and um, Babish were, were talking about within their developmental framework. Uh, I think that this is important because we are instructed from a very early stage in conservation training uh, that our methods should mimic a scientific method. Uh, and in some instances they do, uh, yet we are also expected to describe objects, their original settings, their original uses, uh, their uses over time or the reasons for being discarded, uh, the, who owned them, how they were destroyed, how they've survived, etc, etc, etc. And these are cultural and social situations and they matter. Uh, they also have no place in scientific method, uh, quite far from it. Um, so in my own work, this is a topic that I started to think about quite a long time ago. Uh, for, for me, within my PhD research, I found this quite a struggle. Uh, and there not, this is because there was no methodological model that I could find that I liked. Uh, and uh, to, there was no model that I can turn to within a field that is now commonly referred to as technical art history. 
and after I arrived in Oslo, I, I was still thinking about this. So I started talking to colleagues, uh, started to ask a lot of questions and, and started to write. I wrote an article that was eventually published in Studies and Conservation, and uh, uh, for me, this has become a model uh, that I've used in my project work, and you could be forgiven for, for thinking that this is uh, strictly about medieval research, and it's, uh, so it's not relevant to you. Um, but bear with me. Uh, I hope that you might uh, find something relevant in it uh, in your everyday. Uh, and today I've agreed to talk about conceptual tools uh, that uh, conservators need in order to dig deep beyond the analytical data uh, when those data become a foundation for historical narratives and particularly those that address transformations. So really this is relevant to any old object uh, or building that has cultural value now. So today my lecture is going to be about basic concepts and models. Um, that's where I'll start. And then I will talk uh, about the material beyond the data or and the uh, material and beyond, uh, as well as material culture. And for that, um, if I were to give a definition of material cultural studies, I think the one that is offered by Ian Hodder, who is at Stanford, um, I don't think he's retired yet. Uh, and for, for our purposes here, I think that this one is, is most suitable. He defined research in material culture studies as that which explores man-made objects, structures, or landscapes uh, with the aim to understand their cultural context uh, to discover the belief system uh, of, the, of the producers of that object and to clarify the communities or the, the societies that have, ch that have changed with the material culture over time. So, to, if I were to start someplace, I just need to move around my screen a little bit. Um, I show this model here. This was a model that was uh, presented by Jane Henderson in 2010. Uh, and this is a scientific, scientific method for, for conservation, uh, which begins with uh, the investigation of a source of the problem, uh, analysis of that uh, object and the problem, uh, interpreting the data, and then synthesizing it. And in this way, this, in this includes treatment. Um, but I just want for you to, to note uh, that this model does not include a path for coping with uh, cultural relativities, uh, and historical and contextual evidence. Uh, and while I, uh, I find this, this model that, uh, that Jane Henderson presented were very useful in, in many respects, it doesn't, it didn't help me uh, to look beyond that and actually to, to, to structure uh, arguments beyond scientific method. Uh, and for me, am I not going further? There. And for, for me, to, uh, this uh, just pointed out, uh, it, it clarified that the, the natural sciences only offer partial solutions uh, for, to, for conservators wishing uh, to describe the historical paths that their objects have taken. Uh, and I find that this particular um, example is kind of like a potato. Uh, it's, it's been good for, for, for many, many things. Uh, and it's a, a photograph. Uh, it's, uh, this is a, a painting uh, that I studied with my PhD supervisor, Libby Sheldon, when, when I was in London. And it's a painting of Lot and his daughters. It belongs to a private collection uh, in the UK. And uh, Libby commissioned a, to, uh, an X-ray. Uh, of this painting, and it showed, uh, you can see the two films here, this is old-fashioned x-ray, uh, and uh, it showed a very strange image uh, underneath the, the, the painting that is on the surface. And we looked at that, and it took a while for us to figure out what on earth it was. And this was a student project, so I thought this was a very good teaching uh, image. Um, and looking at it, Turning it upside down, it's quite clear that this is a, a basket of, or a, um, this is a, a fruit bowl. Uh, and the question uh, here is, uh, will lots of analytical data tell us why uh, this image was painted over? Why 
the image was different at first? And I think the, the, the answer to that question is obvious. No. No, lots of analytical data is not going to tell us why. Uh, there are lots of historical reasons that we need to look at in order to understand that why. Uh, and I saw another example last week that I thought was relevant here. Uh, uh, that, and this was uh, an article that, uh, that went uh, viral. It was uh, published worldwide uh, on many different platforms. And uh, the topic was uh, dozens of children were mummified in, the Italian in an Italian catacomb. Scientists want to know why. Uh, and my question immediately was, will lots of analytical data tell us why? Uh, and uh, to the, the foundation for, for this study, I won't go into this uh, now because it's not really relevant. And they're, they're using X-ray uh, instrumentation in order to, to, to X-ray to mummified remains of, of individuals, children, uh, 14 times in order to, to indicate uh, why they died. That's not going to tell us why they were mummified. Actually, there were em emotional reasons why. And actually, there are historical documentary sources that will tell us why, but the data is not going to tell us that. So to, I guess just to, to introduce my, my points, I thought that was a good start. Uh, this uh, article that I showed to you at the beginning uh, that was published in 2016 uh, online and then 2017 uh, in paper form, in, in studies and this model showed how scientific data is created through um, an open-ended inquiry, uh, but then the historical process that uh, proceeds thereafter is a, a rather closed inquiry. I mean, this, uh, this requires a premise and then you draw on the, only the data that you need in order to, to answer those questions. And looking at, uh, I don't expect for you to read this, uh, this page because it's really a little bit too much information. Um, so I've simplified this model in order to uh, to show uh, what I mean. Uh, so you begin with uh, data generation and interpretation, um, an open-ended inquiry, uh, but then the historical process begins thereafter. And in order to to look at this more to, um, more carefully, uh, to, I, I guess uh, more logically. Uh, to the to inductive process is comprehensive uh, and you cannot cherry pick the data. And this is what uh, many conservators don't necessarily understand at first. Uh, certainly most art historians wouldn't understand this process necessarily unless they've had uh, um, research methods, uh, a course on research methods that, that uh, introduces them to the full spectrum. Uh, of research methods, and as Scott and Babish were pointing out, this usually isn't the case. Uh, but then the historical process that starts thereafter is more deductive, well, it is deductive, uh, and selective. And the arguments and observations that, uh, that are required to prove a premise don't require all of the data. You can cherry pick that data. Uh, so to, I think that Maita presented a very nice uh, uh, example of this uh, earlier. If we're looking at the, the paintings from Pompeii. Uh, she asked which ions are leached from uh, uh, pyroclasts. Or to what uh, we could ask too, what data can we collect from re remaining fragments of, paint of paintings that have now deter deteriorated quite a lot? And uh, to, if you were to look at the selective approach to this, my approach and historical approach, uh, to looking at those paintings from Pompeii, I would rather ask how much material has been lost since 1905. So Maita showed an image of a painting that in 1905 that uh, was quite a bit uh, less fragmented than it is now. Uh, and what uh, factors, whether they be um, environmental or social, have contributed to this. Uh, so to, that was just an example to kind of connect uh, what I'm talking about to, to uh, earlier. Uh, lectures, uh, but if I'm to, to think about some examples to, to kind of help those who are listening to this talk through this process, uh, I think that Erica Hados has uh, introduced a, a topic to me uh, that I thought was quite relevant, and this is about Ötzi, the, the Iceman. Uh, if you're looking at evidence for, for Ötzi, uh, we know that this is a glacial preserved human skin and bone. And the C14 for date for this is roughly to 2,560 uh, years before Christ or to before the Common Era. 
Um, and uh, there, there are, I'm sure, lots of questions that could be asked about this material that is uh, that are human remains. Uh, but my question is usually, well, what now? Uh, to what extent to do cultural heritage laws protect human remains? What are the re recommended parameters for display of certain such human remains? I think this, these are really quite important questions for what to do. What happens to Atsi now that uh, that uh, Atsi has been unearthed? If we're to ask uh, to other questions about uh, evidence from, uh, for example, Sint Ulof, Sint Ulof, who is uh, this is a, a reasonably small sculpture. Polychrome sculpture the, from uh, the, the dendro date is after 1489. Um, this uh, sculpture comes from a church in, in Shavoy in the, the north of Norway. And the evidence, uh, there's quite a lot of um, physical evidence uh, for to this object already, uh, for the internal structures uh, via X-ray, for the polychromy, whether it be the paint, the, the, the gold, the ground layers, uh, the oak. Um, wood, uh, the age, um, and uh, original materials uh, overall for to, not just for the sculpture, but for the the object from which uh, to to which it belongs. Um, but then, if we're to look at this uh, evidence to to help us describe um, this context, its context, um, what was its original original appearance? What was it like? Uh, it certainly didn't look like this uh, to the way that it does now in, in the, to roughly 1490 when it was um, originally made. Uh, what were the circumstances that determined the ways in which it's changed? What kinds of damages does it have now? Uh, has it been repaired, overpainted? Um, what kind of changing values have, uh, are attached to it over time. And this is quite important because this object was made before the Reformation and then the Reformation after 1536 has changed opinions about this kind of object quite a lot. Um, and uh, what has happened to it since it was reactivated of sorts within a museum? These are the kinds of questions uh, that the, the data cannot um, they help us to answer these questions for sure, but there's a, the, we need another framework in order to answer those questions. Uh, in addition, for for Edvard Munch's uh, The Sun, uh, similarly, we have a lot of information about uh, its structure, its original materials, whether it be the the, the canvas um, uh, support, uh, pigments, the binders. It has some sand in it, some horsehair, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, I think, uh, to, et cetera. What, how has it been damaged in the, the, the much shorter time since it was made, uh, as opposed to St. Olaf, uh, that is? What is its current appearance? Uh, how is it, uh, how uh, does soiling af affect that uh, current appearance and what cleaning methods might uh, be applied to it? Uh, and this is something that has been studied quite recently via mock-ups. Um, but then, how does this kind of evidence uh, that is gathered uh, and is uh, essential uh, for answering the sorts of questions that can to describe and discuss the original color, the repairs, uh, why it was repaired, who repaired it, uh, the overpaints, uh, previous cleaning, and previous structural treatments. So, uh, if we're look, uh, going to look at heritage science and conservation and beyond. Uh, to look at the data generation um, side of things, heritage science scientists and conservators evaluate uh, the physical properties, the chemistries, the tensions within objects to establish what an object is and isn't. Uh, but that physical, uh, the, the physical, the environmental, the social political circumstances continually change. And because they continually continually change, they redefine meaning. So my question was, before writing that article, what then? Uh, and uh, in thinking about this, I think it's quite helpful to think about material culture. Material culture is not just the material. It's actually that relationship between the material and people. 
Uh, so in thinking about uh, that uh, kind of relationship in these changing circumstances, uh, I think maybe thinking about something that is quite near and dear to many of us right now, the fact that we can't fly uh, to, or shouldn't uh, fly very often, and we have to take precautions when flying. And this has changed quite a lot uh, from the, the carefree days of uh, flight in the 1950s uh, through uh, Greta Thunberg and her, uh, uh, and her quite... Um, uh, correct uh, correction uh, of the, the ways in which we should uh, care about flight, but also the sorts of precautions that we must take when flying now. And it's uh, it's uh, this changing um, dynamic. Uh, to, obviously, an object is not important here necessarily, but I'm, uh, my point was this changing dynamic. So if we're to think about this changing dynamic um, and the, the meaning between material based on data and people, we should be thinking about uh, this relationship between changing physical form and uh, the socio-political, uh, social-cultural uh, situations. That is material culture. And uh, uh, it, there's also a field called critical heritage that uh, looks at, uh, that adds power into this. So shifting relationships between people, objects and power. Um, and, uh, I guess that the thing that concerned me at, when looking at uh, the, the, the theoretical models for conservation, uh, that it was this robust critical approach uh, to, um, to this way of looking at, uh, at material culture uh, that was kind of missing uh, from, from uh, debates and discussions in conservation. Uh, so I guess that was the foundation for, for moving in this direction. And uh, this uh, robust, Critical approach is something that's been used by archaeologists, archaeologists and anthropologists for quite some time. So this really is not new. But if we're to look at, I mean, all of these things that, that come into this discussion, and they are issues of age, uh, and they are also issues that are intangible. So we might be looking at surface qualities, damages, uh, repairs, dirt. Uh, degradation products uh, um, and whatever the, the to how you might characterize them, but then if we're to look at uh, intangible associations, and this really is this uh, this can be lots of things. It can be ways of doing things, um, age value, art value. Uh, to, obviously, these debates are not new. Uh, historical value, pastness, uh, patina, cultural value, memory. Um, and so these are things that uh, conservators learn to be aware of. Um, but there was really no place to place them in, uh, in, especially in academic work. So I guess one way of thinking about these intangible values was to, to think about the fact that freaks uh, were, were introduced to the UNESCO list in 2017, this way of doing things. Obviously, preserving fruits as in, of, in and of themselves is probably not something that's important. You want to eat them, uh, but it's the way of making them that is important. Not sure how I'm doing for time here. Um, I've, I've got very little left, but uh, I guess to, to begin to wrap up. Hmm? You have some, Noel. Go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, I'm almost done. Uh, in terms of uh, to, to, to try and wrap this up, I guess maybe to, for, for my purposes, uh, I think the, the idea of viewer experience is, is quite important. Uh, so for, for to exhibition work that I've been involved in and for, for research that I hold near and dear, um, this idea of um, what a medieval parishioner uh, would have seen and experienced um, might not be immediately apparent today and actually how do you translate this uh, this um mm, this experience how do you d explain this experience uh, to someone who who might not be uh intimately um involved in, in medieval research, which actually is the majority of people. Uh, so in, in order to, to, to think about this, uh, I started to, to wonder, well, what did they see? 
uh, to what might they have seen, the original appearance, the surface effects, and the original devotional context. Actually, these are to the, the appearance and the original surface effects are to exactly what data can tell us, what a cross section can help us to see. Uh, what uh, research that Elena Platonia, for example, has uh, she spearheaded on on what green colors uh, looked at, how um, metal soaps have developed over time, uh, but uh, what uh, the original material might have looked at, like uh, might have uh, have been, what it was composed of, but then that original devotional context, we need to add a layer of historical uh, inquiry. Uh, but then what we see, we see damages. We see uh, that the eyes have been uh, gouged out. We see uh, that the, the, the gilding is very damaged and we see ground layers. Um, how has this object been restored, repaired and altered? Actually, this one perhaps very little by comparison to some others. But then what sort of filters uh, do we see uh, this object through? Might we see those, those damages? Perhaps some don't see them immediately because you're used to seeing a damaged object that is old. Um, most uh, people who are looking at this, uh, this object knows uh, that uh, St. Ulov was a, a very famous um, actual figure and uh, has, is a national icon. So you look at it through a national narrative. What does a museum context do uh, to looking at this object? And what sort of culturally influenced perspectives do we bring to the table? We all bring them. So in order to finish up, I guess, looking at the, the question holism or determinism, I guess for me, it, uh, I'd see um, my role more through the, the role of holism. So to study cultural objects, cultural heritage objects with several techniques and approaches, these are necessary to, to gain a complete uh, viewer understanding of a system. And my to toolbox is rather different uh, than the scientist for sure, but uh, it's an approach nonetheless. Um, and I think that's uh, that's a good place to leave it. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much for your really nice presentation. It's, uh, I mean, your work is something that I, I had the chance I mean, to, to experience while I was in Oslo. And when I read your paper, I mean, it was uh, for me it was like a little bit of an illumination. I'm thinking, Eureka! I mean, there is something. Uh, there is there is not only these aspects when we are talking about uh, cultural heritage, cultural heritage objects, and the fact that you are mentioning uh, this approach, uh, which is uh, consolidated for uh, uh, archaeologists and anthropologists, actually is not uh, probably for art scientists, for chemists, uh, for physicists working in the field. So it would be mm -hmm. extremely nice from you if you could uh, link here in the chat, I mean, the link uh, for your, to your paper so that the readers, I mean, can, um, can, can, uh, can profit, I mean, from, uh, from your, uh, from your work. Are there uh, questions or comments about uh, Noel's, uh, Noel's presentation? Can I just say I'll do, I'll do send the link after to we're done so that I'm not distracted. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, okay, uh, we have here a question uh, from uh, uh, it was uh, Remisha Puli was saying actually the same uh, the same thing. I mean about the paper. There is a question by Austin Nevin, uh, and he is asking about our holistic conservator viewer experience. Uh, against the public perceptions or the deterministic perception. The National Trust in the UK has demonstrated how little many people care about dirt, yet we as conservators have a different attitude to cleaning. Our training really impacts our reading and understanding of our heritage. How do you feel education can play a role in public perception? That's an excellent question, not so easy. I mean, to give an immediate answer, I mean. You're right. It's not so easy to give an, an immediate answer, but actually I think that my own experiences of setting up um, not just an exhibition, but actually trying to translate uh, what I see uh, to, to, in a damaged object or a dirty object uh, to some sort of a, a museum script has been really helpful. Uh, and usually I will add, when developing such scripts, 
but uh, I usually ask someone who has a completely different perspective. Uh, perspective. Uh, for example, my son, uh, to someone who to, um, doesn't always join uh, to, in my enthusiasm for old stuff. Uh, so I will usually ask him what he sees. Uh, and I, th I find that that's really useful. And in addition, this is additionally useful because uh, I've understood uh, recently that one of the, the, the main uh, audiences for, to, or I guess the gauges for audience um, where to pitch something is someone who is 12. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I found that quite surprising, uh, actually. To, that might not be the, the National Trust's uh, threshold, I don't know, but it might make sense to find out what their threshold is uh, in order to, to, to figure out where to pitch uh, your information. Um, but uh, just to try to write short, te uh, short texts uh, for the, the non-specialist, I find to be extraordinarily helpful. Uh, because it does make you really think through uh, what is most important and the, the main points. I don't know if that really answers the question, um, but uh, uh, in terms of cleaning, um, most will not uh, be um, terribly uh, informed about what the priorities for cleaning are. And actually, to, we only need to look at ArtWatch, what gets published on the ArtWatch pages. Michael Daly, sorry to criticize, but he is not kept up. Uh, and if the, the, if Artwatch would would keep up with the debates, I think that it would be much easier for conservators to respond to those debates. Um, for example, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, looking at uh, the, the I guess maybe the range of criticisms uh, in terms of what Artwatch criticizes. Uh, but equally um, looking, uh, th thinking through what uh, the National Trust or, or to other threshold uh, groups uh, are is uh, could be the best place to start. Thanks very much, Noella, for your answer and uh, for your presentation. Uh, really, really appreciated. Really, really nice. Thanks a lot. So, I mean, uh, the speakers will be uh, also. Uh, <laughs> Thanks a lot again. Uh, the speakers I mean, uh, uh, compatible with their schedule will be available also in the afternoon. I mean, to talk about some I mean, of the uh, available also for questions and uh, to refer to the uh, round table. Now we move uh, to the last presentation of the morning from uh, Gabriele Favero. The accent is correct, Gabriele. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Gabriele Favero is a full professor of chemistry of the environment and cultural heritage at the Department of Environmental Bi Biology of uh, Sapienza University of Rome, where is also head of the didactic board uh, in science and technologies for the conservation of cultural heritage. His research activity involves the study, development, and application of sensors and biosensors, tackling the different aspects concerning the use of redox mediators, the development of second and third generation electrochemical biosensors, innovative enzymatic uh, uh, immobilization techniques, and the function functionalization of electrode surfaces. Besides, it also deals with the applied science for the conservation and restoration of cultural heritage, with particular attention to the development and application of electrochemical techniques for archaeometry and the innovative methods for cleaning artistic surfaces based on soft matters and phytochemical compounds. And uh, Gabriele will give uh, a presentation about the correlation between the microdestructive and non-destructive measurements uh, uh, for cultural heritage. Thanks very much, uh, Gabriele, for joining us today. And uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco, for your presentation, and I also wish to thank very much the organizers for inviting me, and in particular, Professor Luigi Campanelli. In uh, the presentation, I would like to uh, try to give an overview about the correlation between the microdestructive and non-destructive measurements in the case of cultural heritage. Uh, thus, defining the analytical approaches applied in the field and trying also to give a definition when a method can be defined as micro or macro destructive. And uh, then we'll present some case studies uh, in order to underline how the development of analytical techniques is, uh, in my opinion, blurring the boundary between a micro and non destructive sampling. 
And then finally, I will present some personal conclusion, hoping that they, they can lead to the, uh, or contribute to the general discussion in this afternoon. Um, the analytical uh, uh, approach uh, in archaeometry and conservation uh, starts is dated back in 18th century, but currently the scientific disciplines are playing an essential role in the characterization of materials of artworks, and uh, thus providing uh, a lot of data uh, that can be grouped uh, in morphological, physical, chemical, or biological aspects. To this end, uh, the premise uh, establishing that uh, each cultural uh, artwork is unique and is irreplaceable, um, stating that uh, as a consequence, it must be preserved as intact as possible. And this obviously restricts the conditions for applying analytical procedures and sampling in particular. Uh, the size of sample, in fact, is restricted in the field of uh, in this field of research and um, obviously analytical techniques that uh, does not require sampling are preferred in art conservation but unfortunately they do not always provide the sufficient information on the composition of the object therefore sampling must be carried out in this respect the two basic requirements must be met the sensitivity uh, because uh, uh, we have uh, uh, available a small sample, and sometimes uh, also at the micro or nano level. And uh, the second one is specificity. In order to identify without uh, uh, any doubt the compounds and quantify the analyze from the complex mixtures that constitutes usually the cultural heritage. In uh, 1991, Lahanier, Find, uh, uh, define the metals and classify the metals applied to cultural heritage into three categories. Those uh, that are uh, examination based on recording images uh, that he called the holistic approach. Uh, the analytical methods uh, that uh, he considered the, the reductionist approach and uh, uh, on the other side, the dating methods. The characterization of object based on the holistic approach is often combined with point analysis. So uh, we must take always into account uh, the analytical methods and the possibility of, uh, of sampling. In the past, the perception of the minimum amount of material that it was reasonable to sacrifice to obtain some information from an artifact was very different from today. Uh, a probably even obvious uh, example is the dating of the Shroud of Turing that has been carried out in 1988. In that case, a portion of fabric of about 10 per 17 millimeters was taken from the cloth. Uh, this is a quantity that uh, would probably make us horrified today, also in relation to the possible answers uh, that uh, at that time it was open to obtain. But without venturing uh, into the uh, several implications, discussions, uh, and also controversies that have not yet subsided after almost uh, 35 years, uh, I just uh, want uh, uh, simply to consider this case only a paradigmatic example of the problems connected with the need to sample a unique artifact in order to obtain information on its nature or on its, uh, its origin. And um, we should consider that we are not talking about uh, the prehistory. 1998 is uh, 25 years after the publication of uh, Chester Brandes uh, theory of restoration. And therefore, that was a moment in which uh, in the collective consciousness of the conservator, it was already clear that uh, respect for the constituent matter uh, of the find, which is now uh, further consolidated. Basically, today, uh, probably a withdrawal of that size uh, of an object uh, of such importance and also tradition uh, would probably be, be impossible, uh, not only for uh, the, not, not particularly for a reduced desire of knowledge, but uh, mainly thanks uh, to the progressive evolution of the techniques that uh, we have witnessed in the recent decades. 
Today we know that it's possible to obtain uh, reliable dating for fines uh, uh, using only a few milligrams of, of the material. Uh, therefore, uh, it, the question is uh, what is really micro and what it can be considered macro that uh, defines the boundaries between the destructive, micro destructive, and non destructive methods. And uh, in this respect, when discussing uh, what is uh, micro and what is macro, it is uh, necessary to refer to the evolution of the technique. Uh, in sampling, it is probably necessary to disregard this kind of definition and rather take into account the requirements of the experimental methods, uh, which are nevertheless fluid. I mean that uh, uh, they change with time according to the improving of the technological progress. After all, uh, we often speak of microanalysis, uh, while the term micro according to the definition of the international system has a precise meaning, that is 10 to minus 6. Uh, on the contrary, uh, in, the, in reality, the term micro is often used or uh, is often understood more as an adjective uh, rather than a precise scientific indication of how much uh, sample uh, to take from an artifact. Uh, obviously, the ideal condition would be not sampling at all. However, a, a large part of techniques uh, still require taking a portion of the sample, even if minimal. So the standardization of the concept of microdestructive analysis may not make sense since the technological evolution could quickly overcome those limits and reduce the amount of material that is required for the analysis. In this respect, I would like to present some examples on how the development of analytical techniques is blurring this boundary between microdestructive and non-destructive. The first one is uh, uh, microfedometry. Uh, this work is a result of a, an internship research at the British Museum aimed at setting the lightning criteria for the display of two objects in a new gallery. The two objects are uh, two paintings belonging to the Mughal Indian era. And uh, the aim of the work is to set the lightning in the gallery museum uh, in order to uh, decide whether or not to display those uh, paintings uh, to the public. Uh, the first one is uh, a painting where the prophet Elias rescues Nurudar from the sea, and the other one is uh, Janjir wedding the prince Kuram. And they are two paintings uh, full of colors uh, belonging to the Mughal area, that means uh, the 16th century. And uh, in order to decide for uh, the exhibition of these uh, two paintings, uh, a light fastness measurement uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is taken into account. Until uh, uh, a decade ago, the light fastness measurements were invasive and destructive. And uh, in this case, uh, this uh, type of analysis has been carried out using microfedometry. Microfedometry is a technique developed by Paul Whitmore in 1996, now uh, fully developed and also uh, applied at uh, the British Museum. It is important uh, because uh, um, microfedometry is uh, practically an accelerated aging method. Uh, 10 minutes of test are equivalent to 5 to 10 years display under normal lighting. But uh, this aging method involves uh, exposing a very small area. The faded test area is a tiny spot of more or less uh, uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 millimeter. And uh, thus exposing this small area to intense light for a short amount of time, the color change is recorded and then is compared with a reference, uh, with a reference made by test or global scale. And uh, in this case, uh, the test uh, show, show that uh, one painting has pigments which are slightly uh, light sensitive. But in spite of those results, uh, it was put on display. And uh, the microfedometry uh, results helped to define the lightning condition, the exposure time, and also the duration of the exhibition. 
And on the other hand, the second painting analyzed contained different kinds of pigments. Some of them were highly light sensitive, and this does not allow display, and therefore it remained preserved in the deposits. From this example, it can be uh, deduced how a technique that uh, starts uh, as necessarily destructive, uh, just think about the definition of light fastness, has changed to practically non-destructive when the evolution of technique has made it possible to drastically, dramatically reduce the portion of the sample that it is necessary to sacrifice for, for the analysis in order to obtain those crucial information about the opportunity to exhibit the paintings uh, and uh, if so, under what condition. Another case uh, in which the quantity of sample can be greatly reduced and making it possible to diagnostic of cultural heritage is voltammetry of microparticles. Uh, in this technique is based on solid state electrochemistry and uh, allows to obtain appreciable signal even with quantities of the order of milligrams or in some cases also nanograms of material uh, that are generally obtained simply uh, gently rubbing an electrode on the surface of the artwork. And uh, the, uh, the technique uh, has been established by Schultz in 1988, uh, in 1989, and then uh, has been, uh, during the last decades, uh, fully developed by Antonio Domenech Carbo. And thanks to um, collaboration with uh, University of Valencia, we have the opportunity to uh, test uh, several findings, several coins uh, coming from the Magna Mater uh, Temple in Rome and uh, without uh, practically any uh, damage or surface of coins. And the interpretation of data of, uh, uh, of uh, VPM uh, is not necessarily limited to identify uh, the potential or uh, the Faraday currents, but can be very sophisticated. And these allow to reduce the contribution of the interference uh, of the, all the materials uh, present in the real matrix. And uh, in particular, uh, this approach allows, for instance, uh, to compare and classify coins deriving from a specific archaeological field and uh, through the TAFL analysis uh, to distinguish among the samples uh, uh, that uh, have chlorides in the corrosion products and, and therefore are more subject to a subsequent worsening of uh, the conservation condition. And in the case of the magna mater samples, the um, data were also compared with, uh, uh, with data obtained with different techniques. All the studied bronze coins showed uh, a relative advanced state of corrosion, and um, in particular with uh, Raman has been detected uh, several different corrosion, uh, cop copper corrosion products, uh, such as cuprite, tinorite, and uh, malachite, and also uh, corrosions, uh, pro corrosion products of lead, uh, such as the uh, cherusite, uh, lead argent massacre, and, and so on. And uh, it is important to remember that uh, the electrochemical signals that you see in the right part of, the, uh, of this slide are obtained simply uh, from the materials that remain adherent to the electrode after, after gently rubbing it on the surface um, on the, of the coin. Uh, in practice, the sampling in this case is equivalent to gently uh, passing the lead of a pencil uh, that is a graphite bar on the surface of the work. And, uh, and then this, uh, uh, this graphite bar is used as a working electro in an electrochemical, chain, an electrochemical cell. Uh, on comparing the voltammograms of the coin, it is possible uh, uh, to um, to attribute uh, uh, different uh, uh, levels, different archaeological levels uh, to the different findings. And uh, also uh, the relationship between the cathodic signals 
can be used for a, a tentative of dating these findings according to a previously calibrated card. Aiming to complement the electrochemical results, a microscopic analysis uh, using uh, focused ion beam uh, scanning electron microscope has been carried out. And also this technique can be considered micro-invasive. Uh, here in this picture, you see trenches uh, digged inside, uh, the, um, inside the, the surface of the coin. Uh, these trenches are generated by a focused beam of gallium ions, but the dimension is really small, is uh, less than 10 micrometers which uh, uh, this dimension is not detectable at the microscopic level. So it is practically non-destructive. But uh, it is necessary to observe that in this case, it is also possible to obtain information not only on the outer patina, but also uh, on the layer that are below the surface. And uh, in, in this case, this nanometric sampling uh, allow also to investigate uh, the uh, inner parts of uh, a metallic, uh, a metal object. And I believe it can be agreed that the damage that can only be detected with an electron microscope and uh, redefines the, the concept of destructive, uh, of destructive sense. An example of uh, how the latest developments in research can lead to a definition of the concept of microsampling uh, concerns also the microstructure of dyes. Uh, the group of uh, chemistry applied to cultural heritage here in Sapienza has developed the sampling method, which while taking some traces uh, from the sample is uh, practically non-destructive. And this involved the use of a gel for the microstraction of dyes, and it has been successfully developed for extraction of dyes from textiles. And you, you may notice here that, um, uh, that in this case, the extraction of dyes uh, is uh, uh, practically non-destructive. Uh, in fact, uh, the uh, images obtained by uh, scanning electron microscope uh, put in evidence uh, that uh, in, in the case of uh, extraction using the gel, that are the images uh, B and C, there is practically no uh, disruption of uh, the structure of wool uh, with respect of uh, uh, before the extraction, that is the, uh, the image uh, indicated as A. And while uh, instruction uh, using the solvent, uh, that means without the, the microgel, uh, obviously disrupt the, the structure of uh, wool, and uh, in particular, uh, the cuticles of the fever are disrupted, are changing, and uh, in, in this case, uh, you have uh, the possibility to, to damage also uh, the textiles and uh, that uh, these damages can be uh, observable even at the microscopic level. So I've been assured that, that the procedure works. They move to apply uh, to other contexts, such as the application to polychrome, uh, to polychrome paintings. And uh, from uh, the preliminary tests that has been carried out, uh, it uh, has been demonstrated possible to identify the pictorial materials thanks to the microstruction, providing a quantity of samples sufficient for the identification by, by cells, and uh, also uh, after suitable concentration to perform also a complete characterization by HPLC, HRNS. And uh, as a last example, I would like to show an application recently appeared in literature for the analysis of organic residues uh, trapped in the porosity of uh, the ceramic uh, of uh, ceramic amphora. And uh, this is uh, based on uh, the CMS, 
CFTMS is a selected ion flow tube mass spectrometry. It's a form of direct mass spectrometry that analyzes uh, volatile organic compounds. And um, this technique has been developed uh, mainly for clinical studies, uh, for the quantification of metabolizing breath analysis. But uh, now uh, find also a field of application in cultural heritage. It relies on eight reagent agents uh, that can be selected, uh, thus creating uh, the condition uh, to uh, exhibit a different reaction mechanism and also mm -hmm. increase the selectivity and, uh, and sensitivity. And most of all, the chemical ionization that uh, is uh, obtained in the SIFT is uh, uh, softer uh, with respect to many other types of ionization, and uh, these result in reduced fragmentation. And uh, the Columbini group at Pisa University reported the results obtained identifying uh, the nature of organic residues collected from uh, ancient Egyptian findings. Uh, in particular, this is the uh, results obtained for embalming material. And then, after demonstrated the feasibility of this technique, comparing this data with those obtained with classical GCMS, they moved to the most surprising application, that is to evaluate the possibility of obtaining SIFT-MS spectra directly from the sample housed inside a custom-made sample chamber, that you see here in the left, in the right side. Of, the, uh, of this picture. Hence, they tested CFTMS directly on the waterproofing material that is uh, still present in the bottom of the amphora. And uh, in this case, they applied uh, this technique as a non-invasive and non-destructive technique. And, uh, okay, in, in conclusion, the last example uh, is uh, um, the, the further step, the, the final step. The previous one represented a progressive reduction of the invasiveness of the technique thanks to the continuous reduction of the quantity of the sample required. You may remember the, the time spot of microphotometry, the few grains of material of corrosion products in the voltammetry of microparticles, the focus diode beam that digs a trench that is visible only to a scanning electron microscope, and the microextraction with gel that does not even produce a visible effect to the sand. But uh, in the last case, we are facing with an even more extreme frontier of microsampling. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it is a technique capable of operating on the quantity of sample that the object in question releases uh, spontaneously without uh, the need of any abrasion or extraction procedure. So the resulting proposal could be provocative, but at least uh, one reflection deserves it. In particular, uh, distinguish between the knowledge finalized to the conservation that entails the sacrifice of sampling and uh, the knowledge finalized to itself. In the second case, we should consider to carry out only a few investigations today and wait for the other analysis, because it will arrive in the future with the smaller quantities than today, with smaller quantities required than today. In fact, the diagnostic of cultural heritage involves a particular and specific and sometimes opposite reflection compared to diagnostic in environmental food and clinical analysis. And uh, in this field in particular, um, the, we can uh, maybe that from this point of view, it might make not sense to take a portion of the artifact today, basing on the current technology, but to wait uh, 20, 30, or 50 more years in order to obtain the same answers of the same quantities. I would like to stress uh, this point at the end, the distinction between the needs of knowledge and the needs of conservation. In the first case, uh, uh, probably in some cases, uh, the needs of knowledge can be deferred. But uh, on the contrary, uh, the needs of conservation should be satisfied immediately. 
especially in the case of a diagnostic to support an imminent restoration or for monitoring the conservation condition. And uh, I believe that a, shop, a workshop like this can help to make uh, a decisive contribution to establish this point of balance. How much it makes sense to intervene now and uh, how much rather one can, should or put, uh, or can or should put a stop to the human beings desire to know, waiting to be able to satisfy the requesting condition of greater safety for the object under analysis. And I wish to acknowledge and to thank my co-worker, especially in particular way, Laura and, and Alessia, and also all of you for, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks so very much, Gabriele, for this very interesting um, uh, presentation. I have a couple of questions for you, but first of all, uh, there are some people, I mean, from um, uh, from the audience, I mean, that would like, uh, I mean, to intervene. The first one uh, is uh, from uh, actually one of the members of uh, uh, our scientific committee, Irka Aidas, who is uh, an expert of uh, uh, radiocarbon uh, dating for cultural heritage. Irka, can I activate your microphone? <coughs> yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Hi, Irka. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and thank you for this wonderful uh, workshop. And thank you for your presentation, Professor Favre. Um, I would like to uh, comment maybe uh, to the issue of Shroud of Turin since the ETH uh, laboratory has been involved. I wasn't, I wasn't there yet, but uh, our lab has been involved in dating of it. So I follow the issue quite closely for the last <laughs> whatever years, 30 more. And uh, I must say that uh, uh, indeed, uh, it is a uh, curious case. I would like to point out that um, back then we we could do the analysis with just a few milligrams of textile. And the whole thing of huge sampling has been um, um, created by the issue of uh, the whole uh, religious, political, uh, I would say, uh, um, uh, activities. So this is, I think, it's an excellent uh, example uh, connecting to to the presentation by Noel because it shows us how much the history of the object uh, how, how how important it is you know uh, I, I'm, I'm working with the historian uh, that uh, knows the history of the uh, shroud of Turin and we see how much the history has been ignored when the data came, uh, back from the radiocarbon labs. So I would like to really uh, uh, highlight this, that we want to work with historians. We want to work with our data and historians. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Irka, for your, for your comment, uh, for uh, uh, having pointed out this, this aspect. I, I simply cited the case of Charlotte Turing because it, it is uh, known to all of us and it is also particularly impressive for the amount of, of sampling. And my, uh, my aim was uh, simply to, to point out uh, the, the amount of, of sampling that has been carried out in 1988. But uh, nevertheless, you, you pointed out uh, uh, another particular aspect, that are also the implications uh, uh, of uh, religious or historical character. Uh, th that is the main topic of this. Uh, this workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriele. We have another question from uh, Daniela Reggio from the audience. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Professor uh, Favero, for your illustrative talk. Do you think scientists and cultural managers are ready to update uh, the standards uh, for the methodology of sampling from materials of cultural property? And she's referring to a CNEN norm. 1685 uh, uh, from 2012 and would you agree on a technique uh, on a technique by technique standard to determine to determine the amount of sample to be removed from the heritage objects 
Thank, thank you for this question. It's um, it's a very important uh, it's a very important point. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, the uh, scientist, cultural manager, or I would like to add also the um, the the conservation scientists may be are ready to update the standard for methodology and sample. But uh, I, I believe that it is time that uh, at least the uh, science conservators uh, uh, would think about this possibility. Because uh, um, I, I believe that uh, uh, having uh, rules for sampling is what we need now. Uh, because, uh, again, uh, if you can... Uh, delay the uh, necessity of sampling uh, is okay but in some cases uh, uh, due to uh, uh, conservation problems uh, or uh, uh, knowledge problems uh, uh, sampling is mandatory and uh, it, it is true that in in a lot of cases uh, the uh, the amount of uh, material that has been uh, sampled is uh, is very very small very uh, teeny, but um, this is not true for all the, all the techniques. So having a, a rule, having a guide, and also uh, try to find on uh, a, a European level at least uh, an agreement for uh, a methodology uh, of uh, of sampling. Uh, I think that it's time to to define something like this, and I agree. On a technique uh, by technique standard to determine the amount of sample loss. Thank you, Gabriele, for your answer. Uh, there is uh, uh, a comment I mean, from uh, Joanne Cassar from our um, uh, our roundtable I mean, from the afternoon that she is mentioning that uh, all the CN standards uh, regularly come up for, for revision. And that you, if you have concerns uh, uh, of something that you wish to be included, in the next revision, you should uh, talk with your. You should get in contact with your national mirror committee. I mean, for having uh, for having an update um, uh, for having an update about that. Uh, Daniela uh, Reggio is also commenting uh, that the regulation in Europe is quite vague about uh, about that. Uh, we proceed uh, in order. I have a, a question from Maite, a question uh, from uh, uh, from uh, uh, Remy Chapouli, and then another question uh, from Kidane Gebremariam. Maite, go ahead. Buongiorno, Gabriele. Thank you for your presentation. No, no. <laughs> I have one question related with uh, the micro fading. Okay, uh, I'm not very familiar with that. Uh, as far as I know. Uh, it was developed uh, from the very beginning to monitor color changes uh, in the reflectance, if I'm right in the visible range. So my question is, can you point out the advantages or disadvantages uh, comparing with the, let's say, with the conventional uh, force instrument in the visible near range? Because I'm not familiar with uh, micro fading, so I'm more, more familiar applying a uh, force in the bis near. So, can you comment something on that? Uh, yes, uh, the main difference is uh, that uh, micro fading is um, can be used as an accelerated middle of uh, of aging. So the the source light uh, use fading of the color. And uh, then uh, you measure the uh, the fading of the color, it does uh, uh, obviously altering the surface uh, because it's uh, practically a, a measure of, of light fastness. So um, it's not uh, uh, it, it it is in somewhat destructive. This is uh, the the problem. It, it's not a spectroscopic classical spectroscopic analysis. Uh, where you believe that the, uh, there is no alteration, uh, no, um, no variation of, of the materials that uh, are under analysis. But uh, uh, microfading is uh, um, enough intense uh, to uh, produce a damage on the surface. But the point is that uh, using these uh, 
fiber optic technology, uh, the, um, uh, the alteration of the surface is uh, uh, confined in a very tiny spot. So what uh, you uh, do uh, usually with the light fastness uh, can be done in uh, such a small surface, such a small point that is uh, practically invisible at the macroscopic level. Okay, thank you. Now I'm, uh, there is uh, René Chapoulier from uh, University of Bordeaux uh, that would like to come in uh, to uh, pose a question. Uh, Remy, I have just sent you the possibility to talk. Now? Yeah, uh, we can hear you, Remy. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I don't know why my camera is not on, but it doesn't really matter. Um, it's all right. Uh, thanks to all. Uh, I'll be short. Uh, a short comment, because after what everybody has said, and I would like to, to carry on with Anna. I make you a panelist, uh, Remy so that uh, you can activate also your camera again you can okay, also activate your camera Remy, if you if you desire so yeah i mean it's it's just to say hello to everyone yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially to maite which I, whom i know quite well so yeah. i'll make it thank Sorry. you Remy. to, to make oh, sure a, a comment on everything that i heard which is wonderful um i I am a physicist. I'm working in applied physics at Bordeaux and uh, dedicated to cultural heritage. And um, I, I wanted to, to say just a word about some um, tool, I would say, that we are developing in my laboratory. Uh, we are engaged, involved in two 3D technologies. And some of the engineers have released a uh, 3D data bank that is called Reference Information uh, System in 3D. It's more or less like what we call the uh, SIG systems or G GIS system that your archaeologists know about. But we are developing it in 3D. Why? Because there you can set, you can set all type of data that can be obtained from micro destructive with non destructive things. And also you can uh, in integrate historical data. That was the question from Anna. Uh, with new indexations, you can link with all ancient texts, ancient maps, ancient drawings, ancient writings, whatever. And then you can add in the future new data, chemical analysis, whatever. And the idea in the end, with an object or with a big site, a big monument, a statue, whatever, then you yeah. have these three virtual restitution integrating all types, all kinds of data. And that is something that has been developed right now. And we have a prototype. It's not me, actually, it's the engineers. They are submitting a, a paper. I will send a publication when it's uh, released. And we are developing our prototype on the Lascaux cave from the Dordogne, Vézère Valley that you probably know about the UNESCO site, blah, blah. And uh, I believe this kind of tool can totally integrate what uh, Noel uh, Streeton has mentioned previously, that is the Anderson model, you know, trying to be a tool for helping, that is creating this data bank for memories of recovering any kind of data, even what's going to be added in the future. And that is a way for mixing different types of disciplines like history, art historians, conservators, curators, physicists, chemists, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe this is a, a possibility. This is a possibility to try to integrate this kind of thing. So I'll be very happy next time if I can show uh, the prototype or uh, if it works better because I'm doing the work myself that is integrating data and that's a terrible work. But still, I think that's just a, an idea for the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Remy. Thank you, Remy. Would you like to comment on that, uh, Gabriele? No, okay. I'm already adverted of uh, similar projects. Uh, I've been involved in, a, in an Erasmus Plus project uh, concerning the didactic of, uh, of science applied to cultural heritage, that uh, it is uh, around uh, the uh, intervention of restoration in uh, the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. And in that case, I know that they are building a database with all available data 
that uh, uh, can be uh, obtained even in uh, literature and that then can be added in the future uh, in order to uh, make these available to those people interested in conservation that are going to study this particular object even uh, in, the, in the future. So uh, I agree with uh, this point and I, I know that uh, there are also some other examples of this approach that uh, I believe is really important for conservation. Thank you. Uh, I was just giving this short comment because I will not be able to join the round table this sure. afternoon. So sorry about that. So sure. thank Remy. you again. Thank you. Thank you, Remy. There is a, another, uh, I mean, two questions. Uh, and um, uh, Maite, do you have a, a question related to this point? No, I, uh, I only want to add that maybe considering that this is a hot topic, maybe you two, Gabriele and, and Remy, you can organize such a kind of a workshop to, <laughs> to introduce us this, because I think that this is a, a very interesting topic. Uh, to be able to join all the information and manage everything to create such a kind of database. So I think that you have a nice topic for, for a workshop or, I don't know. <laughs> such a <laughs> Let's go on with the questions. There is a one from um, Kidane Gebre Mariam from uh, University of Stavanger. Interesting presentation. How large is the electrode area used for the electrochemical investigations? How much material is often transferred to the carbon paste electrodes? And what about the need to build a reference material database for the unambiguous identifications of different analytes of interest? Okay, okay. So the, the area is uh, it's really small because the electrode, uh, the, the carbon part of the electrode is a cylinder uh, with a diameter ranging from one millimeter to two millimeter. So the area of the electrode is uh, more or less this dimension, but obviously it's not this area that is important, but uh, it is important how much material is transferred to the electrode uh, due to, uh, thanks to the gentle rubbing of the surface. And um, the material that is transferred is uh, hundreds of uh, nanograms, usually. And because uh, uh, you cannot see the, any effect after rubbing the electrode on the surface, and uh, you rely on the particular characteristic of solid-state electrochemistry. Um, these uh, these techniques uh, uh, has been uh, also um, has been also called uh, uh, the uh, abrasive stripping electrochemistry. So uh, if you uh, have some uh, if you have some uh, knowledge about electrochemistry, you know which is the difference between electrochemistry in solution and electrochemistry in solid state, and in particular electrochemistry of stripping. And this works more or less like uh, a stripping electrochemistry. This is why you can have signals even uh, for a very small amount of sample. And uh, obviously there is the need to build a reference material database. And this has been done by, by Antonio Domenech Carbo. He has a, a database available with the signals, uh, electrochemical signals of uh, several materials and several materials connected to cultural heritage. And I do not remember the uh, the website, but uh, if you if you try with Google, I'm sure we'll find that the database for uh, voltammetric uh, voltammetry of microparticles for cultural heritage. There is uh, 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 Remy was mentioning uh, I mean, this uh, uh, the point that he raised before I mean, uh, uh, RIS three D. Reference information system in 3D. So is uh, coming back to the point raised uh, before. There is uh, one last question for uh, Gabriele about uh, from Lucia Toniolo from Polymia. Uh, thanks for your nice talk. I think that it's time to set up new criteria for sustainable protocols for diagnostic for cultural heritage. Uh, 
what do you think about and it's also this uh, this question is also supported by by Maria Perla Colombini from uh, Unipisa okay uh, yes maybe the um, the right word is sustainable and uh, sustainable protocol means uh, non destructive micro destructive nano destructive and uh, uh, define the the criteria define the The rules for uh, for sampling, uh, uh, I believe, uh, is uh, a, a step forward. Uh, the definition of these uh, sustainable protocols, and uh, I, I agree obviously with the, both Lucia and, and Maria Perla. Thank you very much uh, about this, uh, Maite. Yes. No, I want only to add to this. Uh idea of sustainability or sustainable protocols for a, a sampling and diagnostic, not only the protocols, but also the, the materials used for that. I think that it is very important to focus the attention on, on the, for example, if we use uh, sensors or, or whatever to try to, to manage uh, using uh, sustainable materials for that if we want to integrate everything. Uh, Lucia, yes, please activate your mic. Yes, uh, just just to add to the comment that uh, actually the, the, the word sustainable should be uh, applied to all the process uh, from sampling, using right material, using uh, possible and sustainable uh, uh, techniques, uh, because uh, of course uh, we have seen uh, examples of uh, very sophisticated techniques, and sometimes we apply highly sophisticated technique to uh, solve. Uh, uh, not pass me the word uh, simple simple question. So uh, sustainability in this sense and the criteria for sustainability. Of the whole process. Yeah. That's actually, I mean, a comment that I, I, I was, it was also in my mind, Lucia. So thanks, Samena, for raising uh, this up. I mean, do you have further comments about this, uh, Gabriele? No, okay. Thank you very much. Before uh, uh, ending this, uh, this session, there was uh, one last question uh, for uh, Chiara from um, Anna Maria Siani that was uh, in, the, in the break. Yes. Chiara, thank you very much. Is um, uh, congratulations for your talk. Anna Maria is saying, do you think that the application of ML, Mike mm -hmm. Lima, uh, should machine always, learning mm -hmm. uh, should be always combined uh, with the uh, analysis of uh, physical chemical parameters that are really responsible uh, for the phenomena? Yes, I think that uh, this algorithm, uh, like the neural network, for example, algorithm may provide the uh, overall uh, uh, assessment of different type of decay. So not only mechanical, chemical, but eventually also biological, depending on the input parameter that are the environmental parameter in our case that are interesting uh, to be studied. But of course, it will be also nice to uh, use the same algorithm also to investigate only single uh, decay processes to better understand uh, uh, how uh, overall uh, uh, the mechanism works. I don't know if uh, I was clear in the answer. Uh, for me, it was uh, <laughs> not being an expert, uh, Chiara. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, welcome. If there are not further questions, um, there is a yeah, uh, last uh, uh, comment. There is a, uh, a comment from uh, Jose Delgado de Rodriguez. Uh, I think that is for Gabriele again. Uh, shall the concepts of uh, micro destructive and similar be considered uh, as absolute or as, or as relative concepts? When we are dealing with a facade that is crumbling, what does microdestructive mean? Other situations may be called uh, to mean that these concepts shall be taken in the reliable meaning. Gabriele, would you like to comment on that? It's a nice question. And uh, obviously, if the example is a facade that is crumbling, uh, it, uh, 
it seems clear that the micro destructive should be intended as a relative concept. But uh, if, if it's not a facade, but it is a, a wall of uh, frescoes uh, of the Roman era in Pompeii or Colano, it, it would be different. So uh, obviously, uh, a facade that is that is crumbling that uh, maybe does not need to be sampled in the order of nanograms. This is this is quite obvious, I, I believe. Yes. So in, in some cases, uh, uh, the microdestructive uh, should be uh, should be interpreted uh, in view of uh, the uh, total availability of, uh, of the sample, also to the importance of the sample. But maybe these are the points to rise uh, in order to find uh, the possibility to define rules uh, and to define the standards for, uh, uh, for sampling. Thank you, Gabriele, for commenting on this. Uh, Maita, you have uh, last uh, last comment uh, question. No, this is a, mostly a, a proposal for for all of you. Uh, I think that uh, what Lucia mentioned uh, about the sustain sustainability in the selection of the of the techniques or uh, in the development of the methodology is an interesting topic. Topic. So, if you agree, we can. Uh, discuss a little bit at the end of the of the workshop because I think that it deserves to, to discuss absolutely it. absolutely and so we deserve also a break I mean a lunch a lunch break so we will uh, reconvene again I mean for the afternoon session at uh, 3 p.m. Uh, CET time and uh, yeah we would like to uh, we will be happy I mean, to see you once again i would like to thank very much once again the uh, the speakers uh, of the morning session it was brilliant so the, the the discussion was really productive uh, and really interesting inspiring under so many aspects uh, i would like to uh, see you all again in the afternoon it will be yes it will be at uh, 3 uh, 15 uh, uh, 15 oh uh, 3 p.m. CET time. So, yes, in one hour and a half. Thanks very much. Uh, Thank you very much. We will keep this session open uh, so you can write here the comments also for the round table. We will just uh, stop recording uh, the videos in the meanwhile. Thank you and see you later. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye, bye. bye. See you. Enjoy the lunch. So, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I hope that you enjoy your uh, lunch. Uh, now we move to the afternoon session. I'm going to be the chairwoman. I hope that I can guide this session as Francesco done this morning. So, congrats, Francesco, for the nice uh, chairing of the session. And, uh, well, this afternoon session uh, is going to be a round table. We invite uh, different experts, researchers, professionals on the field to give their opinion on the topic, on the general uh, well, topic of the of the workshop. So, for the rest of the participants uh, in the workshop, uh, if you have, uh, let's say, questions or some comments or concerns about the topic that each uh, participant introduces. You can post uh, your comments or your questions in the chat. And when we finish the, the round table, we are going to open the, the discussion to, to all the participants in the workshop. Okay. So, uh, yes. Just, uh, please let me add so that if anybody would like, uh, just like Remy, during the, the morning session, or would like to talk and to activate the camera rather than um, writing uh, by by chat i mean it's entirely possible just to ask ask us to in the chat that you would like to intervene and i will activate you i will make you uh, for uh, uh, for some time i will make you uh, uh, one of the panelists and then uh, you will be able uh, you will be able to talk and to interact so let's say more uh, lively 
in a more lively way. Maite, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Francesco. You can post it also uh, in the chat that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if you agree, we can uh, start uh, with the round table. And uh, the first participant is uh, Joan Casar. Professor Casar uh, is put full professor and head of the Department of Conservation and Built Heritage within the Faculty for the Built Environment in the University of Malta, as well as Deputy Dean of the Faculty for the Built Environment. She is Fellow of the International Institute for Conservation, Fellow of the Geological Society, Carter uh, Chemist and Fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and Carter Scientist. Uh, she's also currently leading projects uh, ranging from the evaluation of shelters over prehistoric sites to the behavior of traditional and modern local groups using satellite technology. And she's also, uh, or she take part also in Hyperion HS and ARIS. So please, Joanne, when you want, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this um, uh, introduction, Maite, and thank you to all the organizers for this invitation. I must say that the uh, morning session was very stimulating, very interesting, um, and I think um, maybe what I prepared for this afternoon could be a transition between the morning and the afternoon, because knowing full well that um, I was I was going to be the first speaker, um, and having the presentations available to me, at least the titles of the, pres uh, the presentations, I thought that maybe um, I would set the scene for the discussion by asking questions rather than making statements. I will start with a few statements and then ask some questions. I also would like to tell you where I come from. I am a conservation scientist, but I have worked always in very, very close contact with conservators. And I hope that at this point in my career, I can also uh, represent some of the thoughts of conservators, but coming from uh, a different background. So this is what inspired also um, what I'm going to say. I have a very, very short presentation. Maite, I know you said five slides. I have five slides, <laughs> so I'm not going to go out of. And I would like to share. Okay, so is that okay? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, so uh, first of all, I was uh, intrigued by the title of the uh, of the conference because, um, uh, especially by the the second part, are there too many too expensive measurements in the field of conservation of cultural heritage? And coming from a scientific background, I asked myself. What does too many mean and what does too expensive mean? Because in order to answer this question, we need to have some sort of baseline. Um, so I, um, uh, first of all, I'm starting to start by making some assumptions. First of all, my first assumption is that the heritage we intervene on is not ours. Okay, it is only in our care so that we can pass it on to future generations. That is my the, the, the point of departure. But also, um, based on that, if we are going to think of even intervening on an object, we need to know the object or site as much as possible, even before thinking of making a plan. And this includes um, materials and technology, causes and mechanisms of deterioration, the past interventions maybe which it carried out, uh, interactions with its environment and its context. So here I was really, really uh, interested in the presentation by Noel, where um, I said, okay, so maybe we are latching on here a bit to what uh, conservators would like us to do. But also we must remember that it is not possible to have all the instruments, expertise and time which are necessary to know all about an object. We might also say, is it necessary to know all about the object? But and then what is enough to know about the object? Okay, but we must know 
something, a good deal about the object and site in order to plan any interventions, which will then safeguard all of the values embodied in the object and site. And here, I think as scientists, we must very, very carefully consider that um, we, each object, each site has got a number not only one, a number of values which is embodies, and it also means different things to different communities, different people, and therefore we must safeguard all of the meanings that these objects have. And then, uh, of course, all our choices will depend on what the object is and its past and present values. So, Again, given that some, I, I have not uh, qualified this because I will not qualify it. I hope it will come out. Maybe the different points of views will come out in the discussion. But given that some measurements are needed, we need some sort of measurements before we do we even start to even think of touching an object. We need to know what is sufficient and what is too much. And in order to do this, I think maybe we should understand better the measuring process itself. So these are my thoughts. I am not at any point going to um, tell you or even to even think that I have the answers to this. Maybe we, even as a community, maybe we don't have all these answers, but I really would like us uh, as a group, as a group of professionals with I know the um, well-being of the object to heart, but also um, being scientifically um, sound and experts, we need to ask ourselves, why are we measuring? So this ties in, I think, also with the presentation of Maite this morning, when she said it's very important to formulate a research question. Why do we measure? What is the reason behind our measurements? Is it to know the object technologically, or is it its history, its materials, deterioration, past treatments? We need to know why we are measuring. We also need to know what are we measuring? Are we measuring the object or site, or are we measuring the deterioration materials? Or are we trying to understand the conservation treatments or the environment? We had our very first presentation, which was super interesting about the environment and all the measurements that can take place on the environment. How are we measuring? So this again for me ties on into the last presentation this morning of uh, Professor Favero when he was talking about invasive, non-invasive, micro-invasive, micro-destructive. So we've got all of these tools in our hands. How are we going to choose which are the best, if best exists? And then what are we doing with the data we collect? Are we placing it in databases? Are we writing reports, publications? Are we storing it in a library or archive? And then once we have finished our measurements and we have this an enormous amount of data, and again, super interesting, the lecture by uh, Scott and Bavesh on, on um, data. Um, uh, how accessible are the data to others? Are we sharing our data equitably? How are the data in fact shared? There are, I know, numerous answers here, but I think um, being a discussion, it was not my time or place to make uh, statements, but I think it's important to ask you all, what are your opinions? For me, that is the basis of a discussion. And then other questions, which I think we really need to consider. Who owns the data? At the end of the day, who has paid for the data to be collected? If it is a research project, yeah, well, then it might be the taxpayer who has paid for the data to be collected. So do we owe anything to them? How easy is it to find existing data? Who has the right to use the data? Are we using the data efficiently? 
And what about the metadata? Okay, we publish. What are we doing with the metadata? Is it accessible? And can we, in fact, be measuring too much question at a great cost because we are not sharing ex existing data enough? And here is my, um, my uh, pitch for open access, open data, which is uh, very much being pushed by the European Union, which even as Lucia mentioned this morning, IRIS is very, very much um, uh, working towards and also, um, which I think we owe, we owe our com scientific community and the people who fund our work, we owe them data to be accessible to them. And basically, that is the end of my presentation. I hope I didn't take uh, too much time, but I hope that, um, well, I just say over to you, and I hope that it will lead to a very, hopefully, interesting discussion. Thank you very much, Joan. I think that this is helpful, and we can connect also, as you mentioned, uh, with what uh, Lucia mentioned uh, at the end of the morning session. So I have uh, selected some of your uh, questions, which are uh, really interesting. So maybe, I don't know, uh, the following uh, participants can connect something with the this uh, kind of questions and uh, will connect your your uh, your concerns. So uh, I suggest to uh, move to the second participant. And uh, if there is no connection with this question and with this topic, uh, at the end of the uh, round table, we are going to to speak uh, a little bit more and to establish a discussion uh, about these questions and and topics. Okay. So feel free, the rest of the participants, to take these questions if you want and and uh, make some comments. Okay, thank you, Joan. And uh, well, uh, later you can also uh, interact with the rest of the participants of the roundtable. Okay, so let's move to the second participant, uh, which is uh, who is sorry, uh, John Hughes. Uh, John, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, John uh, is reader in historic uh, built environment and geologist uh, with research interest in materials using historic structures, especially the characterization of historic mortars, the development of new mortars for conservation and the characterization of stone decay. He has also researched the link between science and conservation and also climate change impacts on cultural heritage. He is nowadays the president of the ICOMS, ICOMS uh, Scientific Committee for Stone. So please, uh, John, now the floor is yours. So when you want. Well, let me just find my correct screen to share. I'm never quite sure. Yes. Which... Okay, can you see it there? Uh, no. At this moment, I'm not oh, able. One, one more no, button. Yes, yes, it's That's loading. Okay. okay, perfect. That's fine. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll just close this. Okay, so following on from the previous presentations, and actually, in particularly, I found that what I'm about to say chimes very closely to what Noel said in the previous session. Um, but hopefully I'll also address by implication of what I say, what um, Joanne has just covered as well, to some extent. I had to look up holism and determinism just to make sure I knew what I was thinking about. But it occurred to me in a different way, though. Um, even though I'm a scientist, I'm actually very interested in values and understand that what we do scientifically is very much constrained by what we choose to protect and the reasons for the protection that we offer it. I'm going to quote Regal. Who is a surprising thing for a geologist to quote. He establishes lots of categories of value, okay, but he does say in determining age value in particular, he says that we should not withdraw a monument from the disintegrating effects of nature's forces, provided these are all current calm, lawful continuity and not in sudden violent destruction. So that is an idea that age value is consistent with a sort of slow, what we might call a slow onset change, um, something that we're used to. But we're in a changing environment now, 
which causes all, all sorts of problems, not just for cultural heritage, obviously, as we understand. I mean, I live in Glasgow, which was the centre of the universe just during November because of the COP26. That brings it very much home. So we have novel conditions of history and of, the, the, well, an argument I'm going to make or have made or would like to make is that perhaps the current conditions that we're moving into now are perhaps novel in the history of conservation. This is a new sort of, I, I, hate, to, I hate to use the word paradigm precisely without knowing its exact meaning. But perhaps we're moving into conditions that we don't quite understand the consequences of in terms of conservation. And I would refer you to work by Haugen and Matson in 2011, where they have a very nice encapsulation of that idea. So climate change and its effects are very, very important. Obviously, there's the risk from direct physical effects on cultural heritage, like storm, sea level rise, etc. Um, but there are also social um, consequences to that as well, things like conflict, migration, economic changes, and so on, which also threaten he heritage and also threaten intangible heritage, not just tangible heritage as well. So we mustn't forget that. We tend to adapt, and we have adapted through our history of humankind as well, we've adapted to conditions extremely well, and we do that depending on our particular capacity. And it's arguable now that we have more technical capacity than we've ever had in the past. Um, though it's unevenly distributed between the global north and south, for example, things are not evenly distributed or, or fair necessarily as such. That means that we have the possibility of technical characterization of heritage in a way that perhaps we've not had before. Um, when we look at things like the, the guiding charters, like Venice, for example, it demands the use of all the sciences and techniques which can contribute to the study, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which basically says that the material fabric is extremely important and that therefore we, we must be characterizing all the time basically uh, so now we're in the situation that especially we took so what scott was talking about earlier about big sort of big data ideas as well we're in a situation where measurement and documentation methods are advancing and i would argue yes they should definitely be used there's no question about that so but the question is as to what extent and how much and what's fair and what's ethical and what's reasonable in a particular situation. Now, we do this as well because scientific characterization frames cultural heritage value. So it not only helps us um, understand how to conserve, but it also changes the necessity. It can change the valuation that we place upon heritage resource as well. I'll give an example. Having a discussion with somebody the other day, they had done some characterization of an object from a private collection. Now, that had the implication that perhaps that maybe changes its financial valuation as much as its cultural valuation as well, because it authenticates it too as well. So there are issues that are broader than just the actual conservation issue as well. If things are physically and chemically and compositionally characterised and understood how they're evolving in terms of their, their weathering resources. So in the sense of our conservation philosopher, which I'm not going to try and pronounce because my Spanish pronunciation is not good. I apologise for that. Um, characterization reinforces the truth of an object. Um, so therefore, it's extremely important. So do we have any excuses then? Is all measurement good? On, in my opinion, probably yes, because I think science, if it's done properly in a scientific way, for the right reasons. Again, those are reasons that are not encapsulated in the actual methodologies themselves, but are part of the context of, of scientific um, analysis. But just to be cautious, um, knowledge of all types is valuable. And I think this is what Noel was kind of implying earlier as well. Not only science, but issues to do with things that do to do with contextualization, to do with management, the philosophy of conservation, intangible understandings. So I raised the point about how do we measure that? Do we measure that? Is there different ways of measuring that? There are different ways of knowing things, basically, than just the scientific way of knowing things. And it's beholden on scientists and non-scientists to get a grip of the respective opposite numbers in terms of science or not science. And, and be maybe think about becoming more genuinely interdisciplinary in their outlook. So this also means, and this was raised as well, uh, as well was the idea of dynamic values and new values develop. So authenticating, uh, uh, providing physical information or analysis of an object or a building authenticates it, increasingly authenticates it, but it also changes the valuation that, that sits around it as well. 
And that also goes with the change in valuation in, in broader society, but what we think is important. And with the changing climate and changing society, these things are constantly evolving. So we have to think about what the protected value is and whether or not the, the, there's a certain dynamism in the protected value understanding that we have. We also have to be careful. This is also from the, the Spanish conservation philosopher's idea. And I like the idea of encapsulating this, this idea of endoscience. It's doing science for its own sake. And a lot of us as scientists, we do are guilty of that because our funding allows us to do that for a great extent. To a great extent, and we're very fortunate in that regard. So there is a slight disconnect between theor theoretical science and fundamental understanding and application. But I would argue that, that this is inevitable, and maybe we just have to embrace that, because in many fields that we well, live with, in terms of, say, technology, there's lots of understandings that are fundamental from physics and chemistry and so on, and people do very pure work in there, in those subject areas that are then find their, their way to practical application and the development of useful technologies. So too many, too expensive, well, in comparison to what? So I'll refer back to Joanne's presentation just before. I can I think that's a different way of saying something similar. How do we evaluate that? I've, I've no particular idea. And the question then is, in the face of climate change, is all heritage equal? And in the needs and, and, and to satisfy the needs of the sustainable development goals, for example, is all heritage globally something that is necessarily equal? And does scientific characterization or scientific work with heritage change the valuation in particular parts of the world potentially? Perhaps. Now, I'm pretty much finished there, but I've just got a slide that you can read in your own time from a project we did a couple of years ago with some uh, people in the humanities. Um, a nice quote from an architect, scientists just give you the data, you always have to put it in context. As a scientist, I find that quite irritating, to be honest. So I will finish there. Thank you very much for your patience and time. Thank you very much, uh, John. I think that uh, we have also some new interesting uh, ideas uh, to, to speak about uh, them later. Thank you very much. And uh, now we can move uh, to the third uh, participant, which who is uh, Maria Peraita. Maria, uh, she is an architect specialized in conservation and restoration of uh, architectural heritage from the Polytechnic University of Madrid and master degrees in restoration and integral management of built heritage from the University of the Basque Country, uh, opting for its branch of management. So uh, now we have uh, a person with a background uh, on management uh, of sites and, and uh, buildings. After a period of professional practice with a technical profile, she focused her activity on applied research in the UNESCO Chair of Cultural Landscape and Heritage, where she also deals with the coordination, planning, and programming of the projects, as well as advising public institutions on heritage and landscape planning. Since June 2021, she has acted as director of the newly created Punta Begoña Foundation. And I think that in her intervention, she will transmit us how Punta Begoña uh, has contributed to the purpose of conservation, management, and also enhancement of uh, the built heritage of the Basque Country. I'm happy to introduce uh, Maria because uh, I also take part uh, in this, uh, I think, holistic project. So, Maria, the, the floor now is yours. Thanks, Maite. Can you hear me? It's OK? Yes, perfectly. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thanks a lot to all the organization because the, what is uh, proving to be a really profitable day. And I'd like to share a really short, uh, oh, sorry, uh, really short presentation with you. Um, Okay. Now. Now? Yes, we can see your screen. You can share the presentation. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So, um, well, I admit that when Maite told me about the subject of the debate, I was surprised, in fact, by the directness of the question. 
And that made me reflect on where we could put the limits for the knowledge of good uh, that are common heritage. You know, uh, many people have uh, told about about this this day, and I think that the, all these points of view are really interesting because of the different, you no, know, but with the same uh, goal. Uh, the approach should probably focus not so much on the measurements themselves, but on the way in which studies respond to previous objectives set out as early as uh, 1972 in the Convention Concerning the Protection of the World Cultural and Natural Heritage agreed by UNESCO. It's clear the obligation of to act on a heritage asset as long as there is no deep knowledge about it, uh, so that intervention that is proposed as so with guarantees of respecting all the values of the monument. Uh, well, research for the knowledge uh, of heritage asset becomes an indispensable condition prior to intervention for the recovery. And this is one of the objectives to be met. But the convention also establishes another equally indispensable condition. And that is the need to guarantee a social return. How can all these studies for a knowledge of heritage leading to its conservation be used to promote training, uh, cultural activity, tourism, or local economic development? Um, well, uh, this is a question we ask ourselves when facing a particularly unique monument on the north coast of Spain, Punta Begoña Galleries in Guecho. Punta Begoña Galleries are one of the landscape landmarks of the Spanish coast, located at the mouth of the Bilbao estuary. They emerged as the dream of one of the great entrepreneurs of Europe at the beginning of the 20th century. He's called Rafa Chavarrieta, a figure unjustly invisible by history, who, whoever was a key player in the formation of some of the most important companies of the current moment, such as Iberia or Iberdrola, or in the evolution of the interwar period for his business with England or Germany, for example. Uh, this man decided, uh, now, a hundred years ago, to erect on his property a shocking construction for which to see his mining businesses, the traffic of his shipping company, or the social activity of the national bourgeoisie, but a wall from which to be seen. To do this, he contacted the most renowned architect of the panorama, Ricardo Bastida, and both visionaries created the first building for a private residence built in Vizcaya with reinforced uh, concrete and instead dressed in the highest quality materials such as uh, Carrara and Beagen marbles, civilian ceramics or large Asian wooden windows. Well, but the time of splendor soon passed for the galleries and just 15 years later, they welcomed some of the most unexpected uses, a military shelter for civilian population, a hospital during the Spanish Civil War, headquarters of the Italian command, or years later, just entertainment area for the, the population, uh, uh, local population. Uh, not in vain, Punta Begoña galleries were defined by the archaeologist Surfayan as one of the most interesting historical capsules that can be found in Spain because of the, um, the, the, the rest that we can found there. But abandonment may decide to become a black spot of vandalism in the, in the coast. Finally, in 2014, the City Council of Guecho started a project in which the University of the Basque Country acts as an advisory body. This project applies a management model already contrasted in dozens of monuments uh, on an international scale and designed uh, 20 years ago in Basque Country, uh, which is called Open for Works. Well, um, Open for Works program is born with the conviction and from the conviction that both uh, conservation of cultural heritage and knowledge generated for and for this reason should be considered as a public good. I think that uh, this uh, answers some of the, the questions that uh, Johan has uh, put, no? has talked about. Um, and therefore, be democratically managed and accessible to citizens. 
the objective of the program is to involve society in recovery of monuments. And this is intended to contribute to the continued conservation of them. This fulfills uh, the two objectives set by UNESCO uh, to recover the heritage and to do it for society. To develop the first part of the process uh, focused on research, the project has involved a transdisciplinary uh, team formed by professionals from very different areas, uh, but directed and coordinated with a common goal. Uh, there were uh, chemical uh, analysts, chemical, uh, geologists, architects, um, economists, uh, uh, archaeologists, and many people involved in this process. The work done so far has served to carry out emergency actions to avoid risk of damage of the, to the monument, to enable the space to make the possible its visit, its opening, and public activities, on many occasions promoted by citizens themselves, and to know the monument in order to act with guarantees and from the maximum respect of its values in accordance with criteria defined by, by UNESCO, as I said. In the first phase, uh, research has played a fundamental role in generation of content. However, its continuity has been achieved by the emphasis given to pursuing its social function through training, dissemination, and public participation. Guided tours to show results, uh, through which more than 50,000 people uh, passed until 2020, presentation uh, at international congresses and conferences, workshops for students, uh, classes to primary, secondary, undergraduate, and postgraduate students. All this multiplied the results achieved at academic level, uh, such as scientific articles or doctoral thesis for example. Uh, and it led this project to become finalist in Spanish BML of architecture and urbanism for uh, what they said, its contribution to progress and knowledge of architectural, urban and landscape culture through dissemination of the process. I think that uh, I have problems to, okay. Sorry, it's just one more. On the way, uh, 2018 was a turning point. It was the moment in which research was naturally and progressively giving prominence to intervention and social use. That year, more than 100 open activities had place in galleries in the case of the centenary of its construction, a necessary balance to make the project sustainable in the long term. Work and sociocultural activities intensify, and as a result, socioeconomic profitability increases also. In 2018, an impact study carried out by an external consultancy showed that until that moment, the public investment practically equaled the returns obtained. From 2018 to 2022, the process had advanced in pursuit of that long-term sustainability and precisely to maintain that balance, we have understood that the management model is key. Thus, Punta de Goña Foundation has been created, understood as a tool to coordinate the works, the participation and integral profitability from its multiple facets under criteria or respect of the monument, transparency and transfer, above all. After these years of intense work, the question we ask ourselves is, not if there are too many or if the cost of measurements and research of the monument is excessive, but if they are really serving the desired objective. When it comes to defining returns, it's where a holistic vision cannot be lacking. We must take into account not only the conservation of the good, but also formative, uh, tourist, social, cultural, or even economic benefits because research and discoveries make the most of their sense when shared. And um, for me, it's all. Uh, thanks a lot. And um, we talk later. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Maria. Uh, only to mention that when we start speaking, uh, Francesco, uh, Luigi and myself about this workshop, uh, we thought that it was necessary to include people from the management part, not 
pure, pure scientists, people uh, acting as managers of the site or a representative of the management of the site, because uh, I think that uh, you have uh, the full vision of uh, the project and the way in which the projects are directed. So, uh, as I mentioned, I was involved in this project, so I'm happy to, to have you here, uh, <laughs> Maria. Thank you very much. So Thanks now uh, I think that uh, we move to another very nice contribution from the management side also. Uh, I want to introduce you Merete Vines. Uh, Merete is a conservator uh, with 18 years of, of experience in the field. Later, she was the head of the conservation department at the Norwegian Institute for Cultural Heritage Research. Uh, since uh, 2016, she is the head of Museum and Properties in the National Trust of Norway, a, a non-governmental organization that owns more than uh, 40 properties in Norway, including the marvelous Arnes State Charts. I hope that she can speak about the uh, Arnes. <laughs> On, uh, Arnes uh, is inside the UNESCO World Heritage uh, List. Uh, and there she has experience on both sides as a, a practitioner and as owner of buildings and collections. She has also developed and implemented research projects uh, with other institutions, uh, uh, nationalities, and also international uh, collaborations. So Merete, uh, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to uh, the round table and uh, for the introduction, uh, Maite. Um, I'm definitely for a holistic uh, and interdisciplinary approach uh, in conservation and management of uh, cultural heritage. Uh, and uh, as you said, uh, I'm now uh, head of the Museum and Properties uh, in the National Trust of Norway. Uh, we are uh, a non-governmental organization established uh, in 1844, uh, so probably one of the oldest in, in Europe. And we own more than 40 properties. Many of these are medieval uh, buildings, uh, both uh, wood and um, stone. Um, uh, it might be shocking to you when I tell you that at the headquarters, we are only four people uh, in the department of uh, museum and properties. Me as a conservator and art historian, one dealing with education uh, and one with uh, collection management. So. Uh, Around at the different properties, uh, there are no full-time uh, employees. Uh, we have several volunteers. So that's just to give you a picture of what we are dealing with. Um, our organization has a strategy uh, where it's sustainability, knowledge sharing, networking, education, uh, democracy, and involvement are key factors. Uh, and uh, fortunately, many of our uh, properties are uh, relevant and very popular uh, with uh, scientists. Uh, and as Maite mentioned, uh, of course, uh, UNES State Church, dated uh, to about 11.30 uh, on UNESCO World Heritage, uh, is uh, outstanding uh, in many ways. And uh, Chiara uh, from NTNU uh, also man mentioned uh, all the 28 state churches uh, in, in Norway. And we are grateful uh, for uh, that uh, long uh, project. Well, in my experience, it is very often the universities, uh, the institutes and other research organizations that see calls uh, and who are aware of research programs and funding much uh, more uh, often than owners and site managers, because we simply haven't got the time uh, to uh, uh, follow um, all the international uh, journals uh, and the latest uh, on the technological uh, sides. Uh, but in this discussion, I think it's uh, useful to differentiate uh, between smaller projects uh, dealing with uh, a particular painting or object and much larger projects uh, and campaigns, including groups of objects or buildings rather, running over uh, years uh, and longer periods of time. 
That being said, I think it's uh, very important to have an interdisciplinary uh, approach uh, early on, uh, even at the uh, development and design of research uh, projects. Uh, Maid uh, mentioned it uh, in um, her talk uh, this morning. Uh, in fact, uh, the scope of the projects. Uh, so one really has to be honest uh, about what is necessary uh, when it comes to resources, uh, funding, uh, all the uh, practicalities. Um, and then I also think it's uh, useful at that stage uh, to have um, a clear uh, idea uh, and agreement about dissemination, uh, accessibility and later use uh, of uh, the results. Um, and now that we are all uh, uh, on social media and on different uh, platforms, I think one should also uh, agree on communication throughout uh, the project and uh, publicity, because I think we each have uh, our uh, currency in a way that uh, a researcher might uh, put uh, information uh, on their site uh, and as owner, one uh, might feel that, what, that one is forgotten or sort of bypassed uh, and the latest news comes uh, from uh, those who uh, do the particular analysis, they might not present the whole picture. Uh, and uh, also, as Professor Kassar said, uh, who owns uh, the results uh, afterwards? Uh, uh, for, uh, I have a quite a different view now after five years uh, in the National Trust of Norway than I had uh, when I worked uh, for NICU, the Norwegian Institute for Cultural Heritage, or even as a student uh, at the conservation program at the VNA. So, um, uh, up, uh, now, almost uh, like other uh, conservation uh, projects, I think it's uh, it, it should be uh, almost part of uh, uh, a contract or written in the uh, proposal. Um, today, we've heard a lot about the uh, different uh, standards uh, for uh, sampling, uh, and uh, those are very, very important. Um, I don't know whether it's all the same in the European countries, but uh, in Norway, uh, when you um, sample uh, a protected um, building or, or uh, like a painting uh, from uh, the Middle Ages, I, as uh, the owner, have to write an application uh, according to the Norwegian Cultural Heritage Act. So uh, there one really has to be uh, very precise and have a very clear purpose uh, about uh, sampling. So uh, just to conclude, uh, just to have a good communication uh, throughout uh, the projects uh, and to have good networks, I think is uh, uh, very important. And like uh, we do today to um, get to know each other. Uh, and I think uh, I think it was uh, Noel who, who talked about uh, what uh, conservation students uh, are uh, taught uh, about uh, samples and uh, involvement uh, of uh, people. Uh, that is very, very important. And I really hope that uh, not only conservators, but those who are training uh, in uh, cultural heritage studies and museology, uh, that they uh, get some of the same input, that they have to um, be on the scene, they have to talk uh, with uh, those who work with more natural uh, sciences, uh, and only then uh, can we uh, fulfill uh, and uh, I think get really, really useful uh, results. So um, I think that's uh, what I wanted to say so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Merete. I think that, uh, as I mentioned, the, your opinion and the one of uh, Maria is very interesting because I think that we need to work together. And uh, I think that uh, it is really appreciated also in this forum. Okay, so uh, we can discuss also about these uh, ideas and, and topics uh, later. Uh, I'm taking notes <laughs> of uh, the most important things. And uh, let's move to the next uh, participant uh, in the round table, who is uh, Daniela Ferro. 
Daniela Ferro has been associate as scientist to the Center for Chemical Thermodynamics at, at high temperatures for CNR during 40 years. So she is uh, the responsible of the scanning microscope uh, service of the Department of Chemistry in the University of La Sapienza of Rome. Uh, this experience has allowed her teaching and consulting within the Department of Chemistry of La Sapienza. Uh, her research interests are the study of welding and modification of the metal, <clears throat> metal sulfur as a result of thermal processes. She has also collaborated in bilateral programs with Morocco uh, for the study of the archaeometallurgy of medium atlas region. And the described activity allowed her to include as consultant and cooperator, cooperator in national and European projects in the field of archaeology and forensic field. So, Daniela, uh, when you want, the floor is yours. I don't know if Daniela is ready. I can see you. Uh, are you able to activate your microphone, Daniela? It is uh, yes, yes. okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you, Daniela. I want to text and I want to say that the term olive is a very, very interesting for my activity. May I? Yeah, uh, uh, okay. we are not able to. We are not able to see you. Uh, we can hear you, but not. It's not possible to see you. Uh, can you, if you want, can you please turn on the camera? The option is close to the camera. I see myself, and I now I try to uh, convide the. Yes, now you are sharing. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now yes. Now yes, but I have to. So the uh, allism terms. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> the allism terms is very adapted to my research. And in these sentences, there is all what I wanted to say to you. What values does the jewel matter today as a copy replica, a jewel inspired to the antiquity, a counterfeit? That values today the jewel made as a copy replica, a jewel inspired by the antiquity, a counterfeit? It can only be understood through the instrument of micro nanodiagnostic as the technical device chosen as the manual skill belonging to the personality of the goldsmith, but this no forger can reproduce it. So this sentence is, uh, is all my research. In fact, uh, it's very um, difficult to uh, study a jewel because uh, as uh, this morning said Noel Stritton, that an object, uh, she said, they, uh, they saw, we see, but the object uh, uh, speak because the object contains all the procedure that an, an ancient man um, tested by with empirical tests to reproduce some very beautiful object. But now this uh, uh, procedure, this test, this uh, uh, empirical uh, manual uh, artifact uh, now is a scientist. Uh, now is a very scientist law. Now we can uh, can uh, climb them as uh, um, processes, scientific processes. It's not easy, for example, to um, uh, understand very well why is the decomposition of a gold alloy uh, adapted for that uh, singular function of a jewel. For example, this was uh, a necklace and the style is a Greek, but it was made with 21 uh, rabbin um, cut the cabochon. And it was very nice Then these two parts are added as uh, speaked the, um, the the, uh, the antiquary, uh, the American antiquary that wanted to sell this to uh, Italian government, uh, that was added because the lady has a neck too large to, to, 
to, to, to, to, uh, to, to tail this, uh, this, uh, uh, this object. But uh, the uh, composition, the technology was the same, and in particular, uh, the object was very dirty, and the dirt, the earth and the, the, the grays, uh, very dirty, was on this part and also for this. This is very typical of a fakes and uh, with the scientist uh, um, uh, analysis, it possi was possible to uh, stop the, the uh, acquisition of the Italian government. In this other part, uh, this is a private because the private are the um, the men that, that today uh, go to the very important uh, mark of jewelry, and uh, you say also that all is means also um, the, the term economy. But uh, this is economy is a very real for this very important object. And uh, read gold artifact with the filigree and granulation technique. Depict Dionysus on the side boat covered with the grape branch. It's very fake, it's not a filigree. This is a thread, it's a very big. So, this is a not a exact terminology. So, for a jewelry, it's not necessary only uh, understand the typology, but uh, uh, also the, um, the geologic um, provenance, the uh, technology. The, uh, the chemical analysis of, of all of the single parts and so on. And uh, we can read that the scientific conclusion through chemical and morphologic analysis performed using of uh, uh, SMABS technique or material employed on the processing technique allow us to detect the high degree of purity of metal foil of the artifact made of red gold. So if a purity a gold is not red, the red is an addition of a cap. The artifact subject to analysis through ADS spectrum reveals it for the adhesion of granulation spheres with which Dionysius bottles decorated were not welded through the use of copper salt. I don't know why, because I have no analysis about this. This methodology, therefore, appears to be different from the one in use through Scalgosmith or called Frisocolla. So this is also a very, very strange uh, and all the uh, relation is so made. In the, this is the most important object in, uh, in Italy. It was uh, the uh, fibula with the ancient um, uh, Britain. It was the first Latin Britain. In the world, but uh, was um, uh, they decided in uh, uh, fifty years ago that it was for fakes because some analysis made with the uh, scientific technology of that time decided that there was uh, fakes. But uh, it's very nice that uh, they use XRF for for the analysis. And they found this quantity of uh, silver, and they decided that these are the, um, the, the alloy of a new gold and not an uh, ancient gold. And uh, uh, in, in another page, uh, there is a lot of explanation why uh, the, um, this uh, part of the fibula, they have to be elastic, was very elastic. But I don't know that with the 30% uh, of uh, silver uh, uh, make the alloy extremely hard. It's not absolutely elastic. So these are very two uh, uh, con conceptions exactly uh, wrong. And uh, no one analyzes uh, this uh, small uh, part by, from a scientific point of view. And uh, another um, question was uh, that the uh, fluorescence was uh, made with a, a, um, a beam, X-ray uh, beam, with a diameter of five millimeters. So he can uh, analyze an average composition of the uh, gold alloy, and not the single part, very small, that distinguish the single part of a jewel. In another part, uh, they uh, analyze uh, with other 
um, methods. And they say that, for example, um, some uh, sugar, no, um, some uh, uh, sapon, no, some uh, mat proteic material, no. And uh, there are two uh, range of uh, melting and concluded that uh, this is Italian, I, I, uh, just to, to, to translate the concept, that it was impossible to establish nothing with this kind of analysis. But this analysis was paid and was uh, uh, made in, in, the, in, the, in the, the organic work that decide that the uh, fibula was fake. So I, I invite uh, in this, uh, um, to, in this uh, uh, very important uh, um, uh, conference that uh, um, we have uh, to distinguish the um, single part of uh, a scientific publication, but also a, uh, in, a, a report or a commercial report or or a report of a lawyer in, a, in for example, for the, um, uh, to decide if an object is a fake or not. And this, uh, believe me, absolutely free. Non uh, law or no um, uh, regulation there is in, in this uh, uh, matter. For example, these are very important uh, um, uh, papers that is very important uh, archaeologist that say that uh, make the analysis with the spectrographic method. What means a spectrographic method? I don't know. No one uh, say what is spectrographic uh, method. And uh, uh, li uh, look, that is a table the, where there is a, a rare, strong traces. Uh, traces, uh, um, no, small traces. This is not a scientist. This is, uh, I don't know what. And it's uh, very nice to uh, analyze this uh, table in, in which two objects in bronze, uh, analyzed in bronze, and look with also three decimal uh, numbers. One has a, a, a copper content um, higher than 70%. And the other bronze non determined. So this is uh, what I wanted to to say that uh, I I I'd like to have some um, uh, regulament also in the, the uh, each um, relation or, or for the mark or for the museum exposition that in inherent the uh, precious object. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniela, for, introdu uh, for introducing your, your view on the topic with these uh, nice examples. So uh, I have taken also notes. Uh, let's move to the next participant, uh, who is uh, Elizabeth Sendry. Uh, she's Associate Professor at Kaforskari University in Venice. Uh, she is professor of scientific strategies for the conservation of cultural heritage, and she performs the role of scientific coordinator of the research activities for several national and international projects of diagnostics and conservation of artistic, architectural, and archaeological assets. She promotes uh, activities in partnership with conservators. Uh, architects, uh, artists, uh, art historians to integrate projects uh, of cultural knowledge, organization, and dissemination within the cultural assets sector. So, Elisabetta, uh, now the floor is yours when you want. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would thank you also, Professor Campanella and the organizer of, of this uh, very interesting workshop. In my intervention, I want to shortly reflect in particular on the impact on, on the role of scientific data, data in the operative phase. As we know, uh, in the academic field, uh, scientific research, scientific data uh, has as its primary um, goal the, meet, the um, advancement uh, of knowledge. And so all scientific data uh, can be significant. Instead, 
scientific data, particularly in the restoration works of Bill Heritage, must meet specific needs and solve specific problems. Therefore, not necessary, all scientific data have the same weight. Until today, in the operative phase, uh, scientific data focus mainly on the characterization of the materials, on their state of conservation, and uh, these are the first and the essential steps in the conservation project. However, scientific data must also provide proposals for suitable and sustainable uh, methodology to develop the operative step. The, in my opinion, the current holistic approach to the conservation of cultural heritage is in this sense a little bit incomplete. Uh, methodologies in most uh, cases are chosen by restorers based uh, on their experiences, uh, and this seems to be sufficient to ensure the success of the intervention. But scientific data about uh, the uh, effectiveness uh, over time are generally scarce. The same for monitoring, often left uh, to some investigations, some controls, uh, without a precise maintenance plan. Monitoring strategies have not yet been well defined. We have not yet defined what to measure, how to measure possible, how to measure possible parameters and risk thresholds. The scientific community, in my opinion, <laughs> must urgently consider this aspect. Finally, and I conclude my intervention, scientific data should identify suitable solution also to mitigate the climate change's effects. And we must include this issue in the operative projects. Uh, in line with the European Heritage uh, Green Paper suggestions, I think that uh, Broader interpretation of holism in the conservation of cultural heritage is now necessary. And uh, this is surely the right place to do that. Thank you. Thank you again for your uh, very interesting uh, conference and round table. Thank you, Elisabetta, for your contribution. Grazie. And uh, I have taken notes or some of your opinions, then we can share if uh, all of us agree or not, and we can establish a, a discussion if you want. And uh, now let's move to the next participant, who is uh, Christian Denigri. Christian holds a PhD in Applied Science from Pierre Rif and um, uh, Marie Curie University. A conservation science specializing in the use of electrochemical techniques in conservation restoration. He's currently working at the, sorry, but I think that I'm not going to pronounce properly, Old Ecole Art Conservation Restoration in Neuchâtel Chapel in Switzerland, as professor and project leader, and particularly Christian. Uh, he's interested in portable, low cost, and accessible and easy accessible particip participatory analysis uh, tools dedicated to the field. So, Christian, when you want, the floor is yours. I know. Uh, I'm afraid that I have again a problem with my PowerPoint presentation. So, once we can I... guide you. you, you can you can test and try. We have time. We are on time. So, take okay. your time if you want to share. Okay, I'm on the screen, complete screen, but then I don't Yes, it's better to share uh, the complete screen yeah. instead of the application. Now? Yeah. Yes, perfect. So now you can open your presentation and I think that it works. Does it work? We are waiting. Uh, no, I think that we are in your screen, but not in your PowerPoint. I don't know if it is a PowerPoint. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, try it again. Uh, share the full screen. 
and then uh, when the whole screen is visible, select the PowerPoint and open it. Yes, now move to the PowerPoint. Yeah. And I don't know how to move to my mic. We, we can see that. We can see. Uh, uh, Christian, just uh, uh, push Alt and Tab on ah. your, uh, on your ah. mic. Exactly. Ah, okay. It's better like that. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Francesco. So do, you see, do you see it now? Yeah, now it's perfect. Yes. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Maite, for the nice introduction. Thank you too to the organizers, especially Francesco, Maite. Um, thank you as well to organize these uh, very important meetings during this difficult time when we cannot really see each other so often. So it's not the last um, um, meeting like this you organize. I hope. There will be many others afterwards. So I will start um, uh, this presentation by, um, in fact, starting from the introductory words of Maite when she talked this morning. And we could feel a bit of frustration uh, during this uh, introduction where she was mentioning that sometimes it's a bit complicated in conservation school uh, to transfer knowledge to um, uh, our students conservation and um, we might feel that we give them some tips on the type of analytical techniques we can use and um, sometimes after the lectures we might think uh, did they did they really understand isn't it dangerous the message we try to convey so in fact uh, now we are all aware of the situation um, what I'm going to um, give you is just my experiences uh, Professor in Chetel, but it's something that I've been seeing several times in the different conservation schools I've been working in. Uh, so some uh, some some pictures of students uh, during the visit. We organize um, uh, must, there are master students because in our school they are introduced to uh, analytical techniques, but theoreti theoretically at bachelor level, it's only. Uh, at the master level that we go to different labs and they are introduced to these different techniques. So you see that uh, it's a bit passive because they uh, see um, uh, experts working on different techniques, but in fact, uh, it's a bit complicated to uh, have them participating to really do any analytical work. So uh, what we try to do is to make students aware of uh, these conventional uh, analysis techniques applied to cultural heritage. Um, we want them to see uh, the expertise you need to use these instrumentations. And we want them as well to understand that you have to share uh, your knowledge uh, with uh, professionals because when you have to, uh, you need to bring a sample and you want these guys to analyze uh, your sample. They need a bit of information about the artifact where the sample is taken from. And that is to obtain relevant results, of course. But there is there are limitations to, to this. Um, as I said before, there is no practice except demonstration. We have a limited time during these exercises. So what they get at the end is some kind of very broad overview of um, what can be done. At the end, there is a bit of mix up between techniques and their possibilities. So it's not unusual that they mention techniques which do elementary analysis. Um, and they mention them, although we were expecting uh, techniques um, which would analyze compounds. Um, there is as well a gap between their needs and their result, the results they obtain. That is because of many reasons like time, uh, to stand to analyze these uh, samples which have been given. The fact that um, these labs which visit are not in a shuttle, so there is a problem of joining these people if we want to continue some analytical work. And they realize that techniques are not often portable. Um, and uh, the interpretation of the technique uh, of the analysis is not easy. But that has been already mentioned this morning. And uh, what about the cost? Because these are exercises, so they have no idea of how much it costs. So they have some kind of an abstract vision that techniques are available, analysis too, but how much it costs, it's a bit complicated for them. So 
Um, we uh, knew this situation and we tried in Neuchâtel to develop some other, um, some, some, kind of, some kind of um, approach which would be perhaps more suitable to these guys. They are conservation, conservation students. So in fact, we know that after analysis, they will do some conservation work. So we tried to observe what they were doing and integrate in the whole conservation project um, techniques which could be useful to them that they would integrate in the chain of uh, the steps of the conservation project. And I'm giving you examples on metals. So one of these techniques is called MICO. It's an application which is online. And the objective is to diagnose uh, uh, metals from observation and uh, their corrosion structure. There is another one which is called Discovery Mat. It's to analyze qualitatively metals. And then the third one is about uh, um, studying the corrosion layers of metals. It's called the PLECO. Uh, I'll just give you uh, some uh, ideas of uh, how they work briefly. So MICO is based on observation of an artifact and from there the conservators, and they do that, they don't need an ally, uh, analyst to do that, they build a, a stratigraphy, they make a drawing and we ask them to draw this uh, stratigraphy digitally on uh, an application and this application is able to compare these uh, stratigraphies to stratigraphies which have been uh, obtained on uh, uh, on uh, objects which have been uh, observed on cross sections, so the stratigraphies are very precise, and from that information, they have access to uh, more uh, data on the corrosion layers and on the metal itself. So, from an almost non invasive approach, I mean, observing artifacts under binocular, through that whole process, they have an idea uh, of the corrosion structure on the object using database. Um, this tool now is, extend, is extended to uh, the work of curators because uh, in this project we have as well curators and they realize that uh, in fact this uh, can be linked as well to their understanding of the metal and we have developed another application in this tool to identify metals just by observing them and that is more for curators than conservators. The other tool, the second one, Discovery Mat, uh, is uh, shown here by a conservator, a student who is working on site on a, on a car and she is investigating um, the uh, freezing system of the car in the engine using another tool, it's a reference electrode put on a metal and plotting um, eco measurements versus time uh, in different solutions and comparing the results to a database, um, she can uh, identify qualitatively the metal. And this is uh, very interesting for um, institutions having not much money. It's a tool which is online again, and it helps this um, uh, tool for preventive conservation because once we have the results, the uh, people in the museum know exactly how to behave with the metals they have been studying. The last tool uh, is a PLECO. It's an um, electrolytic pencil used here by a student and she is uh, plotting, so they know how to do it, they plot voltammetry plots to investigate the type of uh, corrosion layers they have on the artifact here. They investigate silver sulfide shown by this peak um, silver sulfide reduced um, in silver. What is very interesting here is they can go further um, the analysis because once they have this information, they can plot um, the evolution of current versus time. And in this process, they will go to the cleaning. So it's not only an anal analytical tool, but based on the results, they can continue with the cleaning process. And because of that, they feel much more concerned because they realize that this analysis is very useful for uh, uh, future work. So based on this, um, what are the results today? What do we think about these techniques? We consider that we involve more conservators in the analytical process. They practice, um, they have an idea of what is qualitative data acquisition um, process, and they learn through this to be critical, to be demanding. Um, based on that, they know that they didn't reach uh, perhaps all the information they wanted to gain, so 
they can ask more precisely, request for further analysis. Our perspectives for all of us, ourselves, uh, we think that in the future, if we continue in this way, uh, we will better integrate analytical work in conservation projects. Uh, this will help as well foster interdisciplinary work between conservation professionals. And I'm not here thinking only of conservation conservators, but curators, conservation scientists. And perhaps at the end, when all these guys will work together, convince everybody of the need for analysis where relevant. And eventually, because these are participative tools, we expect that the uh, professionals, I mean, conservators who contribute to the, these tools will, will continue contributing and, and at the end will have tools which will be quite powerful, still qualitative, but they will find their place in the whole chain of the conservation projects. So that is my contribution and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, and thank you very much for your nice contribution. I think that uh, you speak about uh, two very interesting topics, training of students. Here we have a master and a PhD students, so I think that we need to speak about those things also. And the other one is, I think that also the, let's say, the sustainability also, and uh, this let's say low cost or lower cost alternatives so we can later we can take again this topic and speak a little bit more about it okay so thank just, you very just, much. just a thing uh, might uh, i would like to add uh, if uh, christian i mean you can uh, briefly uh, write in the chat i mean uh, the websites of your uh, project uh, christian so that uh, all the uh, the people in the public will be the audience will be able I mean, uh, to reach the website of your of your project of your interesting projects thanks a lot i will do it thank you christian uh, so uh, now we move uh, to the next participant who is uh, austin nevin uh, austin holds a master of science in chemistry for uh, oxford university and master and phd in painting conservation for Cortal institute of art he has held position in Italy, Greece, and Sweden. Austin Nevin is now the head of the Department of Conservation at the Cortal Institute of Art, um, a vice president of the EEC. He is a trained conservator, and he, he has expertise experience in the application of the spectroscopic techniques in conservation. So Austin, when you want, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco. Fran thank you, Maita. Thank you, everybody, for your um, wonderful presentations today. And I, I, I don't know where really to start um, because I have so many ideas now. Uh, and and I, I, I just wanted to say that many of you echoed some of my thoughts. Um, I really liked, um, Mireta, your examples of what it means to work in um, an institution with four people and what it means also to and how important it is that we already think about sharing and what we're going to do with our results and your description of how difficult it was to take samples in norway made me think that you should come back to uk because in the portal when we are working on paintings we never have a problem with sampling because we always have small fragments that we can analyze so, in a sense, the question for me about destructive, non-destructive is not quite so relevant at this point in my life. But I also know in the past that I've often thought how better to explain this to my students. And I prefer to think whether or not I need to go to the object or whether the sample can come to me. And therefore, I don't really care if it's if I need a sample it's a sample if it can be we are talking about nano science now so nano samples is still a sample in other cases my instrument tells me more about the surface or maybe beneath the surface and that's what i try to teach my students i don't care about this micro destructive non-destructive stuff because quite frankly it's a question of do i need to take a sample to put in the machine if i have a sem i can't put a painting inside a scanning electron microscope even if i don't destroy the sample in the end I also, before this talk, and actually this afternoon, I did a little bit of technological searching to figure out if I could figure out more about 
what this whole holism and determinism is. And I came across this slide about technological determinism, which says that that's the view that technology will bring us value and it will drive our values. And I think that's so horrible. I, I, I don't think it's true that technology is going to drive our values. I think our values are in the big picture of the objects where we work. And maybe though, I was reading too that you know science is very deterministic in the way we 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 explain physical phenomena and chemical phenomena and oftentimes we we try to make complex problems much more simple um, using spectroscopic techniques which we can understand we we, we describe how X-rays travel and we we describe how metal ions react and and we use that to understand better something about a material. Uh, so we, of course, have that very strong um, foundation, but it is very much in my teaching the holistic approach that we try to take when we in conservation. And we, we, we love the cause and effect that we can describe with preventive conservation. We know the causes of uh, fading might be light or they might be temperature or the causes of relative humidity might be increased mold attack or salt uh, uh, dissolution. So that's a very deterministic way of trying to frame specific problems. But um, I think, as Elizabeth said, Elisabetta said, we need uh, more monitoring and maintenance and possibly data science to understand the bigger picture of the problems we face. Because when I when I think about conservation and when I think about the problems that uh, we encounter in wall paintings. In we have worked together with Joanne uh, Kassar in Malta with problems we don't know how to solve. We really are faced with a serious stability problem and we can identify the layers of lead white and oil and the metal soaps and the salts and the environment, but I don't know what to do to stop things getting worse. We don't necessarily have a solution. And even if I try to find a I have a, we have done work, for example, 20 years ago, I, there's no money in monitoring this and I can't publish a monitoring exercise and I, I can't publish a maintenance exercise. And therefore the kinds of outputs that my research funding bodies want are the deterministic ones. They want me to have a nice example of Egyptian blue in a new painting. They want me to identify the use of an instrument they have given me, and they want technological reductionism. They want technology to bring us value um, because they want to show how the money they gave us to buy a new instrument will improve the public's perception of something. And this is where I go back to Noel's comment that I really would prefer to go to schools to talk about how um, we can understand the periodic table through the analysis of paintings rather than try to make the sexy new instruments that I have now somehow speak to the general public. Um, and I think that need that would that require would that would require a shift in the type of funding that we can get at the moment. We, we don't get money to go talk to schools. Like we do for a European project where we can fuse data together, for example. Um, so, if we think about who is doing the work, clearly we are doing a lot of work and I think it's wonderful. I, I, every time I come to these conferences, I feel like I need to just, I wish I could spend more time reading the papers rather than asking stupid questions. Um, but I also want to know why we are doing it. And sometimes we are driven by research projects, which we are able to, we are, we are lucky enough to, to, to get money for. Um, sometimes we need an answer. Oftentimes, I need an answer. What is the? Why is it that we have a we have con pressing conservation problems? And if we don't know, we really would be irresponsible in our behavior in, in the way we work. Now, how we do it, very much will depend on the resources that we that we are we have. So, we now have better, sexier instruments than before. They're lighter. Our new X-ray machine is about half the size of the old one. And then our super new one is about 300 kilos because it's a scanning one. We can't take it anywhere. Right? Um, 
And how will we do this? Well, this depends also on human resources, who, who, we, who we can involve. Can we involve Christian's group in Neuchatel? Can we involve a European group, or do we have to do this on a, a, a UK uh, budget with no traveling by airplanes? Um, and what should we do with our, our data and knowledge? Well, I, I, I would admit I'm, I'm sitting in a department with hundreds of thousands of records of unpublished data and uh, hundreds of thousands of, of examples of no, hundreds of thousands, no, but tens of thousands of conservation records which need to be digitized. And uh, x-rays from the last hundred years from thousands of paintings, which are degrading now. So I am worried about this as a practical problem. And not to mention my favorite example from colleagues from Madrid. I went to visit the Prado Museum and I was told, ah, you know, we have to go to the basement to read this data because it's on the 1980s computer and we can't get it off. And this happens to me, you know, I have CDs. I don't know if I can read anymore because I don't, on the computer I'm speaking now, I don't have any CD drive. And the CD drive I use, I used to play DVDs for my daughter, but it doesn't really play my CDs very well. And so my, a lot of the data we have, even if I could open it, it would probably not be readable in the file. So this makes me very worried, um, but maybe it doesn't matter because if you go back to the samples that I took 20 years ago or 30 years ago, we could probably get better data from it now. So this, there are so many questions about what we do with our data, but maybe I come back to the thing I wrote at the bottom of my page, which is that I would hope that conservation and, and science are, have research driven decision making, that conservators that we train at the court told will learn to ask good questions and they might be able to choose scientific methods but if not they at least start with a very good question as Maita you were mentioning this morning what's the point of this um, and sometimes it's very very pragmatic that we need to know like I need to know now what the problem and uh, other times, maybe it might not be so important. It might be something more related to a curatorial decision or something like authentication, which is like my least worried, least, least big problem at the moment. Um, but that research will be driving their decision. Questions will drive their decisions. And I think it's at the moment very difficult sometimes to navigate knowledge um, simply because we, we have so much about different techniques but whether or not they are appropriate, we, to, to learn that, you need to do it. And learning by doing is what I try to push my students to do. Take the sample, prepare the cross-section, and realize that you, you, you destroyed half of it to make a good one. Uh, and then you think twice about making a good cross-section. Um, but I love cross-sections. So I, I think cross-sections will give us much more information than a non-invasive portable method of analysis. So that's maybe where I stop, but I just want, I'm sure we have much more discussion um, this later on. And uh, thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Austin. I think that you sum up and uh, review all the uh, information, all the opinions uh, given by the, the other participants. So this is nice to guide a little bit our final discussion also. But uh, I want to introduce you, uh, although he is not officially included in the in the program, he joined the program a little bit later of closing it. So I want to introduce uh, Antonio Scamelotti, who is Professor Emeritus of Inorganic Chemistry in the University of Perugia, a member of the Academia Nazionale dei Lincei. Uh, Dr. Honoris Causa on Sam University of Buenos Aires. Uh, he is also the co-founder and uh, honorarity uh, president of the Center of the Excellence uh, Scientific Methodologies Applied to Archaeology and Art and co-founder of MOLAB. Uh, I think that all of us uh, know uh, what is MOLAB. And her research uh, has been associated to advanced computations uh, on chemistry, electronics, and structural properties of molecular and inorganic materials, spectroscopic properties, uh, and characterization of archaeological and art historical artifacts. So, Antonio, uh, 
uh, when you want, you can activate uh, your microphone, camera, and you can uh, tell us something about the topic. So the floor is yours. Yes, can you hear me, please? Yes, perfectly. Yeah, uh, thank you for the possibility to make a, a short, might will be a very short comment at the end of this very interesting workshop. I will try to answer to the questions arising from the title of the workshop, giving, of course, my personal point of view. Okay. Sorry. I am strongly supporting concerning the first question. All all is all determinism. I am strongly supporting the holism approach. For the second question, are there too many expensive measurements in the field of conservation of cultural heritage? The comment is much more articulated, especially in the case of non-invasive technique and of course, I am a great supporter of non-invasive technique. The measurement must be always those necessary, but rarely they are too many or too expensive. In the case of invasive technique, I am for the minimum of sampling. Only when necessary, it to solve some specific questions, you are allowed to make some. Also for the use of large scale facilities, synchrotron and neutron facilities, I consider those necessary only when they can solve some problem, which can be solved only by using these large scale facilities. An example, for instance, if you want to know the oxidation number of some elements, which are necessary to discuss and understand the degradation processes, the synchrotron measurements are, of course, necessary. They are the only possibility to solve the problem. In some more, in some other cases, they are not so necessary. In too often, I would say, they have to be used to, to give a, a fashionable measurements, although not so necessary, to have a, a, some interesting results to make a, a paper publishable in some more journals with high impact factor. Of course, this is not a, a good practice in my opinion. Also, too, too often, the diagnostic measurements are not strongly connected with the restorations. Uh, sometimes uh, there are too many cross-sections not necessary are made without any real uh, needed and sometimes as i said these are not connected with the strongly connected with the restoration processes often they are made at the end of the restoration process and there is very often not a strong connection with the restorers and this of course is not a good practice I want to stress a role of the non-invasive technique, especially in the case of the imaging modality. Not, so they are very useful and gave information which can be very valuable for the art historians to write in a way a new story of the art. This is, I think, the future of the, also one of the main uh, 
important uh, future for the uh, the for the diagnostic to give relevant information offering uh, helps to the art historians and i can see that there is always great interconnections with, with between scientists and art historian if i compare what how was the situation few a few years ago now the situation is much better and i think this is one of the future for the diagnostic to give a, a, a relevant information to write a new story art story together with the art historians this is in a way my short comment thank you Thank you very much, uh, Professor Scamelotti. Thank you for joining this uh, last uh, discussion. And uh, well, now uh, I will try to, to sum up and to join uh, what you have mentioned. And uh, let's say- uh, Sorry, I, I yes. just made my short comment. Sorry? Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so I will try to guide a little bit the last uh, discussion of the of the day. Hello. Yes, uh, Antonio. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you want to say something? I made the, my short comment. Yes. Okay. I. I don't know. Uh, Francesco, do you know what is happening? Uh, no, I didn't get I mean, what is happening. Antonio, would you like uh, to speak more? I said that, that uh, he said that uh, his short comment were already made. Okay, so, thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. So perfect. Okay, so um, uh, Francesco and Luigi, if you agree, uh, I'm going to read uh, what people post uh, in the chat but uh, I'm going to follow the, the order in the chat, and then we can move to, to the discussion of the rest of the ideas, including the- uh, You're not the here anymore. What? Uh, Antonio, we have uh, to, to mute you, I mean, uh, so that you can, uh, that we can proceed, I mean, uh, with the rest of the workshop, okay? Okay. So, uh, in this case, so in this case, uh, I'm going to move to the chat. Uh, for example, Hello. Antonio, Francesco, I think that uh, it is better to mute because otherwise. I will, uh, yeah, I will. Uh... Antonio, Antonio, c'è qualcos'altro da dire? Okay, if you don't mind, Antonio, I will, uh, I will make you, I will make you one of the attendee. I mean, so that you can follow the discussion. Would you have anything else, I mean, to say? I mean, you can um, uh, you can write that uh, in chat. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Antonio. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, Mina Magdi uh, post a very long uh, test with uh, six points. So I can read it, but maybe it is better if you want to to transmit this information speaking. So, Mina, if you want, if you are, uh, I don't know if you are, let's see, uh, we can give you the option to speak. Just a, se just a second, Mike, that I will. Uh, I yeah, will... now we know. I, I put uh, among panelists. So, ah, so I think that uh, now, Mina, if you want, you can activate your uh, microphone or microphone and camera and you can transmit uh, your opinion because I think that is too long uh, to read it. <laughs> or if you prefer, I can read it. So I think that... Uh, I, think, I think we have to, to check if, uh, if some of the speakers of the round table want to speak again, otherwise 
we can go to a final conclusive discussion of all together. Uh, Luigi, I think that also people, uh, participants want to, to take part in the discussion. So we think that uh, it is a, a good yeah. option. Yeah, yeah, but if they ask to, to speak. Yeah, they ask okay. it, Luigi, they ask it. They to... ask it to speak. Okay. So, oh, so, so, so you can give the word there to them. Yeah, but uh, we we make them part uh, panelists. But uh, I think that I I don't know what happened. But yeah, uh, my, uh, Mina Maita is uh, saying that uh, she would like I mean, she would like that uh, we read them I in mean, the 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 points. If you don't mind, I can read those. Is that I can okay? also read if you want, eh, Francesco. Uh, it's not a problem. Uh, okay, go ahead. So there are different points uh, and the, among others, uh, Mina stressed what the Professor Campanella mentioned about the referentiation measurements and figure of merits. Uh, Mina wants to add uh, the verification of the measurements by integration of analytical instruments. The materials are complicated and the mechanisms of investigation process could be complicated. Uh, I think that, uh, sorry? No, uh, so, uh, so he mentioned about uh, the complicated aspect of uh, standardizing a little bit uh, the procedures so, and also, for example, reference materials and uh, everything. So I think that this is uh, an interesting point because when we uh, want to, for example, develop quantitative methodologies, uh, this is difficult in the cultural heritage context because we have an stratigraphic uh, sample and it is not like in other contexts, for example, in environmental chemistry, in which you can you know, homogenize the sample and so on, and you can analyze the full sample. In this case, we have a stratigraphic sample and we can have problems with uh, having reference materials and so on. So Mina is uh, uh, underlying a little bit uh, that issue. And uh, he also mentioned that uh, Professor uh, Gabriele talked about the sustainability. And uh, he mentioned about the reduction of solvents by chromatography and uh, well issues related with uh, sustainability and uh, saving money uh, and balancing a little bit the cost and the results that we can obtain. Okay, and uh, I think that this is an issue that we can also discuss later, um, the integration of the methodology and additionally in the cultural heritage context, the archaeometric study is a collaboration of many stakeholders of different uh, disciplines, multidisciplinary approach, uh, and uh, we need to fix uh, research questions regarding the archaeological significance. So I think that uh, is more or less what uh, we have comment or you have a, a comment in your intervention uh, about the multidisciplinarity. And finally, uh, Mina wants to uh, collect the contribution between the cause and effect concept of the terminus and the integrated approach concept of volumes uh, to achieve the aim of the study. So, as uh, he cannot uh, introduce more, I think that we cannot establish discussion on that. Uh, Irka uh, also mentioned that it is very important point about the authentication of objects. Uh, research is often being used to increase monetary value of objects on the market that drive the market, often looting of archaeological sites. So again, Irka stressed the, the money issue, uh, which, uh, which is something that uh, you also mentioned in the round table and uh, participants in the morning session also mentioned. Wendy also uh, comment that, uh, well, really interesting points brought up by Mr. Hughes. Uh, lately, I have been thinking about the impact of value re uh, realization and finance, again, the cost, especially with certain conservation restoration projects that they are carried out by people who are not professionals with the main resource being lack of funds. So uh, she mentioned that uh, some projects are being carried out by people who are not professionals 
a study measuring something usually acknowledge the existence of it. The more this information is shared, the lighter the, the change of getting proper financial support. So uh, she stressed that. And also, uh, apart from that, we have uh, in the chat uh, uh, Jose Delgado Rodriguez and uh, Lucia uh, who want to add uh, something. So uh, if you want, we can uh, give the flow to Jose. We'll make them a speaker. Can you do it? Or yeah. I can do it also. I will do it. Uh, Jose. Uh... Just a second. Jose, my panelists. You hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Jose. Please. Okay. Go. Thank you. So, thank you for allowing me to enter in this uh, round table. Um, first, I would like to congratulate the organization for this excellent uh, uh, workshop. And um, I have a, just a couple of uh, things to say, not very much. But I, in fact, I'm very much in line with the presentations by Joan and uh, Austin. And I think that they mostly cover my own points of view. So, in fact, uh, what we see in very often is uh, some lack of clarity. So, we need uh, most of the times to be uh, to clarify our purposes and our aims in what we are doing. So, um, I have a line here a, a few points. The first, uh, when we ask if uh, uh, are there too many measurements or too many data, um, I would prefer to ask, uh, are we taking the right ways? Are we choosing the right parameters? Are we asking the right questions? And uh, what are my data useful for? So, this, if we have a clear understanding of these questions, I think that the, the number of data becomes um, not very relevant because we will certainly go more directly to answer the questions. So, uh, as uh, Joan said, in fact, the, the first point is to be able to ask questions and to ask the right questions. And I think that one of the main uh, objectives of uh, a professor, for instance, in conservation or whatever, is to ask them to ask the right questions. So more than teaching them how to use a, a method, a tool, an instrument, or, 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 or whatever, it should ask what, how, to, how to ask a question about those problems that we need to to solve and what to need to to um to research on um in fact also our projects the research projects must be uh, much uh, be very clear so the aims must be clear so in the uh, the research paths and the uh, the achievements but must be in line with the aims so, and we have to avoid mixing up. For instance, we may have a research project in a very academic way. Then it is okay. It's not knowledge, new knowledge that we are producing. This, the objective is clear. But uh, you should not be tempted at the end to, to jump into something of very, very practical side if you are not, if you don't have the necessary data in the necessary uh, information and capabilities to produce it. So it's better to stay clear in, the, uh, in the, the, the purpose of your project and not to jump to another one that to, you are not uh, uh, enough aware of or where your data is not enough for extracting the right conclusions. So. Uh, this, uh, so in conclusion, um, 
a same research, a, a paper, a published paper, for instance, may at the same time have too many data, too many things in a scientific side, and too little to support the conclusions of the practical side. So this is even relative in this sense. So too much and too little may be just side by side in the same research document. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. And uh, if you want, we can uh, give the, the flow to, to Lucia. Uh, so Lucia, you are a panelist, so you can activate your, okay. Oh, thank you. First of all, uh, thank you to uh, you as our organizers and uh, for chairing uh, this session and to all participants, because I think that this uh, uh, moment of discussion and uh, the roundtable are really very important to, uh, to get uh, acquainted with the real problem of uh, this field. So um, this work is very important, I think. And uh, for what concerns uh, as a scientist and as an heritage scientist and uh, as an academic professor, I would say that uh, <clears throat> no limitation, research needs no limitation in the use of equipment for the progress of science, for the progress of the methodologies, etc. And this is a, a so familiar uh, concept. But at the same time, I appreciated a lot also, and I completely agree with Austin, with Elisabetta, with uh, uh, the colleagues that have already uh, affirmed that uh, in this field, we need always uh, to um, the confrontation with uh, uh the the real objects uh, and uh, <clears throat> our goal uh to do a, a, a banal um let's say comparison with uh, the field of medicine we should never never lose uh, uh the the point that is the patient so uh and uh, and to to bring a contribution in the field means uh, to be able to to find solution so um, of course it is also required in many projects now uh, they always ask us uh, the impact of our research so and it is the more difficult part of uh, a, a a proposal to write because uh, sometimes it is difficult to really to see the impact. And when it is difficult, we should think that uh, uh, we are not really in the right way. So um, always to, to find the balance uh, between uh, these two, uh, let's say, um, way of doing research is, uh, um, it, it is not easy, it is not easy. Uh, I think that we need really uh, to move on to discuss criteria, to discuss quality standard in the diagnostic uh, uh, application. Uh, we need to discuss more this thing and uh, to establish uh, in the scientific community of heritage science uh, some uh, uh, new really new paradigm for uh, quality standards uh, in uh, the measurements. So not too many or more or less measurement, but the necessary measurement with uh, a sustainable uh, really uh, pattern. And uh, uh, I hope that this uh, new generation of scientists uh, is uh, arising uh, and uh, I see, I can see, I'm optimistic for nature, and I can see that uh, really uh, sustainability is uh, um, also 
arriving in, in the field of cultural heritage. And uh, I really hope this. I don't know. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, we have also in the chat uh, some comments uh, from the side of Katarina Smithot. Uh, she mentioned, thank you for inspiring program, uh, being the conservation research laboratory of the Swiss National Museum. We are in the fortunate position to be already in constant change and contact with the conservators, uh, curators, historians, and exter external institutions. Our research is therefore generally related to practical questions to solve conservation issues or technical questions. This exchange is really valuable and leads to data that are needed to better preserve our cultural heritage. So, um, I think that at this moment we don't have any other questions. Uh, maybe uh, this comment of Katarina is interesting because uh, to join everything. Uh, if you want, uh, I can do such a kind of a summary of all the ideas. And then we can give you uh, the word to you, also to Francesco and, and Luigi to make some comments. So, for example, here, Caterina uh, underlined that uh, their work uh, is related with uh, giving answers to, to a specific uh, questions or to solve problems. Okay. So, uh, here, and also, for example, in my presentation, uh, I try to uh, separate a little bit what is research and what is to, to give answer to a practical question or to a direct uh, uh, issue. So I want to know the nature of this pigment and I need to do a quick measurement. So I think that this connects a little bit also with the sustainability. So, uh, for example, Lucia mentioned that uh, it is not a matter, a matter of having a lot or less or more and also uh, uh, Jose also mentioned that, uh, but if we come back to the research field, also uh, some of you mentioned that uh, we need to justify things. For example, we are asking money to to buy uh, big instruments, uh, well, costly instruments, and when we ask for that money, we need to justify what we are going to do which kind of publication uh, we are going to present. So I think that uh, in, in those cases, uh, this, is not, this is not the same world. One thing is to give answer to an, a certain problem and the other is to research. So I think that we need to go for the sustainable uh, line, but also uh, at least, for example, in Spain, in Spain, I don't know, maybe in the European context, uh, this is not the case. But I think that uh, people involved in the, let's say, in the governmental part, they need to change a little bit uh, their mind also, and they need to balance uh, this kind of things. And also, uh, uh, Merete mentioned smaller projects, uh, larger projects. Uh, so this is also more or less the same. Uh, something specific that needs an answer, or something larger, uh, like the projects of uh, Merete or Maria about uh, Punta Begoña. In those kind of projects, I'm sure that, uh, and I know also uh, that Punta, Be Punta Begoña had funding to develop that kind uh, of project. And again, one important issue, the cost, the money. The money, the time, the effort of all the people working at the same time and in a real interdisciplinarity and in interconnected uh, way of working. Uh, also, you mentioned uh, about, uh, I'm not sure if uh, maybe Daniela mentioned about the scientific publication versus reports. This is also an interesting issue because uh, I think that uh, research is connected with uh, uh, questions, as you mentioned, uh, for example, uh, Joan mentioned a lot of questions. So research is connected with questions. It's not uh, to analyze something and give uh, what is this. No, it's related with what we want to do, what we want to achieve with this. 
So for me, a scientific publication is not a report. And I think that this should be clear also in, in that sense, at least from my point of view. And um, also about the uh, data management, data uh, gathering, open the uh, data. Uh, this is also very important. And uh, I think that here we need to find the balance between what, for example, uh, people working in university ask us, that is at least here in Spain at the end, to publish. And what is to put to uh, all the people, uh, all your data in a repository to be accessible and everything. It is true that uh, we need to publish and we are trying to publish in an open way, but I think that uh, we need to, or I think that we need to make an effort uh, combining the option of putting the data in a repository in an open way and transmitting information in a publication. So I think that, I don't know, I'm not very used to this kind of topics, but uh, I think that this is also maybe a controversial topic. I don't know your opinion. And uh, poof, there are a lot of ideas. So uh, I think that more or less uh, also very important uh, what Christian introduced us about the, about the training, uh, about the students. And uh, sometimes, uh, and I try to, for example, in my case, I try to expl explain the, the techniques and tell them uh, which are the costs related with the instruments, with the personnel, and uh, we, also, we also ask uh, to do uh, projects related with the evaluation of cost. Uh, this is also for a master level, okay? Because this is very important because at the end, the costs are always there. You mentioned money, cost, and this is very important. But also, I think that it is very important because I can transmit and Christian also can transmit that we can have a, a lot of a nice technique. We have the option to go to the synchrotron, but at the end, we need to transmit also that maybe those uh, I don't know, conservators, archaeologists, chemists are going to be maybe working in a specific laboratory and maybe that laboratory doesn't have those kind of big instruments. So they need to know also, as maybe Christian underlined, that things can be done not using these big infrastructures, okay? Because we can apply, for example, for synchrotron, but we know that each year is not possible to, to be there working in the synchrotron. So I think that uh, students uh, need to have also this information because otherwise when they move to the professional field, they are going to say, okay, this is not the real my reality because I learned that there are a lot of instruments and in my laboratory, I don't have this option. So I think that I don't know if I I make a, a summary of all the ideas. So now, if you want to to add something, and yes, Mante, very 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 good uh, summary of, of the round table. Very very well. Thank you. Right. So if you want to add something, there is a, also um, something that uh, Elisabetta Zendri ah, yes. put in uh, in the chat. Uh, she mentions that we must probably consider also the legal aspects if we would uh, if we carry out an holistic approach in the frame of uh, conservation of cultural heritage in Italy, for example, only a person, the designer, typically an architect, takes the responsibility for the all intervention for the all projects. For this reason, all the phases in the conservation project must be shared with the designer for the diagnostic stage to the valorization. And that's also been something that is quite important uh, when uh, we were mentioning this was uh, uh, introduced by Merete about the mm -hmm. ownership of the data, about the ownership of the data, how, uh, who owns the data when uh, a service is carried out. 
some, ana some an analytical work as a service is carried out. Who owns the data? Is uh, the person that is uh, that is asking and is paying for the work is also the laboratory? Personally, I mean, uh, being in a laboratory that is also carrying out uh, uh, is also carrying out service. I mean, we we don't do that. I mean, the in the sense we 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 save always a copy of the data, but we don't exploit them. We cannot use them as the research data, even if we are interested in this data. The owners, the, the client, pays for the analysis and is the person responsible for, uh, for, uh, for, is the owner of the data and the person responsible. Unfortunately, sometimes this scientific data, they are used to increase the value of the artworks as uh, Irka Aidas uh, from ETH was, uh, was mentioning. Basic, um, especially in her case that she's dealing with uh, with uh, radiocarbon analysis. So this has uh, so many aspects, uh, uh, so many legal aspects that uh, uh, must be taken into consideration, and unfortunately also some unpleasant ones. As a scientist, I know, I mean, uh, from uh, direct contact, from direct exchange with Irka, that she has faced. Uh, legal problems because of uh, the dating something that should not however be an issue you know in the sense uh, there are there are legal aspects obviously in terms of ownership of the data but not about the content or the uncertainty of the data and this is something that sometimes i mean uh, for private clients it's not so easy i mean to be to be transmitted Man. May I say something? Absolutely, yes. absolutely, uh, Jose. Okay. Jose. So, I, I'd like to comment uh, on another point that I, I find is uh, very relevant, which is um, a gap that I feel exists uh, between um, science research in, in the practice. So, I work in stone conservation, as some of you know. Uh, and uh, in despite the number of publications, the number of papers that are published every year on this issue, what we see is that the conservatory restor restorers have very little available, ready for their uh, direct use, uh, with really meaning and interest for their uh, daily uh, work. Um, I think that it, it, it is uh, the problem of mainly a problem of the uh, conservation scientists that produce it, but there is also a general problem of the uh, the publication system. So um, uh, publications only accept uh, papers that are really very scientific, so top science. And they do not accept case studies, for instance. So for, for a, a, a conservator restorer, it's much, much more important to know how a, a specific case study what the, was decided, what was the basis to take some decisions, what was the, the, the way to, they follow to achieve a given success in the result of a case study, then to read lots and lots of papers on the, with data on measurements of very high quality standards, yes, certainly, for sure, but not directly related to their uh, own practice. They are not able to translate the data that uh, most of us do and uh, to translate it for their own uh, use. So this gap is very important. It is not solved with the, the open access, although it is very important uh, among the, the, the scientific community, but it is not solved with this. It's just the, the we have to find a way of to publish very good case studies. Uh, the, uh, Austin Evan mentioned, he has a lot of data there that was never been reported and published because 
the, the, no review, no paper, no nowhere. Uh, they uh, is they are accepted. They are refused because they are just case studies, just measurements, just uh, uh, some something more. So I think that we need to look at this at this point and try to find a, a solution to to this to reduce this gap between science uh, and practice. Thank you. But it was a very nice workshop. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Uh... Someone else want to add something to, to this topic or about the... There are, there are a, a couple of comments also in the chat. So one is uh, from uh, from uh, John Hughes uh, that was mentioning it about the possibility of a workshop on ethics uh, in heritage science. And uh, uh, Noel was also commenting on that, uh, it's a good idea. I particularly liked your question, uh, is all heritage equal in the face of climate change? When it's uh, it's interesting that uh, this workshop, I mean, uh, rather than giving a, an answer to uh, uh, yeah. questions, uh, has raised many more. I, mean, I, just, <laughs> I, found it, I found it really stimulating. And yeah. there's another comment uh, from Austin uh, about what, uh, uh, what Jose de Pablo Rodriguez has just said. IAC would like to publish more case studies and public and practical conservation research on studies in conservation. This, uh, this is, however, not open access, but accessible to all members of IAC. Open access costs are prohibitive for conservators to publish and often for also institutions that are working with limited funding. So when we are not personally, I mean, uh, at my institute, we are not at the university. We have access, I mean, with library system to a great extent of uh, the literature. We are lucky under this point of view, but other smaller institutions are not able to reach all uh, the publications uh, or the new uh, the new advances in in, uh, in uh, heritage science or in conservation. Uh, Irka Aidas from ETH is also is also supporting the idea about the case studies. We only learn from those. Yeah, I mean personally, I am also uh, I'm partially in favor of this in the sense case studies if they bring actually really something new. I mean to the fields. I mean and not uh, let's say a repetition or just uh, in the form of a, a technical report. That's in my opinion, in my opinion, that's something, uh, something else. And uh, there is uh, also my time. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, there is also a uh, last thought, thought by by Joanne saying mm -hmm. that, uh, one takeaway message is that we need to share our data more and better. This is uh, this is absolutely true when that is actually possible. Many institutions, uh, uh, I know uh, that, uh, for example, Spanish institution, Norwegian institution, uh, Swiss institution, they have uh, uh, common efforts to try to publish as much as possible as open access now, but other countries are pretty late under this point of view, into uh, also due to the lack of funding, of specific funding, uh, the, cost of, uh, the cost of open access or publishing open access is prohibitive and uh, some models I mean, uh, some models of publication are actually not encouraging under this this point of view yeah i think that uh, in this case we can add something mm -hmm. uh, for example in european projects they are uh, pushing their own repository to include the information, publication, and so on. So maybe now, today, uh, this is not possible, but I hope that things can change uh, in the last, I don't know if in years or decades, or I don't know. But it is true that, for example, in our university now, we have an agreement to publish in an open way in, let's say, most or almost all the, the the journals. So this is quite new. This is from the last year, and we are very lucky with that. 
but I agree uh, with uh, what Francesco mentioned, and for that I impartially agree with uh, Jose, because uh, maybe we need, no we, I think that is something related with the, I don't know, governmental things or whatever, but we need to find another alternative, I don't know if a repository or something like that, to, to put a high quality technical reports, as Francesco mentioned, not all of them, but those who contribute new things, maybe not so new to be uh, included as a scientific publication, but maybe such a kind of repository would be uh, nice. And maybe a specific repository in the field of heritage science could be a, a nice initiative in that sense. But I agree that not everything should be published as a scientific uh, publication, because here in this workshop, we also separate a little bit what is uh, something technical, something short and direct, and what is research. So I think that from my point of view, this should be separated, because they are not uh, same things from my point of view. I think I mean, uh, there is also Chiara Bertolin uh, and, uh, that is also uh, saying something about it. Uh, she agrees with you, might uh, even it will be an issue on copyright if the same material is also published in peer reviewed journals. So maybe a, uh, a solution like bioarchive for uh, the field of biology and medicine would be mm -hmm. also a possibility for conservation. And uh, for example, and Eugenia Tomasini is, for example, uh, uh, saying that it's impossible for Latin America scientists to publish in open access. So we are lucky enough in Europe, I mean, in our countries, to have, uh, to have uh, resources, or at least in some of our countries, but it's not the same throughout the world. Daniela Ferro would like to say something. Daniela, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, I want uh, to to add some uh, concept that uh, in this moment, for example, when uh, there is an exhibition in a museum, there is the cat catalog that uh, is uh, paid by sponsor or other. So the scientific analysis are collected in this book, and uh, mm -hmm. for the, 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 they are possible to buy in uh, in the shops, uh, and uh, very often. Uh, the scientific analysis are only added with the, some very very poor tables or figures, no spectra, no no explanation. So I need uh, I want that uh, from this conference, from this uh, meeting uh, uh, between us, uh, we board two um, uh, concept. One is that there is a, I want a very severity in the uh, data presentation uh, with the error, uh, with the decimal cipher, uh, and so on. And uh, the other is uh, that is it possible that uh, the archaeological papers, the archaeological report, have to um, insert a scientific uh, referee. Not an archaeological referee, okay, for the, for the archaeological part, but also a scientific referee to, to um, uh, read the scientific test, uh, to read the numbers, uh, and uh, it's very poor the presentation of scientific data in archaeological uh, paper. So these two concepts I'd like that uh, this uh, meeting uh, bring over. Well, uh, not, uh, I, I don't, uh, Daniela, I don't uh, totally agree with that. I mean, I, I see very, very high quality research on uh, for example, on venues like archaeometry of Journal of Archaeological Science. No, I, I speak about, yes, but I speak about the catalog of the museum, of the exposition. But that's not uh, peer-reviewed. Also uh, on the peer, journal. That's not a peer-reviewed uh, publication. It's not a scientific publication. So I don't see why, I mean... Uh, the yes, but, but there are a lot of uh, circulation, so it's important that the scientific data have to be precise everywhere. I, I'm, I don't think, I mean, uh, uh, it's, an, it's, a, personal, it's a, personal, uh, a personal view about that. Uh, I don't think that that's the right venue, I mean, uh, to present uh, very 
precise, and I'm an analytical chemist too. I show you. <laughs> it's, uh, no, it's not uh, the right venue. I mean, in my opinion, I mean, uh, to show this kind of this kind of data. Uh, I mean, at this level of uh, high precision. I mean, in uh, catalogs, because the that, in my opinion, would uh, would prevent uh, the public, which is uh, the the big public, which is the the end user of such catalogs. I mean, to be even more distant from science if he's in front of uh, something that is uh, so complicated. That's, uh, I mean, my my personal uh, view about it. So. Uh, for the scientific point of view, I prefer the, the precision. Okay, this is another, another question. No, but, uh, no, I, 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 mean, also, I agree with Francesco because I was involved in the, well, I participate in two catalogs with the Museum yeah. of Fine Arts of Bilbao. And uh, I agree also with you, Daniela, that at the end, in those catalogs, we, our analysis are accessory information. Okay. So maybe what Francesco want to mention is that uh, as uh, there, there is an accessory information or an appendix, uh, maybe we don't need to show the results uh, in a very complicated way. And maybe Francesco, you, you want to mention that maybe uh, in that catalog us as scientists need to uh, transmit the information let's say in an educa educational way not in a so scientific way for example we try no, to but the, the people have to understand okay. not just to read but understand yeah but may maybe I, in a more may I say something way. may i say something uh, oh, sure. Because we we are we are going to 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 the final part of the conference of the workshop. So during uh, the the morning and the afternoon, I I put some points that seem to me particularly important. So before we finish and then people go away, I would like to 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 read you what I have written during this day just listening to the, the speakers in the morning and the afternoon. So, um, the first one is too philosophical, if you want reflection, I have done. The first one is that also in this uh, workshop, we see that we pay much more attention to the effects of the processes of aging, degradation, alteration, than to the causes and reasons of these processes. And this uh, is a, a sort of differential preference towards some kind of measurements in respect of other. So the point is we must look also to the reason and causes of these processes. Uh, Luca Placidi, during his, uh, his uh, in, speaking speaking uh, said uh, much uh, about the models of mechanical damage uh, but the, sometimes the reason is not the the material that uh, collapse but is that the degradation has produces the collapse in the case of earthquake it is shown that in the in the reason where pollution is higher, the damages from our earthquakes are much more relevant. So, the the first indication I think we have to 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 take precious here is to to focus attention of of us and so of the research about the causes of some effects. The second uh, uh, philosophical uh, reflection I, I say it, is connected to, to the uh, um, presentation by Gabriele and that uh, uh, Lucia has commented means uh, is it correct to apply the same approach to answer the question of our workshop that means all in or determined is correct to approach the answer in the same way, independent of we are speaking about destructive or non-destructive, invasive or non-invasive methods, 
probably we have to rethink about the protocol concerning the study of cultural heritage. This is our, these are these is are the the two philosophical. These are the two philosophical. Uh, sorry, I open. These are the two philosophical uh, of reflection. Then I have uh, some points uh, about the presentation that probably deserve to be considered by, by all you. So the question all is or determinism and the following the answer that can be made less dramatic, I say, because sometimes this only more determined assume dramaticity, like a choice of very, uh, very responsive for and very responsible for whom has make the choice. I probably can be made less dramatic and less alternative if we consider some measures that uh, were discussed during uh, this uh, workshop to promote exchange and sharing of already available data. Many of you said about the necessity to share data and to exchange data according to an open science vision. Second, to reinforce cooperation and collaborations among the different experimental teams. Sometimes uh, some groups work with uh, optical methods, some other with electrochemical ones, but we put together and we uh, share. Probably we, we can have determinism and allism together. Third point, to get the most of the knowledge from the least number of measurements. This is obvious, it could be the best. And how is possible this one? It's possible, we have said today, uh, by applying to the measurements the, the analytical referenciation approach. That means, because it's not a, an abstract concept, it's very concrete, because it means uh, validated methods Certified, certified materials, uh, uh, certified instruments, and reference materials, reference processes. So a lot of condition that makes our measurements more uh, attainable. The other is to extract from the data the most of knowledge that is different from the most of information, the most of knowledge. That means to apply to them statistical methods where, as you know, and now also the artificial intelligence, because the, the artificial intelligence uh, allow us some uh, results that were not possible before. So this can, you, uh, can uh, uh, help us to Ran to, to have the least of the measurements, but to obtain the most of the knowledge. Another point, the, the last one, and that there are some fields where probably our question is, is loses some of its value because they need to have the most data as possible. That means there is not the deterministic holistic approach. There is the need to have the most of the data about what we are studying. Which are these fields? They were presented by some of you. There are the art of forgery, surely, the authentication of the, of the artifacts, and also the uh, part of our research that uh, uh, 
go near to the humanistic interest. We have seen, uh, we have uh, here, we have had uh, here only one or two from humanistic uh, uh, faculties, but they said us that their interest is about provenance, is about dating, so about some arguments that for which probably the differences between all his determinism loses uh, its meaning, uh, its first meaning. These are some of the of the reflection I have uh, I have done during uh, the speakers. I will uh, let you have this one because I think that if each one of us that wants to do, uh, starting from this uh, short uh, period I have read, can uh, uh, implement this, we can arrive to a document of our workshop final work that can be circulated in uh, uh, in our community by the journal and uh, and uh, probably can uh, help us to create an integration among us that can probably in the future overpass the difference between all these men determinism that actually is so present in the literature Thank you, Luigi, for gathering all, all the information uh, of the workshop. Thank you very much. And I think that uh, we arrived to half past five. This was our uh, finish. So I think that if you want to say something else, uh, I don't know if you want to, to, to add something. Otherwise, uh, mm -hmm. we will finish. I would uh, just like to thank again, I mean, apart from the public, our speakers, our member of the round table, uh, the scientific community, and our institution, especially the, uh, I mean, uh, both uh, Sapienza University and Swiss Institute uh, uh, of Art Research, and uh, mostly, I mean, the University of the Basque Country, which also hosted this important, uh, well, this uh, stimulating meaning and uh, the recording will be available will be made available online we will uh, inform the community about it uh, by email and also in, in uh, social medias as uh, some uh, mentioned Maite and I would like to say goodbye to all of you Maite your last words uh, last words for you no I I think that you 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 say everything so thank you very much I think that uh, uh, maybe it is interesting to to share all the views and all the information that we compile uh, thanks to your participation. And uh, I think that uh, we need to work uh, a little bit more to change things and to to direct things uh, in, a, in a good way. And let's see if in some years we can uh, have this. Uh, a way of sharing uh, knowledge, sharing information and, and everything. So thank you, thank you very much to the speakers and also to the participants uh, for being here. And I hope to, to see you again in another event. And I hope in person. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It, it, should be, it should be, I think, interesting to, to, to see, uh, to understand if uh, People agree with the idea to have a document of final of the workshop or not. Yeah, we, otherwise, we, we it, to, otherwise it's useless to begin a network of mails without any result. So only if there is a real interest to arrive to such a result, okay, I can start from what I have read to you, to you and you can implement as you like and we can arrive to something that can be published. But if there is a real interest in, in doing this, otherwise I, I, I don't suggest to begin a, a sort of a, of a list of mails that is useless. Yes, we, we can explore that, Luigi. Thank you very much, guys. And so we'll be in touch. Michael, you will have to yeah, uh, shut the, the system. I will just Thank stop the recording. Thank you. Thank Bye. you to the organizer. Bye. Have a nice evening. Okay. Bye.
Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you again. Bye bye. Bye.